Chapter One of Imaginations Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. Imaginations Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Prehistoric Photography. An old manuscript recently discovered by a German professor seems to indicate a very early origin for the photographic camera. The original text is in Sanskrit, and the translation is faithful in all respects. The preamble, as usual, recites the titles of the potentate who figures in the story, and I omit most of it. The first sentence, however, helps us to fix the date. It ran thus. In the period of rulers, from the land over the sea, when the ice bridge existed, in the times of the forefathers of the ancestors of the forerunners, in the reign of the great, wise, strongest in battle and swiftest in retreat, the outrunner of the chariots of the five-toed horses, in the thirteenth period after the slaying of the next-to-last toothed bird, and so on. The references to the glacial period, to the original form of the present horse, and to the pterodactyl will convince any student of geology that this document is perhaps the oldest in existence. Indeed, the university has conferred upon the professor a purple ribbon to wear on Sundays in recognition of this remarkable discovery. I will add only that the old papyrus which contained the story was found with others in a stone chest upheaved during an earthquake in Asia Minor. Thus runs the story. Came rumors and sayings to the sharp ear of the ruler, who gave orders to the sword-bearer and bowman to betake them to the cave of the image-maker, and having laid hands upon him, to walk him quickly to the ruler's house. But he of the sword did shake in his sandal straps, and his hair did point skyward while his teeth tapped together, for the image-maker was known to be a wizard and talker with the winds. Before then no one had dared to so much as throw a rock at the cave-dweller. The ruler turned his eye upon the sword-bearer and saw his fright. Yet the ruler said no word, for he loved his people, and knew that the wizard must be taken. Rather would he have sent his whole army one by one to come out no more from the darkness of the dread cave, than that harm should come to himself or to his people, for he had the heart of a dinosaurus, one of the green kind. Note, the professor insists this is right, but I think the adjective plainly refers to the apteryx, which was of a dusky emerald color when enraged. The sword-bearer, having taken a damp farewell, gathered the bowmen and went toward the rising sun, but his heart was cold. When the fourth pinkness of dawning dyed the sky, came black figures against the blue at the ending of the earth where rises the world lighter, and before the gong for the morning meal had thrice been rung to waken the sleep-loving in the morning ruler, the sword-bearer came bringing the wicked wizard. The wizard carried a chest or coffer, black, and covered close with hide, but having a dull eye at one end, and knobs and round trimmings wrought curiously and of strange magic and witchery. Note, evidently the primitive camera, with the usual buttons. When the day was strong arose the ruler and ate half a zebra with trilobite sauce. Then did I, his scribe, tell him humbly that the wizard awaited him. "'Where is my spear and my sword?' quoth the ruler. "'Here,' said the scribe, my poor self. "'Put on my leather coat, bronze hat, and leggings of scarlet leather, "'the finest in the kingdom,' quoth he, "'that the wizard and the warriors and the maidens may see me in all my beauty, "'the strong war ruler.' "'It was done, and never finer appeared the man of muscle who carries the heaviest club. "'Bring in the wizard,' said Bata. Who is there that is afraid? Then did my one knee exchange greetings with its fellow, as I, the scribe, went forth. For I was sore in terror, but Bada was not scared, though he was pale from his long sleep. 
Forth went I to the sword-bearer, gave greeting, and bade him bring in he who makes images. So the wizard was brought into the light of the presence of Bata, our ruler, who spake thus. Well done, sword-bearer. You have caught him, the bat who flies in darkness. Did he scratch you? Not at all, answered he of the sword. I bade him vow by the sun that he would do me no injury. And he said he would vow me by the sun, the moon, the stars, or by whatsoever, if only again I would not poke him with my sword. So came he most quietly. It was well done, quoth Bata. There is yet some zebra. Regale yourself. The sauce, too, was good. Then my ruler and I were left with the wizard. It is come to my ear, spake Bata that you live in a darksome cave beneath the hill that is before the sun, and work witchcraft, catching away my people's souls with thy black box. What say you, O wizard? The wizard smiled, but his lips were of the color of sand. O Bata, thus spake he, I am but a poor man. I gather simples, herbs in the woods. I do cook them over the burning of sticks and of the black stone which burns long. Thus do I extract their strength, and therewith do that which to common men seems strange. But, said Bata, all this is naught. What of the box, the soul-catcher? It is but a picture-box, said the wizard. It is curiously wrought, and will do in a winking of your royal eyelid more than a cunning worker in paint can do from dawn to dark. But, again spoke Bata, that is witchcraft. "'Nay, great ruler,' replied the wizard, "'it is no witchcraft, and it harms no one.' "'I fear me,' said the ruler, making as he spoke a sniffing with his nose, "'that there is the smell of enchantment about thee.' "'Pardon, wise ruler,' replied he of the box, "'but that is the odor of herb extracts I use in making images.' "'And the stains upon thy hands?' asked the keen-eyed, the wise Bata. The same extracts, replied the wizard, I can hardly remove them, though I wash me until I am weary with washing. You have a glib tongue, was the saying of the ruler, but I fear me it is of two ends. Not so, answered the wizard. There is nothing of the black art in me. It is a simple thing I do, see? And he raised the box. Point it not at me, spake Bata, rapidly. Try it on yon scribe, for if harm should befall him, there are more among my people. Then would I have fled, but my legs sank beneath me. Have no fear, said the wizard. I have but to touch this little piece, and all is done, without harm to any. I know nothing of your box, said Bata, and did lay chin upon his hand, like a counsellor. But mayhap I had better drop thee and thy box into the sea that rests not. Then the wizard set down the magic chest, and smote his breast. At last he spoke. "'Great ruler,' said he, "'if you will give me a few more risings and settings of the sun, and will send to my cave your scribe, I will show to him all my art, so that he may make the picture flats. Likewise, you know that he is no evil worker, and he can tell you all my art.' If not, you will know that I am speaking with a false tongue, and can throw me from the cliff down where the waves roll white. "'Tis little risk," replied my ruler. "'A scribe more or a scribe less does not count in the role of the fighting men. Take him, and work thy wicked will upon him until the moon is a round shield. Come then again, and thou shalt be released, or thrown into the sea which eats boats.' Then went I on my knees to the great Bata, trying with my tears to melt his heart, but as the drops from the wide footbird's back so rolled my tears from the heart of Bata, who cared only for the good of his people. So went I with the wizard to the cave to learn of the picture flats. Midnight moonless was bright day to the lightless gloom of that cavern. But there was a fire in front which gleamed like the fire-flashing fly of the swamps in the early of the year, and we ate of diverse strange things. There were two-shelled soft fish that he did fry until they were toothsome. Note, 
perhaps a form of the fried oyster. And there were also the thin-shelled sea pinchers, who go sideways, as doth a maiden seeing a gnaw of grain. Wearied by the walk, I slept till the birds sang, and then rose to the meal of dawn. Soon after, the wizard brought out his box, and though I shrank in terror from it, he did smile and encourage me till I put a finger upon it. It did not bite me, and I felt braver. But a scribe is not a warrior. His blood is but ink. The wizard said, O oh, scribe, fear not. Tis a box which as holds thy styluses and reed pens. But it has curious bits of bronze and of rock you can see through, whereby it makes pictures. Come, and I will give you the knowing of it. Then he did open it, and it was black inside as a burnt stick, and had an eye in the forepart. He clicked at it with the forefinger, and did put in a flat piece like gray flint, and behold, a picture thereon, like unto the clearer view of midday, but smaller than the face in a baby's eye. It was most marvelous. He did also twist a bit of bronze around, and brought a fog upon the little picture, which, however, presently cleared away as he did twist more. Note. Apparently the wizard was trying to focus upon what answered for the ground glass. Thus did he several times, and behold I grew bold, and did the same under his direction. Then went we forth under the sky, and the wizard asked if I would throw up my hood and catch it again. In wonder at his silliness, I nevertheless did that folly. And just then I heard the clicking of the box, and the wizard said, I caught you well. I think it will come out good. Thereat was I sore afraid, lest my foolish play with my hood had wrought witchery upon me. I waited to see what would come out, but naught came forth. Nor did I see that he had me caught, for I had full freedom of limbs as before. He went into the cave, and I followed his footsteps. It was dark therein, but when he told me that I must come, I went, though I shook yet a little. For, said I to myself, even if I escape the wizard by running forth, he, the mighty and swift-footed Bata, will have me sure by the tunic. So I went. There was a little light burning there, but the wizard did forthwith blow it out with the breath of his mouth, and did, with a flint, enkindle another light, a horrible light, the color of the crimson at sunset. Even yet with eyes shut I can see that witch glow. There in the redness did he open his box, draw forth a strange contrivance from which came a flat, light-colored shell, four-cornered and thin like scraped horn. This was dropped into an earthen dish which he held some most ill-smelling compound, and he rocked the dish to and fro, smiling a ghastly smile, such as the grin of the long shark in the water of the deep. But behold, the dark and the light took shape and became an image. And if all the prophets and if all the counselors of the tribe were to prophesy till the hair of all was gray upon their shoulders, they could not have divined what was the image which came forth to mock me. It was my soul! For as I leapt in the air to catch my hood, the wizard had caught my soul from me and fixed it there within the awful black box which is an eye. But I was changed so that my own dear mother would not have known me. My face, paler than that of the sunburned warriors, was black like those of the men of the far south whose hair twists. My dark tunic was like the snow that flies in the sky when men walk upon rivers and the flowers die. All was like nothing I ever saw. Then did the wizard wash the flat piece in a spring that came from the rock near at hand, and he did wash and wash again until even the weariness of the rocking was not so long. Then did he soak the piece in another liquor in yet another dish, while I was faint with the long darkness. Gladly I saw the sunlight again and heard the birds chirp as if black caves were not. More washing? I asked. 
for it seemed that there would never be an end of the splashing of water. Only a little, said the wizard. He did fix the flat piece next in a four-sided frame and cooked it in the sunshine, while I wondered if he would desire to eat my soul baked in the sun for dinner. But after he had baked the frame, he did break it open, and then came more washing. I thought that the wizard would wear out his fingers with much plashing the water. I think that my eyelids must have shut me to sleep for a while, but when I opened them, there stood the wizard, and in his hand he did hold a picture wherein I was shown to leap like a horse in fresh pasture, bounding after my hood in the air with the fool play I have told. Thus saw I first the making of pictures, and that day was like many that followed. Nay, I did even make pictures myself, with the wizard to stand by and say, Do thou this, do thou so. But of the witchcraft of it little did I know. I was but as his hand or foot in doing his bidding. And all that we did the wizard feared the light, for he said that the sun would steal away the pictures, which seemed strange enough to me. Meanwhile grew the moon, till it came round like a shield, and we were to go to the ruler. The last day I was with the wizard, I did make two pictures by myself, and he did praise me, and gave me one wherein I did look too sweet, like unto the coo-bird, and brave as the roarer is brave before the bleater. This received I gladly, for I knew not before how comely I was. At sunrise did we set forth for the dwelling of Bata, the sagacious in combat. The wizard carried the wonder-box. I did carry earthenware jars filled with liquids and compounds, very heavy, and I did also carry many of the flat pieces, each closed cunningly in a case like a quiver. When we came unto the town, Bata sat upon his throne beneath the sun-shield. "'Aha! Wizard!' he cried. "'Then you have not eaten our scribe. "'Tis as well, mayhap. "'Now has he learned your art?' "'In sooth that has he,' said the wizard cheerfully. "'Will not you try him?' "'That I will,' spake Bata. "'Go thou to work, scribe, and take three trials. "'Paint me the picture of Bata, "'Bata who puts foes to flight. Three trials shall be thine, and then so ceased Bata.' But when the wizard tried to go with me to the hut, Bata forbade him. Then did I, as I saw the wizard do, ere he took the box for making a picture, and forth I sallied to do my best. As I came forth, I pointed the box at the great Bata, and I pushed upon the magic piece, and hurried back to the hut, which had been made dark save for the crimson light which we brought from the cave. Here went I through the washing, but no picture came. Then strode I forth in sadness. The wizard pointed an accusing finger at the box, as I came out from the darkness of the hut, and then knew I what I had done. I had not uncovered the eye of the box. Again I essayed, and fled into the hut, but with careless hand to put the flat into the wrong dish, and behold again no picture came. Then came I forth in sadness. The wizard's face was like a dull day when the leaves are falling. But when I again pointed the magic box and opened its eye, and set in proper pieces with all due caution, he smiled again. With backward step, I betook myself for the last time to the dark hut, and rocked, and washed, and soaked, and washed, till I was weary like unto the slaves that row the galley of Bata. And this time the picture came forth like sunshine after a rain. And it was Bata, Bata upon his throne and dressed as for war. Then rushed I forth, rejoicing with my prize. And the wizard made merry. Into the warm sun did I set the picture to cook. And when I took it forth, it was so like to Bata that I thought it would speak. And I showed it to him proudly. But as the cloud comes over the face of the sun, so descended wrath upon the black brows of the great ruler as he gazed. "'Do I look like that?' cried he to the wizard. "'It is your very image,' spoke up one of the younger warriors. "'You are banished for life,' roared the just and great ruler of his people. 
and it was so from that day forth. "'Do I look like that?' he asked again with the voice of a thunder peal, this time turning to the white-haired counsellor, he who speaks little but wisely. "'I would not be so foolish as to say it was like you, great Bata,' answered the counsellor. And the rest who stood about said that his words were wise." "'Your art is no art,' then said the great Bata, and, calling the sword-bearer, he ordered that the wizard's box should be thrown into the sea, together with his vile compounds, his dishes, the liquids, and his flat pieces, and the baleful red fire-maker. And it was done upon that instant. "'It were best to send thee with thy tools,' said Bata and in a moment the wizard was hurried to the brink of the cliff which hangs over the playground of the waves. Here the manuscript is torn, and it is impossible to decipher it further. But I am sure that the reader will agree with me in deciding that it contains an early account of photography, and also that the conclusion, imperfect as it is, would lead one to suppose that the art was somewhat discouraged." Those who desire to verify the translation will find the original document among the archives of the Grand Lama's Museum in Tibet. You will find it at the back of the top shelf on the left-hand side. End of Prehistoric Photography Chapter 2 of Imaginations, Truthless Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. Imagine Oceans, Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. The Tongaloo Tournament. When I was a young man about thirty years of age, I came to the city to make my fortune. I had no profession, and was ready to do anything honorable that promised me fair wages. To save my money, I boarded with another young fellow who was also looking for work. He was hardly more than a boy, about fifteen, I think, but he may have been younger. His name was Marmaduke Perron, and I think he must have been French. He was always so gay and confident. Nothing made him blue. Even when he had spent all but enough to pay one week board, he would not be discouraged. He went every day to answer advertisements or to ask for work. I was older, came of Scotch stock, and was more easily disheartened. One day, after a long tramp about the city without finding anything, except an agency to sell very poor chromos, I came in and settled down by our little cylinder stove, entirely hopeless. I had about made up my mind to go back to my country home when Marmaduke came in. He seemed very jolly, and for the first moment I thought he must have found work. Then I remembered that he always did come back in a happy frame of mind, and I became gloomy again. This time, however, Marmaduke had found something, though I was inclined to sneer when he told me what it was. "'Well, our luck has turned at last,' said he brightly. "'I knew it would.' "'Have you found a place?' I inquired with but little interest. "'Yes,' he answered." And what is better, I have found a place for you, too. What is it? I asked, with some little hope. I went to answer an advertisement calling for agents willing to travel abroad, said Marmaduke, and I found a firm of dealers in notions who wanted two young men to go to Coria and sell a miscellaneous cargo. Coria? Where's Coria? I asked, for I had only a vague notion of the country. "'Don't know, I'm sure,' said Marmaduke, as if impatient of the interruption. "'But the old man I saw was quite confidential with me. "'He told me that his firm had bought a large number of roller skates "'and didn't quite know what to do with them. "'Why don't they sell them?' "'They can't. "'These are the old-fashioned kind. "'They fashion with straps,' Marmaduke explained. "'And all the new roller skates fashion with clamps, "'so there is no market for them in this country.' And why do they think they will sell in Korea? I asked with but little interest, for the whole scheme seemed to me very absurd. How did the firm come to buy them? There is a queer story about that, said Marmaduke earnestly. They told me about it in confidence, 
but I can tell you, because we're going into this enterprise together. You're sure of that? I asked, smiling in spite of myself. It's a splendid chance, said Marmaduke. The way they came to buy them was this. The senior partner of the firm is getting old and is a little shaky in his intellect, but he loves to buy things. And as his partners are his sons, they don't like to interfere with his pleasure. Usually he buys only trifles, but somehow he had an idea that these skates were a great investment, and he has bought hundreds of them. He expects to realize, as they say, a large profit. How ridiculous, I broke in. I don't think so, said Marmaduke. I think the old man has a very level head. Do you remember Lord Timothy Dexter and the warming pans? No, I don't, I answered, and he was too impatient to tell me about it. He was full of the Korean enterprise. Korea, he said, is, they tell me, a new country. That is, it hasn't long been open to commerce. I believe the natives will jump at the skates. As I was tired and sleepy, I refused to hear anything more about so foolish a venture and went to bed. Marmaduke tried in vain to talk to me as I was undressing. I shut my bedroom door and put out the light. Next morning, however, there was a very strong argument in favor of the plan. That was my lack of cash. I must do something. And as this firm offered to pay all our expenses and give us a commission besides, both on the present lot of skates and on all for which we might make a market, I couldn't see that we risked anything. Then, too, I was fond of the boy, was glad to be with him, and hadn't the heart to disappoint him by refusing. In short, I consented, though I was sure we were going on a fool's errand. So we set sail. Marmaduke was full of hope, and I, though expecting nothing, was glad of the sea voyage and of the rest. The first part of our journey was by steamer. The latter part was by a sailing vessel. The voyage was without anything to compare in interest with our adventures on land, so I will pass on to the time when we were put ashore near a native village which looked about as dreary and melancholy as any place could look. There wasn't a thing in sight except the low mud houses thatched with sort of rushes. We found out afterward that we had made a serious mistake. The place to which our cargo was consigned was something like a city as near as such things exist in Korea. But by mistake, in the name, we were landed upon an island where no white men had preceded us. Consequently, the natives had fled in terror when the ship landed us and unloaded our boxes of skates, and then sailed away as rapidly as possible. The captain, to judge by his hasty departure, knew the character of the natives and was glad to put a few leagues between his ship and these savages, for savages they were. As we soon found out, no sooner was the ship out of sight than the bushes round about the beach began to blossom with heads. Then the natives came out one by one, and before we fairly understood our position, we were seized, bound hand and foot, hoisted upon the shoulders of some outlandish warriors, and borne away in triumph, followed by a long file of natives carrying each a box of roller skates. We were entirely unarmed, and could have made no resistance, even if there had been time. "'This is a pleasant beginning,' I said with some bitterness. "'There's nothing very unpleasant so far,' said Marmaduke cheerfully. "'You know, I was afraid we might have trouble with the Custom House, or that the freight charges might eat up our profits. There doesn't seem to be any trouble about getting into the country, I must admit,' I answered frankly. But I am afraid there may be some question about who owns the goods when we get there. I don't believe in going to seek trouble, said Marmaduke. They evidently want our company and seem to have no objection to carrying our baggage. Meanwhile, the Koreans made no remarks, but kept up a steady jog trot, which soon brought them to the center of the village, where they halted before a hut larger than any we had seen. Here they untied us, and made signs that we should enter the hut. Probably the custom house, I said dryly. The principal hotel, I think, said Marmaduke, stretching his legs and arms. The building contained only one room, and at the further end of this sat the chief. At least we judged so, because he was the grossest-looking man in the room, 
and we subsequently discovered that we were right. Then began our trial, though, of course, we could not understand a word that was said. It was very easy to follow the general line of the talk. First, the man who commanded the procession which brought us in told his story. He described the ship, our landing, the ship's hasty departure, the capture of ourselves, and concluding, pointed to the boxes. Then the chief commanded one of the boxes to be opened. It was forced open with a small hatchet-like weapon, and one of the skates was handed to the chief. He was completely puzzled. He blew on it, rubbed it over his head, weighed it, tried to spin it, and then turned to us, saying something like, Walla ala ing kang cho. Thereupon, Marmaduke replied sweetly, Yes, most noble panjandrum, you have hit it exactly. It's a simple roller skate. I see you don't understand it at all, and I'm not surprised. You don't seem over-intelligent. The chief shook his head impatiently and growled. Then he picked up an ivory baton lying by his side and struck a sweet-toned gong. I hope that's dinner, said Marmaduke, and I agreed with him, providing we were to be guests only and not the choicest dainties on the bill of fare. But we were wrong. As the gong tones were dying away, a curious figure entered the hut and made its way toward the dais where the chief was sitting. It was that of an old man with a scanty snow-white beard. He carried a carved rattle in his hand and shook it as he walked. "'Well, old rattlebox," said Marmaduke, "'I hope you will help us out of this fix. Maybe he's an interpreter.' "'More likely to be the head cook,' was my suggestion. The newcomer conferred for a few moments with the chief, and then bent all his energies to the mystery of the roller skate. Needless to say, it was too much for him. But he seemed clever enough to pretend he knew all about it. So taking the skate very gingerly in his left hand, he spun the little wheels with his right. Then he dropped it as if it was a very hot potato, and turning to the chief, began to chatter away, in a tone which showed he was bringing some frightful accusation against our innocent merchandise. The chief, as the old man spoke, drew himself away from the skate, which had fallen near his foot, and regarded the harmless wheels and straps with an expression of dread and distrust. "'I see the old fellow's game,' said Marmaduke. He doesn't know at all what it is, any more than his superb highness, the ignoramus on the bench. And so he has told them it's witchcraft, or bugaboo, or taboo, or something of the kind. They'll be for slaying us outright in a moment, you'll see. And indeed, in a minute, the chief gave a hasty order, and the soldiers advanced upon us. "'Good-bye, Marmaduke, my lad,' said I, in a sorrowful tone. "'Life is short at best, dear friend, and—' "'Don't be a whiner yet,' said Marmaduke. "'You haven't heard the counsel for the defense yet. "'I'll move the whole courtroom to tears in a moment. "'You're a brave boy,' said I, smiling sadly at him. "'Good-bye. I should not have led you into this trouble.' "'You just keep quiet, and you'll see me leave you out of it,' said Marmaduke. "'Then, while the chief was giving some too plain directions to the guards,' Ending up by drawing his hand eloquently across his throat, Marmaduke arose to his feet. "'Fellow citizens,' he said. All the natives turned toward him, for his voice was as commanding as that of a football captain. "'You are making idiots of yourselves. As for old Rattlebox there, he doesn't know beans. If there were any sense in his noddle, he would have guessed what the roller skate was for in a jiffy. Just see here.' Then Marmaduke took a pencil from his pocket, and seizing a piece of the pine box, began to draw a picture. Now Marmaduke was a natural artist, and consequently spoke a universal language. The natives bent over to see what he was doing, and even the chief elbowed his way to the front, after pushing over several of the other selfish spectators. Marmaduke made a picture of himself on roller skates, gliding gracefully over the ground, and drew a native running at full speed beside him. In vain did old Rattlebox stand outside, shaking his head and muttering his disapproval. Marmaduke's picture had excited the native's curiosity, and when he leaned over, 
and took a pair of skates from the box, seated himself, and proceeded to put them on, only one hand was raised to prevent him. Rattlebox tried to take the skates from his hand, and was soundly cuffed by the deeply interested chief. Then we knew that the tide had turned. In a moment, Marmaduke strapped on the skates and arose to his feet. Luckily, the floor was of hard-beaten earth, and made an excellent rink. As he glided gently along the floor, the chief caught him by the arm, pointed to the door, smiled very significantly, and shook his head. "'That's all right, old man,' said Marmaduke cordially. "'I'm not going away. At least, not till I've sold out my skates.' "'Put a guard at the door.' and he pointed to a soldier and then at the doorway. The chief was a quick-witted old warrior, and he saw the point at once. The guard was posted. Then Marmaduke, who was an excellent skater, motioned the crowd back and cut pigeon wings to the admiration of his spectators. They laughed and shouted and clapped their hands with delight. At last, Marmaduke said to me, "'Don't you think that's enough for the present?' "'Yes,' I replied, smiling in spite of myself." "'but I don't see what good it is going to do.' "'Well, you shall see,' said Marmaduke. "'So then he glided gracefully on the outside edge over to the chief "'and made signs that he was hungry. "'The chief, now in the best of humor, "'nodded, laughed, and gave some orders to an attendant. "'In a few minutes some hot rice and other food, "'chickens, I think, was brought, "'and we sat down to our first meal in Coria. But previously, Marmaduke made signs to the chief to send the crowd away by pointing to the door and pushing at the crowd. The chief smiled again, cleared the room, and contented himself with posting two strong spearmen at the door. As we ate our meal, Marmaduke conversed with the chief, and by patient endeavors at last made him understand that he, the chief, could also learn this wonderful art. Then the joy of the old barbarian was unbounded, and he wished to begin at once. But Marmaduke pointed to the dinner, looked imploringly at the chief, and thus obtained a postponement until the meal was done. But no sooner was the table, or mat, cleared than the chief held out his feet for the skates. He will break his royal neck, sure, I said nervously, thinking what our fate would be in case of such a happening. Oh, I think not, said Marmaduke cheerfully but we have to take some risks in every business. This is a sort of speculation. But his feet will go out from under him at the first step, I insisted. We must support him, said Marmaduke. Put on your skates, and remember that if Jack falls down and breaks his crown, we're ruined. We put on our skates. We strapped the royal feet firmly to the treacherous rollers and helped him up. A fish out of water was nothing to the antics of that unfortunate savage. One guard at the door tried in vain to restrain his mirth. When the king went scooting over the floor as we supported his limp frame with its two awkward legs projecting aimlessly forward, the guard burst into a loud guffaw. The chief, or king, heard that unhappy man's laugh and, struggling wildly to his feet, roared an order to the other guards. The unfortunate soldier was at once hurried away to prison or something worse. Thereafter, there was no outward levity. We toiled with his royal highness for several hours. He was plucky and gave up only when completely tired out. Then we took a recess until the following morning. For the next day or two, we were in high favor at court and fared sumptuously. And when the king found that he could really skate alone, he was perfectly happy. Of course, he had a fall or two, but the craze for roller skating was upon him, and Marmaduke's first exhibition had shown him that there was still much to learn. Consequently, he was anxious to keep our favor, at least until he acquired the art and did not mind a bump or two. At first, the chief was unwilling to allow anyone else to learn, but Marmaduke, who had even learned a few words of the language, persuaded the old man that it would be great fun to see Rattlebox learn to skate. And at last the chief consented. When the old medicine man came in, he was horrified to see the ruler of his nation gliding about the floor with considerable ease, and listened with terror to the chief's command that he too must acquire this art. 
but he did not dare refuse. And besides, the clever old man foresaw that skating would be the fashion as soon as the knowledge that the chief had patronized it should become general. I do not think the chief was ever more amused in his life than when he watched Rattlebox take his first instruction on the rollers. He laughed till he cried, and even permitted the guards to laugh, too. But the medicine man was an apt pupil, and before long there was a quartet of fairly skillful performers on the floor. Then we threw open the doors to the public and gave a grand exhibition. It would no doubt have run or skated a hundred nights or more. The success of the art was assured, and the next month was one long term of skating school. We had plenty of skates, and the chief caused a large floor to be laid and roofed over for the sport. Soon the craze was so general that the chief had to make penalties for those who skated except at certain legal hours. Marmaduke could by this time readily make himself understood in simple sentences, though he was not far enough advanced to comprehend much that was said. And one day he announced that he was ready to return to New York. "'But they'll never let us go in the world,' I said, somewhat out of temper. For, to tell the truth, I was not at all pleased with Marmaduke's apparent interest in this barbarous people. "'Oh, yes, they will,' said he. "'You'll see.' We'll just have to get a boat and row away. And be a target for all the bowmen on the island, I said. You've had wonderful luck so far, I admit, but I don't care to run a skating rink for Korean savages all my life. Nor do I, said Marmaduke. I'm going to give a grand tournament with prizes, and then give up the business and leave Tongaloo forever. And be eaten at the conclusion of the tournament. I think not, he said, and turned again to his work. He was painting a large poster with native dyes, representing a grand skating race. Over the top he had printed in large letters. There, said he as he finished, now you must do all you can to make the thing a success. So I did. I went about all day among the skaters, saying, Bunga Tangaloo Tournament, Yangagu Tangaloo Tournament and other such phrases as Marmaduke taught me. These words meant, he said, that it was all the rage and the correct thing. At last the great day arrived. The chief had furnished the minor prizes, but the great event of all was to be the final straightaway race open to all comers, and for this the first prize was to be Marmaduke's gold watch, and the second my stylographic pen. The course was laid out along the best native road, which Marmaduke had taught them to macadamize for the occasion. The distance was to be a mile out, and then back again to the starting point. Every able-bodied islander was entered, and Marmaduke and I put on our skates with the rest. Amid tremendous excitement, the signal was given, and away they went clatter, 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 down the road. Gradually, Marmaduke and I, though, apparently making unusual exertions, fell behind. And as soon as the crowd had gained a good lead on us, we sat down, cut off our skates, and struck out across country for the beach. One or two of the nearest skaters stared after us, and then tried to pursue. But as they forgot to remove their skates, so soon as they reached rough ground, they went over upon their noses like nine pins, and in a few minutes we were far ahead. We gained the beach just as the foremost pursuers began to push their way through the bushes, and climbing into a boat, away we shot toward a neighboring island, which was occupied by a more civilized race. Well, we escaped without being hit by a single arrow, and sailed for New York shortly afterward. End of the Tongaloo Tournament Chapter 3 of Imaginations Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alethea. Imaginations Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. The Dragon's Story. 
guaranteed strictly untrue. Mama, please tell us a story, cried all the young dragons. Children, do be less noisy, said their father, the Honorable Samuel P. Dragon. He had slain a knight that very evening, and was perhaps a little irritable. Young dragons should be thoughtful, and should never disturb their parents after the night's fighting is over. Hush, children, said Mrs. Dragon. Your father has to fight hard all night, and in the day he needs his rest. I will tell you one nice story, if you will promise to go quietly to bed afterward. The youngsters coiled down into comfortable hollows in the rock, and Mrs. Dragon prepared to begin her story. I suppose you would prefer a man's story? Please, Mama, we are so tired of when I was a little dragon. Tell us a real man's story, but be sure not to have the dragon hurt. We like it to end happily, Mama. Very well. Listen quietly now. Don't rustle your wings nor flop your tails. Sammy, stop blowing flames into your sister's face this moment, or not a word shall you hear. There was once a most delightful land, full of bogs and moist-smelling marshes, of dark, rocky caves, all damp and cold. The lakes were covered with beautiful green mold. No flowers grew in the fields, nothing but cool rushes, ferns, and mosses. In short, it was a land in which any dragon might be glad to crawl. No sunshine to shrink the scales or dry the wings, no bright glaring meadows to dazzle one's poor eyes. Why, even at midday one could slide comfortably about on the slippery, slimy banks and never catch a blink of a sunbeam on the water. Oh, how nice! Really and truly, Mama? asked the small dragons, laughing with so much delight that the flames from their pretty scarlet throats lighted up the cave until Mr. Dragon stirred uneasily in his dreams for he had fallen asleep. Really and truly, their mother went on in a lower tone. In this charming country, your father and I began our cave-keeping. We were very happy for a time, for not too far from us was your father's estate, a fertile valley, well-stocked with plump and well-flavored inhabitants. You have never seen any whole men, have you? No, they replied eagerly. What are they like? Oh, so ugly. To begin with, they have no scales, no wings, no claws. No wings and no claws? How frightful they must be, exclaimed young Samuel Dragon Jr., proudly expanding his green pinions. Not a wing, replied Mrs. Dragon, and they walk, when mature, exclusively on their hind legs. Why is that? asked the children. I cannot tell. It does seem absurd. When young they go on all fours like sensible animals, but the elders pull and persuade, teach and coax, until the poor little things rear up on their hind legs, and then the foolish old ones seem satisfied. Men are very queer. When they first came on this earth, this earth where dragons dwell, they lived, properly enough, in caves like the rest of the world. But they are a stupid and restless kind of creatures, and soon began to tear pieces out of the world to make caves to suit themselves. Now they slaughter trees, slice and split them, fasten the pieces together, and stalk in and out of queer little holes called doors. But I cannot spare time to tell you any more about their curious instincts. You must read it for yourselves some day in the Dragon's Economical Cave Keeper, the Marketing Manual. Look in the index under Animal Foods, Apes, Men, and Various Bipeds. You will find it interesting and useful, too. As I said, we were happy for a time. We used to stroll out quietly in the evening and often managed to secure a nice chubby man or two in an hour's flight. But at length came an age when those mean creatures decided to revolt. 
That is, they kept in their little caves at night and compelled us to go out so frequently in the unhealthful, glaring daylight that our scales were hardly fit to be seen. Even with all this exposure, we would succeed in catching only some of the little ones. Indeed, during a whole month, I caught nothing but two thin, miserable specimens. Think how your poor mother suffered. I was almost starved. I became so thin that I rattled. Mrs. Dragon looked at the young audience and saw that the eyes of the two smallest were really shedding sparks. She was touched by their sympathy, but, fearing the story was becoming too sad, hastened to brighten it. Well, dears, it did not last long. Your father was young, rash, and brave in those nights. One dawn, he said, Really, Scalina, this will not do. I can stand this foolishness no longer. I asked what he intended, but he waved his tail in a threatening way and smiled knowingly as he wetted his claws on a new piece of sandstone. The next night, bidding me not to be anxious, he left me. I looked after him as long as I could see the flames in the sky and then returned wearily to our cave to pick the last bone. The next morning, just at dawn, he returned with a delicious marketing. He said it was a butcher, I think, though it may have been a judge. The flavor is much the same. Then, when we had retired into the darkest, dampest, coziest corner of the cave, he told me very modestly the story of his great achievement. Your brave father, children, had been down to where the whole swarm of men lived, and actually had beaten to pieces one of the wooden caves. He made light of his exploit, and only rejoiced in it because, as he said, he had no fear now of famine or even of scarcity. We sat up late that happy morning, enjoyed a delicious supper, and slept soundly until nightfall. We arose with the moon, and after a hasty but effective toilet on this new sandstone, your father advanced glidingly toward the mouth of the cave, when suddenly there presented itself a dark object with a shiny coat, much like that of a dragon. Indeed, we thought for a moment it was some neighbor who had dropped in to breakfast, but in a few seconds we saw that it was what is called a knight. A knight, children, is an animal which, though edible, is noxious and sometimes dangerous to young or careless dragons. I have heard of such being even killed by this spiteful little pest. They are found among men. In fact, they are a species of men that has a hard shell. You know there are hard shell crabs and soft shell crabs, and so likewise there are hard and soft shelled men. Our visitor was a hard shell who had, while prowling about, found our cave either by accident or willfully. I do not deny that I was a trifle anxious, but your father was merely angry. Giving a great roar, he blew out a mass of dark smoke and scarlet flames at the unfortunate little knight. But though small, the knight was plucky and showed fight. As your father carelessly leaped toward him, the knight scratched your papa slightly with a long, hard stick, on the end of which was a bit of very hard shell. Then the knight rode out, for he had enslaved an unfortunate horse, as these cruel men do, my pets, and by means of a contrivance in its mouth he made it carry him about wherever he chose. Your father eagerly followed, though I sought in vain to restrain him. No, Scalina, said he, this is a question of principle. As a true dragon and your loving mate, it is my duty to destroy this dangerous little fellow. Do not be foolish. I will bring you the body of the fierce creature. They are excellent eating, but you must sharpen your claws, my dear, for the shells are exceedingly hard to remove and most difficult of digestion. I obeyed him, for your father is always right, and out he flew with a rush of smoke and flame. "'Oh, mother! And was father killed?' asked one of the youngest, little Tommy Dragon. "'Of course not,' 
replied his elder brother scornfully. Don't you see him sleeping over there, all safe and sound? Don't be so silly. You must not speak so sharply to your little brother, said Mrs. Dragon, or I shall end the story at once. Oh, please go on, exclaimed all the young dragons. It is just the most interesting part. Pleased with their eagerness, she resumed. I did not see the hunt, but your father has often described it to me. The knight came wickedly at him, hoping to scratch him with a sharp stick. But with one whisk of his long green tail, your father broke the thing into small pieces. So you see, Sam, said this thoughtful parent, turning slyly to her eldest son, it is most important to practice your tail whisking, and I hope you will not forget it when you go to your next lesson. Sammy Dragon turned saffron with confusion, but it was evident that he resolved to profit by the little morale so ingeniously woven by careful Mrs. Dragon into a mere man-story. After the stick was broken, she went on, the vicious little knight snatched out another, made entirely of the hard shell with which the first was only tipped. With this he tried his worst to break some of your father's lovely scales. Think what a ferocious animal this knight must have been. I cannot see what they are made for. But then it is instinct, perhaps. We must not judge him too harshly. This new weapon met the fate of the other. It was crunched up by your father's strong teeth, and then he descended upon the little hard-shell man with a great swoop, and that decided the battle. Your father is a modest dragon, but he was really proud of the swiftness with which he ended that conflict. After he once had a fair opportunity to use his newly sharpened claws, there was no doubt of the result. We ate the night at our next meal. I was glad to welcome your father, but he said, Pooh, nonsense, and made light of the whole matter. The young dragons were delighted and even thought of asking for another story but their mother, for the first time, noticed that it was almost broad daylight. "'But goodness, children, I hear the horrid little birds singing,' said she. "'Run away to bed with you. Wrap yourselves up tight in your moist wings, and be sure to sleep on damp rocks in a draught where you will keep good and cold.' The youngsters crawled away to rest, while Mrs. Dragon went to rouse the Honorable Samuel P. Dragon. To her surprise, she saw his great green eyes glowing with a sulfurous satisfaction. There are no times like the old times, said he drowsily. That was really a splendid hunt. Yes, dear, replied his mate with a proud and happy smile, but I had no idea you were listening to my foolish stories. We must now go to rest, or you won't be up till midnight. And then there won't be a single man about. Remember, it is the late dragon that catches the night. The Honorable Samuel P. Dragon rubbed his claws gently together as he selected a nice cozy place for the day. He was humming to himself, and faithful Mrs. Dragon smiled fondly as she recognized the tune. It was, I fear no foe in shining armor. Ah, said she to herself, the old people like man stories as well as the little ones. End of The Dragon's Story Guaranteed Strictly Untrue Recording by Alethea Chapter Number 4 of Imagine Oceans, Truthless Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Hind Imagine Oceans, Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks Chapter 4. A Duel in a Desert A lazy magician, tired of work, left Damascus and went into a sandy desert, seeking quiet and solitude. Finding a lonely place not yet divided into building lots, he filled his pipe and, after smoking it out, fell fast asleep. An indolent wizard, looking for rest, came riding across the desert upon a magic camel, which he had made out of an old rug that morning, and, not seeing the sleeping magician, ran over him. 
Now, magical creations cannot touch magicians without vanishing, so the wizard's camel vanished. The wizard fell plump down on top of the magician, and the baggage which the camel carried was scattered on the sand. The wizard was the first to collect his senses, and asked in a fierce voice, Where is my camel? The magician replied with some anger, Don't you think you'd better ask someone who was awake while your camel was getting away? You are the only man I have met in this desert, replied the wizard. Perhaps, resumed the magician, your camel may have climbed one of the trees with which you see the desert is covered. If you think I've got him, you can search me. I made that camel only this morning, said the wizard complainingly. You are then a magician, asked the other. No, I'm only a wizard, replied the first. Well, I'm a magician, and I should think you would know better than to drive your camel up against me. It was careless, I admit, replied the wizard. But let that go, I can make another. I hope I didn't hurt you. Oh, not at all. I was lying down there on purpose. That is why I came to the desert, where there are so many passing, remarked the magician, rubbing his side. I cannot regret an accident which brings me so agreeable a companion, replied the wizard with a low bow. I'm sorry to have lost my temper, said the magician more good-naturedly, but since I came to this desert looking for quiet and solitude, I was not glad to see you. I also was sorry to meet anyone, even yourself, for I was equally anxious to be alone, rejoined the wizard frankly. Well, said the magician thoughtfully, since you are a wizard and I a magician and each of us wishes solitude, the matter is easily remedied. Nothing is easier than to put twenty leagues between us. I have only to wish it. Allow me, asked the wizard politely, to join you in the wish. Certainly, said the magician. We can save our feelings by making the parting mutual. We will wish together. Agreed, said the wizard eagerly. Are you ready? Quite, returned the magician, delighted. So they raised their wands, shook hands, and said together, I wish myself twenty leagues away. They were powerful enchanters, and the wish was at once accomplished. In an instant they stood together in a place twenty leagues away. I am afraid, said the magician after a moment's silence, I am afraid that this cannot be called a success. We have travelled some distance, but solitude seems as far off as ever. Perhaps we forgot to take it with us. We must wish again, this time each for himself. The wizard agreed that this was the best plan. So saying, excuse my back. He turned from the magician and wished himself back again where he was at first. Instantly he was there, among his pieces of baggage. Ah, said he, smiling, it was not a bad adventure, but I am glad to be alone again. Ahem, exclaimed a voice behind him. I beg pardon, I am sure, but I fear there has been another mistake. I am sorry to see we both happened to find this spot so attractive. The wizard turned and saw the magician standing behind him, looking very foolish. So you're there, are you? Well, it was a natural mistake. We must have no mistake this time. I'll give the word, and let us each wish ourselves forty leagues away in opposite direction. You to the east, and I to the west. The word was given, the wands waved, and presto, nothing at all. Each stood where he was before, for each expected the other to wish himself away. It seems to me, said the wizard after a slight pause, that it is hardly fair to expect me to leave all my baggage lying around here on the sand. But I was here first, said the magician. Yes, to sleep. It strikes me as rather a spacious bedroom. I like a large bedroom, replied the magician, but we wander from the subject. It is, of course, useless for us to wish again. We have had our three chances and must now make the best of it. Sit down and have a smoke. In a moment they were puffing out blue clouds of smoke, sitting cross-legged opposite each other. May I ask, said the wizard presently, how long you have been practicing your profession? Only since Merlin's time, say, about a thousand years. I was a pupil of Merlin, and a very good teacher he was. Indeed, said the wizard with more respect. That is a long time. I cannot claim more than five centuries. I am but a beginner beside you. By hard work, you might have learned much in that time. I fear I have been lazy, said the wizard regretfully. Perhaps being, as Shakespeare will soon say, an older soldier, not a better, I might be able to give you a useful hint or two. We have still some daylight before us. Suppose we have a lesson. I fear I will only bore you, said the wizard, rather nettled by the patronage of the other. I have nothing else to do and should enjoy teaching so promising a pupil, said the magician rather pompously. This was a little too much, for the wizard had graduated with a degree of F.W., full wizard, some three centuries before. He attempted to make excuses, saying, I am really out of practice. My wand is dusty from disuse. Don't bother your excuses. I can see your true rank at once. Go ahead, said the magician. Not seeing how to refuse without being rude, the wizard, after a minute's hesitation, rose, and, walking a little apart, drew a circle in the sand. 
Standing here, he waved his wand slowly in the air and repeated a mystic incantation. The magician, who had only received the degree of PM, passable magician, when he graduated, looked on very critically. At the most impressive part of the charm, the wizard suddenly and violently sneezed, in spite of all he could do. Much ashamed, he turned to excuse himself. No, that's nothing, said the magician with a condescending smile. It is a little awkwardness, natural to a beginner. No more than I expected. Throwing your arms about creates a draft, makes you chilly. You sneeze naturally enough. Go on, we won't count this time. The wizard was much vexed, but kept his temper and resumed the charm. Soon a mist poured from the tip of his wand like the smoke from a cigar and formed a cloud above his head, which slowly revolved and wound itself up into a ball until, as the chant ended, an enormous figure appeared. The wizard turned proudly to the magician, who said nothing. At length, the wizard, seeing no sign of movement in his rival, asked confidently, "'How's that?' "'Well,' said the other, crossing his legs as he filled his pipe, it isn't bad, not very bad. It is really fair work of a certain kind. But it isn't the way I was taught. However, I'm afraid of hurting your feelings. Not at all, said the wizard. I am delighted to be criticized. Speak freely, I beg. The old magician, with a bland smile and half-shut eyes, went on. Well, it seems to me too long, much too long. If you were in a hurry, suppose a rhinoceros was stamping his feet on your doormat, you wouldn't have time to do all that. That cloud is no use, it only spoils the effect, it, it is out of style. And your spirit looks rather stupid and underbred, an ugly wretch. A terrific howl was heard as the spirit dashed down upon the magician, seeking to tear him to pieces. The magician gently raised his wand, and the spirit melted, as snow does into the ocean, and the magician went on quietly. That shows you what a fool he is. No discretion and no stamina. The wizard was rather cast down and said sullenly, Perhaps you will show me how you would do it. The magician smiled and, rising, took a handful of dust and threw it over the wizard's head. When are you to begin? asked the wizard. Look around, said the magician. The wizard turned and saw a little winged figure looking like a fairy. That is my spirit, said the magician. It's too small to be of any use, remarked the wizard scornfully. I think you will find it quite large enough for all practical purposes. Why, my spirit, said the wizard, could roll yours up like a dry leaf and put it in his pocket. Well, said the magician good-naturedly, I have no objection to that. Let him try. The wizard pronounced the incantation and summoned his spirit. Ahab, cried the wizard, calling the spirit by name, fetch me that small imp. Master, I obey shouted the spirit in a voice of thunder, and then suddenly dashed down upon the little fairy. If the fairy had remained still, it might have been hurt, but just as Ahab came rushing down, the fairy darted away like a hummingbird, too quick for the eye to see the motion. Ahab made a clutch, but caught nothing but sand. Again he tried, but with no better success. A third and fourth trial so exhausted the huge monster that he sat down upon the sand, completely tired out. The wizard danced around in a perfect rage, and when Ahab gave it up, raising his wand, he waved it thrice, and commanded the fairy to stand still. The fairy bowed and stood quiet. "'Now, Ahab,' said the wizard triumphantly, "'bring her to me!' Ahab arose, and, walking heavily to the fairy, took her by the arm. The arm came off in his grasp, but Ahab, not noticing this, brought it to the wizard. "'You dunce!' commenced the wizard, but the absurdity of the situation overcame him, and he laughed, saying, well, bring me the rest of her. On the next trip, Ahab brought the head. Very good, said the wizard. Perseverance will bring her. Go on. In a few more journeys, the pieces of the fairy lay at the wizard's feet. There, said the wizard in triumph. I think that ends your spirit. Not at all, said the magician, pointing his wand at the heap of arms, wings, body, and head. In an instant, the pieces flew together, and the fairy stood before them as well as ever. Come now, said the wizard angrily. That's not fair. You had to help your spirit. Why shouldn't I help mine? I only kept your spirit still. I only put mine together. The wizard had to admit the justice of the magician's claim, but, completely losing his temper, he said angrily, I don't believe you're any sort of magician with all your airs. You may have a friend among the fairies, but I'd like to see what you can do by yourself. Send your spirit away, and we'll see who is the better man. The spirits were dismissed, and the magician, never losing his temper, said with a smile, I can't afford to show you my magic for nothing. If you will insist on seeing what I can do in the way of real old Egyptian magic, I will show you. On one condition. What is that? 
that he who shows the best magic shall take the wand and power of the other. Do you agree? The wizard, although startled, was too angry to be prudent and replied boldly, I agree. Let us lose no time, then, said the magician with a crafty smile. Now are you ready? Quite ready, said the wizard. Find that, then. And as he spoke, the magician threw his wand high into the air. An immense bird that was flying overhead clutched the wand and flew off with lightning speed. <laughs> A baby's trick, said the wizard, laughing. I learned that with the alphabet, the idea of playing magical hide-and-seek with me. And breaking his wand into nine short pieces, he stuck them up in the sand, forming a circle around him. Out from each suddenly sprang a wire, and stretched itself along above the sand, like a serpent, only a thousand times faster. And down from this wire fell poles, and stuck up in the sand. In the middle of this ring of sticks sat the wizard, with a telegraph instrument, ticking away for dear life. In a moment he stopped and listened. An answering tick was soon heard, and the wizard, smiling, said, "'We shall have a dispatch very soon. Wonderful thing, the telegraph, wonderful.' A speck was seen in the distance, coming quickly toward them. It soon resolved itself into a small boy, running as fast as he could. "'Well, my boy,' said the wizard, rubbing his hands as the messenger arrived. "'Please, sir, here's a package and a letter for you, sir,' replied the boy, puffing a little from his run. "'Please sign my receipt.' "'Certainly, certainly,' said the wizard, scarcely hearing what was said, and handing the package to the magician, he opened his letter. It read as follows. "'Borneo, July 12th. "'Your message received.' Enclosed find wand as requested. Had to shoot bird. Sorry. We'll have it stuffed. Yours, Ahab. The magician opened the package, and there was the wand. You are a little behind the age, said the wizard. I should think you would know better than to race with electricity. You really did it very well, very well indeed, said the magician, a little vexed. But as you say, it was a baby's trick. I was foolish to try it. Well, said the wizard, let us not waste any more time. Do your very best this time, and let us get through with it. Please, sir, said the telegraph messenger, sign my receipt. I'm in a hurry. Get out. I can't bother with you now, said the wizard impatiently. The idea, he went on to the magician, of stopping me now for such a trifle as signing a receipt. The boy laughed softly to himself, but no one noticed him, so he stood and watched what was going on. Meanwhile, the magician was thinking over his very best tricks. At last, he said solemnly, This time, I show you something worth seeing. Then he wiped his wand in the skirt of his robe and pronounced a long incantation, while the wizard pretended to be very tired of it. As the incantation proceeded, a crystal ball formed itself out of the air and floated before them. What's that for? asked the boy, apparently much interested. That's the biggest marble I ever saw. That said the magician with great impressiveness, not noticing his spoke, is the magician tester. Merlin invented it for the express purpose of putting down conceited magicians. Such is its peculiar construction that only the greatest and most powerful magician can get inside it. Get into that marble, said the boy. I don't see what for. Probably not, said the magician, much amused. Now see here, Johnny, said the wizard impatiently. Don't you think you'd better run home? I must have my receipt signed, said the boy positively. Besides, it's fun to see this game. Never mind him, said the magician. Now what I propose is this. You and I stand about twenty paces from the tester. Then let the boy count three, for while you pay for his time, we may as well use him. Whoever first appears in the tester shall be the winner. Am I in this? asked the boy, much delighted. Certainly, said the magician, smiling graciously. Let's see if I know the game said the boy eagerly. You two fellows stand a little way off, then I count three, and you two cut as fast as you can for the marble, and then whoever of us three gets into it first wins. The magician was much amused to see that the boy included himself in the game, and replied, Well, yes, that's the game. There can be no harm in your trying. What's the use of talking nonsense to the boy? asked the wizard. No, it amuses him and doesn't hurt us, replied the magician good-naturedly. Get your places, called the boy, who seemed to enjoy the game very much. They retired in opposite directions, while the boy also went back some distance. You're ready, cried the magician. Hold on, said the boy suddenly. I'm not half so big as you two. I ought to have a start. The wizard was much provoked at the delay, but the magician said, laughing, <laughs> All right, my boy, take any start you like, but hurry. The boy took a few steps, carefully compared the distances, and took a step or two more. He seemed very much excited. Is that about right? he asked. Yes, yes, do hurry up, said the wizard. 
Are you ready? said the boy. Yes, they replied. One, two, three! shouted the boy, and off he went as fast as his short legs could carry him. The wizard and magician, starting at the same instant, ran with very great speed, and reached the tester on opposite sides at about the same time. Both did their best to get inside, but it was no use. Each turned away, thinking himself defeated. In turning from the tester, they met. Hello, cried the magician. I thought you were inside the tester. And I thought you were, said the wizard, equally surprised. Well, what does this mean? asked the magician. I can't tell, replied the wizard. I didn't make the tester. There must have been some mistake. No, no, it's all right, said the magician. We must try again. Where's the boy? Here I am, said the boy's voice. Where, they asked, not able to see him. In the marble, said the boy. I have won. There was no mistake. They both could see him, coiled up in the tester and grinning with delight. This is too ridiculous, said the magician. Come out of that, you little monkey. I shan't, said the boy, clapping his hands with glee. I've won, and I'm to have the prize. You shan't have anything but a good thrashing, said the wizard, and catching up his wand, he rushed towards the tester. But at that moment a crack was heard. The tester broke like a bubble, and forth from it came the majestic figure of the enchanter Merlin. The wizard and magician fell upon their knees. It is Merlin, they cried. Yes, replied the enchanter gravely, it is Merlin. When a wizard and magician spend their mighty powers in juggling tricks fit only to amuse fools, those powers must be taken from them. You have made the agreement and must abide by it. Drop your wands. The wands fell upon the sand. Go home and work. And they went home and worked, and neither of them married a princess or lived happily ever after. Merlin laughed softly to himself and, remarking, There's a couple of dunces, changed himself back into a messenger boy, signed his receipt himself, and walked away over the desert. Soon he disappeared over the horizon, and all was still. End of chapter 4 A Duel in a Desert Chapter 5 of Imagine Notions Truthless Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kieran Metz. Imaginations. Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 5. The Sequel. My rudeness, as usual, was entirely unintentional. I meant to have given him my undivided attention, but the long roll of the steamer, the soft ocean breeze, and the flapping wings of the seagulls must have overpowered me. At all events, I slept and heard only the sequel. The steamer ran between Calcutta and Liverpool and was on her return voyage. Among the passengers was Mr. Chuba Boy Mujahoy, supposed to be an East Indian gentleman from the interior. Attracted by his quiet and intellectual face, I had become well acquainted with him, and our acquaintance had grown during the long voyage, almost to intimacy. Upon the day of which I am speaking, we had been much together. He grew communicative, and at last proposed to tell me the story of his life. To my surprise, he said that the impression that he was an East Indian was without foundation, in fact, that he came from Tibet, from an unknown district of that unexplored region. If I remember correctly, he related a marvelous story of having entered into competition for the hand of a neighboring princess. This part, so far as I recall it, was quite in the old-fashioned fairy tale style and the tests required of the candidates were certainly astounding. One I remember vaguely was to bring the favorite uncut pigeon's blood ruby from the Raja of Kamaraputa, a cruel Indian magnate. Here it was, however, that the sea began to gently roll, the breeze to soothingly blow, and the seagulls to drowsily flap their limber wings. I slept for some time, for when thoroughly refreshed, I blinked lazily to waking, all I heard was, and so I married the princess. I was sorry to have lost the story, for it was no doubt just the sort I like, but I did not dare to confess my doze, so I said as brightly as I could, and lived happily ever after. Mujahoy moved uneasily and replied, well, hardly, of course I expected to, but then you know that real life is often different from what the kindly storytellers would have it. No, I can't say we lived happily ever after, nor was it Dorima's fault. 
I have met a number of princesses, and I really cannot see that my Dorima has any superiors. How then do you explain it? I asked. Of course, I had to be a little cautious in my questions, for fear of bringing up references to points I had missed during my nap. I'll tell you the story, if you have not heard too much already. Oh, no, I replied. Not at all too much. Pray, go on. So Mujahoy told me the second part. I have always regretted that I heard only this sequel. I tell it in his words. You can see that after having accomplished such a series of tasks, I was sure to be respected and envied at court. We passed the honeymoon in the mountains, and as we took but a small retinue, several thousands, Dorima often spoke of the strange solitude as a delicious rest after the bustle and turmoil of court life. For my part, even in my happiness with Dorima, she was really charming. I found the retinue something of a bore. At home, I had never been attended by more than three or four servants, while here I had to find employment and use for a hundred times as many. It was really one of the minor nuisances of my new dignity. If the old king had not abdicated, it would have been easier. But now all his servants were added to the new ones purchased or given as wedding presents to me. It was like this. If I wished to shave in the morning in the old days, I would heat some water, strop my razor, and whip up some lather, and shave away. But as a king it was very different. As a king, I had first to clap my hands. Enter a small boy in white linen. To him, I intimated my desire to see one of the high officials. High official arrives, and I say, We wish to shave our effulgent self. High official says, Oh, very good, most particularly noble cousin of the dog star, and so on. Then he disappears and sends the chamberlain to tell the seneschal to tell the chief barber that his imperial master wishes to be shaved. Not to weary you, after some more, many more, wholly unnecessary and irritating ceremonies, behold, me ready to be shaved. I am extended at length in a chair, being lathered by the first latherer in waiting, while the bowl holder or one of his assistants stands by with the lathering mug and is supported by the brush receiver. The chief barber sits in state, fanned by two slaves, while the razor stropper extraordinary a very powerful and much courted personage, as expert ones are rare, is getting the razor to an edge. He also is fanned by a fan bearer or two. The Lord High Wielder of the Towel and the Bay Rum Custodian, also with attendants, are near, and in the anteroom I hear a confused murmur of voices, showing that the court surgeon and court plaster bearer are, with their retinues, within call. It was not so much the crowd of people that annoyed me, but that it took so long to be shaved. We would begin at, say, 10 o'clock. They wouldn't hear of my getting up earlier. And frequently, when the last bit of lather was removed from my royal ear, it would be half past one in the afternoon. I give this only as a sample part of my day. It is vividly recalled because it was one of the earliest of the inconveniences attaching to my newly acquired royalty. Of course, it is only a specimen brick. There were dozens of a similar clay. It was only after I returned to the capital and took up my residence in the palace that I felt sufficiently at home to make an objection. One memorable day, a Thursday, I betook myself to my dressing room and clapped my hands thrice. The linen wrapper boy entered. I hated the sight of him already. Bring us a new turban, I said shortly. Oh, brother-in-law of the Pleiades, said the boy in a trembling tone. Speak up, copper-colored child, I answered a little impatiently. What are you afraid of? Oh, your imperial highestness of the solar system, your rays need clipping, replied the boy, violently making salams. I was shaved yesterday, I said. But, began the boy, by the royal palanquin, I broke out. Send in the master of ceremonies. The boy vanished, and soon, with a sound of bugles, shams, and tubas, several out of tune, too, the master of ceremonies and his retinue came in. This took about half an hour. When they were all settled, I said, Oh, master of ceremonies and, and such things. I forgot the proper titles for a moment. 
we would hold converse with thee, apart, as it were. Again, the wind instruments were wound, the brass band and retinue took its devious course along the corridors, and the music and marching gradually died away. This took about twenty minutes. Now that we are alone, said I to the master of ceremonies, let's have a reasonable talk. Oh, nephew of, he began, never mind the astronomy, I broke in, but proceed to business. Yes, sire, he answered in a terrible fright, no doubt expecting the bowstring. Oh, don't be a fool, said I, I'm not going to hurt you. Stand up and have some style about you. So he did, somewhat reassured. Now, I said, I'm tired of all this fuss. Bring me a razor, and I'll shave myself. But your serene imperialness. See here, I said positively, there's not a hearer around. Just drop the titles and call me Mujahoy, or I'll have you beheaded. Well, Mujahoy, said the master of ceremonies easily, I'm afraid that it can't be done. Can't be done? Am I the emperor of this place, or what am I? Why, of course, Mujahoy, you're emperor and all that, he answered, with an ease of manner that surprised me. But then there are a great many things to be considered. Well, go on, said I, but I'd like to have this thing settled one way or the other. Speak freely. It's just this way, said the master of ceremonies. What would you do with the chief barber? Do with the chief barber? Why, nothing he could do with himself. But his salary is enormous. Cut it down. But he is a very influential man. He has dependent upon him, directly or indirectly, about 20,000 men. And these men, with their families, are a powerful faction. Then, too, the officials whose duties are similar, such as the first turban twister, the sandal strapper and his understrappers, and so on, would make common cause with him, you see? Yes, I see, I said thoughtfully. But in the same way, you could justify any foolishness, whatever. You would prevent all reforms. Oh, no, said the master of ceremonies. Oh, no, Mujahoy, not reforms, but revolutions. You can very easily institute reforms, but you must go slowly. But, I objected, you as the official in charge of ceremonies may well be prejudiced. Let us have the Grand Vizier summoned. That will take an hour at least, answered the Master of Ceremonies, who really seemed a very nice fellow when you knew him well. Well, you slip out and get him on the sly, I answered with an unofficial wink. All right, Mujahoy, he said, and out he went, whistling a popular air. While he was gone, it occurred to me that I was now a married man, and that Dorima was certainly entitled to know of the step which I was contemplating. So, by the aid of four or five assistants, I caused her to be summoned. She arrived a moment before the Grand Vizier made his appearance. I have called you, my dear Mrs. Mujahoy, I began, but she interrupted me. You mustn't call me that, she said, looking shocked. Why not? I asked. You must say, my imperial consort, she replied, taking a seat upon a divan. Oh, no, Mrs. Mujahoy is a pet name, I explained. She was pacified, and I proceeded. I have called you, Mrs. Mujahoy, to be present at the beginning of a great reform. I am about to make our life simpler, more enjoyable, and less burdensome in every way. Do you find it burdensome so soon? she asked reproachfully, turning away her lovely head and trying to coax out a sob. I saw I had made a mistake. Not at all, I answered hurriedly. But here comes the Grand Vizier. You listen attentively, and you will soon understand it all. The Grand Vizier entered. He seemed ill at ease, and I saw that he had a scimitar under his caftan. "'What does the celestial orb require of the humblest of his slaves?' said the Grand Vizier, prostrating himself. "'Oh, get up,' I said wearily. Then I asked the Master of Ceremonies to explain how the interview was to be conducted. So, while Darima and I exchanged a few tender nothings about the weather, the Master of Ceremonies explained to the Grand Vizier the nature of the conversation I had held with him that morning." 
The Grand Vizier seemed much impressed. I saw him tap his forehead inquisitively and feel for his scimitar. But the Master of Ceremonies soon reassured him. Then they turned to me. See here, Mujahoy, old man, began the Vizier, with a refreshing absence of conventionality. Dorima looked horrified. She was about to clap her hands, undoubtedly to order the Vizier's instant execution. But I restrained her. Vizier, I said, I do not care for ceremony, but civility is a sine qua non. That staggered him. He was weak on Latin. So drop the titles, but proceed carefully. Now, go on. He went on. Mujahoy, sire, I have been told of your contemplated reforms, and I am bound to tell you, as an honest adviser, that they will not work. You propose to dismiss the chief barber? I do, said I firmly. And I suppose the turban twister and so on? Yes. And to live in a simple and businesslike way? I do, I replied. Well, said he, spinning his turban upon his forefinger and looking at it with one eye closed, it will never do in the world, never. There was formerly an autocrat who tried to run this government on business principles, and he paused and sighed. Where is he? I asked. The Garahuli contains all that is mortal of him in a sack, said the Grand Vizier meaningly. Dorima clung to me and looked at my face imploringly. No matter, I said determinedly, I shall carry out these reforms. You will fail, said the Master of Ceremonies, and the Grand Vizier nodded solemnly. So be it, I said. Kismet. I shall therefore request you, Grand Vizier, to give public notice of the abolition of all useless offices, of which I will give you a list after dinner. But consider said Dorima in a low, frightened tone. Would you rather be the imperial consort Dorima, queen and empress of King Chubaboy I, I asked her proudly, and have to be at the beck and call of all these palace nuisances? Or would you rather be my own Mrs. Mujahoy, free to do as you please? For a moment she hesitated, and I trembled. But, brightening up, she asked, And travel incognito? Certainly, I answered. Nay, more, live incognito, wherever we choose. I'm for reform and Mrs. Mujahoy, replied my lovely bride. The visitor and master of ceremonies remained respectfully silent during our interview. Then the visitor asked me, Do you intend to abolish the royal white elephant? Precisely, I answered. That albino sinecure will be the first to go on the list. Is your life insured? asked the master of ceremonies politely but impressively. No, I said. Dorima sighed. But, said I, you will see that the whole people will hail me as their deliverer. We shall see, said the visitor, but I didn't like the inflections he chose. Declaring the interview at an end, I dismissed my ministers, said farewell to my brave queen, and gave the rest of the day to the preparation of the list. It was comprehensive and complete. There, said I, as I laid down my reed pen and corked the inkhorn, tomorrow we'll look upon an enfranchised people. But the Grand Vizier was a man of considerable wisdom. We were awakened the next morning by a confused sound of murmuring beneath the palace windows. I rose and threw open the flowered damask curtains. The whole courtyard was filled with a tumultuous mob, armed with an assortment of well-chosen weapons. They carried banners, hastily made but effective, upon which I read at a glance a few sentences like these. Down with the destroyer of our homes! Chuba boy to the Garahuli! We must have our white elephant! The chief barber or death! turban twister terrors and so on before i could read more i saw the chief barber on the back of the white elephant at the head of the mob he was a moor oh chuba boy said he wielding a bright razor so that he reflected the rays of the morning sun into my eyes will you abdicate or shall it be the sack and the gently flowing garahuli uh, where is the grand vizier i said after a moment's hesitation here, your majesty, answered that official, 
I saw he was in command of the right wing of the mob. He looked very well, too. And the master of ceremonies? Here, your highness, was the answer. He apparently led the left wing. And are you both against me? I asked. We are, they answered respectfully, but with considerable decision. And where are my adherents? I shouted. Here, said a sweet voice at my side. It was Dorima. Here, said another soft voice. It was the boy in starched linen. I almost liked him at that moment. Any others? Then there followed a silence so vast I could hear a fly buzzing derisively on the window pane above me. And you are not in harmony with the administration, I asked the mob. No, it was unanimous. Very well, I said. Then I resign, of course. Let me thank you, my late subjects, for your prompt and decisive interest in public affairs. I had meant to carry out some much-needed reforms, and I had some thoughts that they would fill a long-felt want. Thanking you for this early serenade, and with the highest respects for you all and for all your families, from myself and from Mrs. Mujahoy, I abdicate. Goodbye. There were some cheers, I think from Dorima and the linen-coated boy. Then the mob cheered for the chief barber, and I saw that my successor was already chosen. We left that afternoon, and purely as a matter of humanity, took the linen-coated boy with us, for I felt sure that he would not be popular, nor long-lived, if he should remain at home. He is a little afraid of me, but is useful. We made our way to Calcutta, and took the steamer for Liverpool. At this moment, Mr. Mujahoy was interrupted. His graceful wife came to his chair and touched him on the shoulder. Come, she said, it is chilly on deck. Certainly, answered Mujahoy, rising, but let me first present my friend to you. I was presented, and soon after said, Mr. Mujahoy disbelieves the fairy tales. I do not understand, said Mrs. Mujahoy. He thinks that the hero and princess are not always happy ever after, I said. Why, but they are, said Mrs. Mujahoy. Aren't they, Chubai boy? On reflection, I think they are, said he, and they bade me good night. End of chapter 5 Recording by Kieran Metz Chapter 6 of Imaginations, Truthless Tales this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Hill. Imaginations, Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 6. My biographer, if I should ever have any, would say in his first chapter, From boyhood he evinced an aptitude for the natural sciences. He was seldom without a magnifying glass in his pocket, and put it to most excellent use in familiarising himself with those exquisite details of Mother Nature's handiwork, which are sure to escape the mere casual observer. And in a later part of the same future rival to Boswell's Johnson, will probably be seen these words. In later life we see the traits of his boyhood deepened and broadened. The magnifying glass of his schoolboy days has become the large and costly binocular microscope, surrounded by all the apparatus which the cunning workers in metals know so well how to produce in limitless profusion for the ruin of the scientific amateur. If such statements should be made, they will be based upon facts. There are, however, other facts which no biographer will dare to tell, and which, therefore, I must write for myself. The following experience is one of them. Whether to my credit or to my discredit, I shall tell the plain story and leave it, with all its improbability, to your fair judgment. Already knowing my taste for the use of the microscope, you can understand the following letter without further introduction. A Amaganset, L.I., August the 5th. Dear Philip, I suppose the thermometers in the city are the only scientific instruments now studied with any interest. Being cool enough here to be reasonably unselfish, I am willing to divert your mind from the thermometer to the microscope. I enclose what seems to my prosaic mind a pebble. It was picked up on the beach and playfully thrown by me at our professor. He, of course, accidentally caught it. After an examination, he declared that it differed from anything he had ever seen, that it was neither animal, vegetable, nor mineral. In short, he knows that he doesn't know what it is, 
and therefore, says, speaking in true scientific vein, although of indeterminate nature, certain fusiform bosses in conjunction with a general spheroidal tendency seem strong a priori indications of aerolytic flight through our own atmosphere or other gaseous medium of similar density. I make no comments, so bring out your microscope and let us know what it is. If you could come and join us, you would find a little bit of sand and salt water, but then there is plenty of each. Sincerely yours, Carol Mathers. He enclosed a small rounded object wrapped in tissue paper. It was light blue in colour and a trifle smaller than a hazelnut. The surface seemed, as the professor hinted, to have been somewhat melted. It certainly had claims to be considered a curiosity. That evening after dinner, I took out my microscope and after carefully cleaning the pebble, I examined the surface under a strong condenser, but thereby simply magnified the irregularities. I shall have to cut it in two, I said to myself. It was very hard, and I succeeded only after some effort. I cut it through a little away from the centre, and so divided it almost into halves. Examining the flat surfaces, I found a small dark spot in the centre of one of them. I thought so, I exclaimed triumphantly. I will now cut off a section and shall undoubtedly find a petrified insect, perhaps of an extinct species. I sawed away the rounded side and when I could see that the dark spot was nearer the surface, polished the section down with oil and emery paper until I had obtained a thin disc with a dark spot in the middle. It was now ready for the microscope. The focus was carefully found by slowly turning the fine adjustment screw. The spot gradually defined itself and seemed about to assume the appearance of an insect, when, just at the point where I had expected it to be plainly visible, it suddenly disappeared, leaving a hole in the disc through which the light streamed. I was perplexed and gazed stupidly. The light seemed suddenly to flicker and then was shut off altogether. I inspected the instrument carefully, but all seemed to be in perfect order. I picked up the disc. There certainly was a hole through it. Perhaps there is something in the tube, I said, and unscrewed the eyepiece. Just as the eyepiece came loose, something jumped from the tube, knocking the glass from my fingers. I thought it was a moth or bug, but how did it come there? Well, that's very strange, said I aloud. Most extraordinary, a voice replied. A very small voice, but the words were clearly audible. I looked around the room. Don't trouble yourself to search. I'm not afraid. I'm right here on the table. I faced the table again and discovered that what I had supposed to be a bug was apparently a man. And a very commonplace, quiet and gentlemanly man. Not at all remarkable, except for the fact that he was only about three inches tall. When I saw him, he was straightening out his odd little hat, which had in some way become slightly crushed. My eyes at times deceive me somewhat, as my microscope work has made them sensitive, so I stooped to take a closer view of my visitor. He appeared to be startled and cried, Keep off! Do you mean to eat me? Beware! Giant though you be, I can defend myself! Eat you? I answered, laughing. I am not a cannibal, even on a very small scale, and I have just dined. It was but curiosity. What in the world are you? Curiosity indeed, he replied. What in the world are you? And he mimicked my tone to perfection. I saw that he stood upon his dignity and thought it best to humour him. You must pardon me, I began. If my surprise on seeing a gentleman of your small presence caused me for the moment to forget the respect due to a stranger. But you yourself will not deny that the sight of such a mere atomy, a lucis naturae, if I may be allowed the expression would tend to excite curiosity, rather than to remind one of the demands of courtesy. This seemed to mollify him, for he replied with a smile, It is a strange sensation to hear one's self styled a lucis naturae, but I cannot in justice complain, as I was about to apply the same term to yourself, and you certainly are colossally enormous, prodigious. I trust, however, that I have controlled my curiosity, and have accorded you such treatment as is due a gentleman, even on the very largest scale. He paused and gazed upon me with undisguised amazement. How did you get here? I asked after a moment's silence. I should be delighted to know, he answered with evident sincerity. It may be I can tell you when you are good enough to begin by letting me know where I am. Nothing easier, I said. This is my room. A valuable piece of information, he said with some sarcasm. And the apartment appears to be comfortable and rather well arranged, with exceptions. I see you cling to antiquated styles. Indeed. I was not aware of it. 
Why, he said, seeing I did not understand. You light the room with coal gas as the ancients did. You still use the mechanical clock instead of the vocable chronophotometer. Your furniture is, I see, of wood instead of coherent alcyite. While, but I do not object to the effect, it is delightfully archaic in tone. I really don't follow you, I replied, somewhat piqued. But you might remember that, archaic or not, this room is my own, and your criticism upon it is as gratuitous as your presence in it. I admit that this was not precisely courteous, but his manner was very supercilious and provoked me. Why did you bring me here? I'm sure I didn't request it, he angrily retorted. My atomic friend, I said impressively, who or what you are, I neither know nor care. But kindly bear in mind this fact. I did not bring you here. I don't ask you to stay here. Whenever you wish to go, I can bear your departure without a pang. Nevertheless, so long as you remain, I shall expect you to behave in a gentlemanly manner. Here I thumped upon the table, and he fell over. He recovered nimbly, and drawing himself up to his full three inches, replied with the greatest dignity. My colossal acquaintance, there is one fact you must kindly bear in your mind. Who or what you are is of little or no importance to me. How I came here, I know no more than yourself. Suffice it to say, I didn't come of my own accord. And from my experience so far, here he paused and glanced scornfully about him, I have no desire to prolong my stay. But while I do stay, I shall insist upon all proper courtesy and all due respect. His dignity was so absurdly out of keeping with his size that I could not refrain from a burst of laughter, and I became better natured at once. Well, I replied when I had recovered my composure, now that we have come to an understanding, tell me quietly, in a friendly way, as one gentleman to another, something about yourself. If you will allow me the question, where do you live? Were you born a dwarf, or... Born a dwarf? he broke in angrily. Born a dwarf? You great, coarse, overgrown giant! What do you mean, sir? What do I mean? It was too absurd. You ridiculous diamond edition of humanity, what do you suppose I mean? I have always heard that dwarfs were sensitive, but really, when one is only about half the size of a respectable jackknife, and I, he broke in again, have always heard that giants were invariably thick-witted and rude, but I did suppose that any human being, even if he were as tall as the tallest trees and had a voice like a clap of thunder, which is far from agreeable to your hearers, by the way, might be sensible enough to... So, you think, said I, interrupting him, that I am as large as the tallest trees? Certainly, he said with perfect seriousness. I thought it worth while to convince him of his error, and therefore invited him to step to the window, against which the table stood. He did so and upon looking out, threw up his arms in sheer amazement. It is a land of giants, he said slowly and in an awestruck tone. Ah, I remarked quietly, pleased with my little object lesson. You now see how much smaller you are than ordinary men. Ordinary men, he repeated very slowly and with an absent expression. What then can he think me? He stood in silence, with his hands clasped behind him, and appeared to be deep in thought. When he spoke again, it was with an entire change of manner. Am I to understand you, sir, that all the men, women and children known to you are proportionately as large as yourself, and that everything is on the same gigantic scale? It is exactly so, I replied seriously. And may I ask you to believe that I have never seen anything or anybody except upon the smaller scale which you can see exemplified in me? Did you never see any one of my size before, nor hear of us? Never, except in fairy stories, I said frankly, for now he seemed to be really a very sensible little man. This is not a question of fairy tales, nor of joking, he said with great solemnity. We are in the very midst of some great mystery. I must belong to a different race of beings, for I never heard, read, or dreamed of such enormous people. Where I live, all are like myself. This seemed incredible. But finally I asked, And where do you live? I live, he answered, in the 21st range of Precinct 40, Telma Municipal, Waver, Forolaria, and by profession I am an official arranger. You are very exact, I said with mock admiration. And where do you live? he inquired. This is my home, I said. The Alfresco, Madison Street, New York City. Thank you, said he with sarcastic gratitude. 
I am as wise as before. You know as much of my residence as I of yours, I answered sharply. You cannot be ignorant of Telmer, he asked, raising his eyebrows in surprise at my ignorance. You surely know New York City, I rejoined in the same manner, the largest city in the United States. United States, he repeated. And what are those? Who united them? Perhaps a history would give you the clearest information, I suggested. I think it might if I had the time, he replied soberly, as he drew from his pocket what I supposed to be a watch. But it was too small to be clearly distinguishable. He pressed it in his hand, and I heard a sound or voice clearly enunciating, Thirty-four degrees after the eighteenth. Before I could say a word, he resumed, It is too late tonight. Perhaps you will save my time by telling me the substance of it. Flattered, I am sure. I felt as if I was again in school. But after a moment's reflection, I cleared my throat and began. The Kingdom of England. The what? he asked with a puzzled look. The Kingdom of England, where the English live. What are the English? Oh, come, said I, laughing. You are talking English. We are both talking English. Well, well, he said. I was thinking a while ago how it could be that you were able to speak good for Ilarian. And he burst out laughing. And suddenly ceasing, he went on. But if we begin on the mysteries, we shall never get to the invited states. Pray, go on. These English, you see, colonised a portion of America. A portion of America? That is the name of a place? Oh, what is the use? I broke off angrily. If I define every word I use, I shall never reach a conclusion. If you would like to pursue the subject further, my library is at your service. Thank you, he replied with dignity. Perhaps I could glean some information from that source. I made no reply. Presently seeing that he wandered about the table in rather an aimless way, I asked, Can I be of service? If you could suggest some method of reaching the floor. I offered him the ruler. He seated himself cautiously upon it, and I lowered him gently to the floor. Quite a walk to the bookcase, was his next observation. I hadn't thought of it, but proffered my services once more. Which shelf would you prefer? I asked as respectfully as possible, for certainly it was not an ordinary question. A matter of indifference to me, sir, he replied with the might of a bow. Equally one to me, I replied with a bow in return. I was resolved that he should do some thinking for himself. Let us say the lowest, then, and he glanced at the upper shelves, perhaps calculating the possible result of a misstep. I left him on the lowest shelf, returning to the table to put away the microscope. A slight cough drew my attention to the bookcase. I admire the bindings, said the little fellow, as he paced to and fro along the shelf. I am gratified by your approval, was my indifferent reply. Particularly this one, he went on. Let me see. He leaned far backward and with much difficulty read the title. The Works of Shakespeare. I should like to read them. Very well, I answered politely. Much obliged, said he fiercely. Please lend me an electric derrick. Pardon my stupidity. Let me take it down for you. I stepped to the bookcase, laid the book upon the floor, and returned to my work. A silence then ensued, which lasted so long that I looked up to see how he was progressing. He was sitting on the shelf with his tiny legs hanging despairingly over a gulf of some six inches between himself and the floor. He was afraid to jump and ashamed to ask help. Catching my eye, he laughed and said, uh, I am rather out of training just now and not fond of jumping. Say no more. I lifted him to the floor and turned away, but only to be recalled by a faint ejaculation. His mishaps were truly ingenious. He was caught beneath the cover of the book. My foot slipped, he explained with some confusion. But if it hadn't, I believe I could have opened the book all by myself. I will not leave you now until everything is in proper order, I replied, for it occurred to me that to have any accident happen to him might be a very perplexing thing. Opening the book, I picked him up gingerly between my fingers, first asking pardon for the liberty and deposited him softly upon the first page of the Tempest. Are you all right now? I inquired to make sure. I believe so, said he, as he began to read, running to and fro upon the page. However, I sat down nearby and watched him, fearing some new difficulty. He read with much interest, and seemed to enjoy it thoroughly, except when he came to the turning of a page. That was a nuisance indeed, as he had to turn up one edge, crawl over it, and then lift the page over. Haven't you a smaller edition of this fellow's writings? he asked, somewhat exhausted by his efforts. This is like reading signboards. 
No, I replied shortly, but if it tires you, you can read something else. But, said he with some enthusiasm, this is really quite good. It's equal to some of Wackoff's earlier and cruder work. It shows a talent that would really repay cultivation. Yes, it is very fair, I replied quietly. Shakespeare certainly has produced some creditable plays. At least we think so. I should like to have known him, went on my undisturbed visitor. I think we would have been congenial. Don't you think so? I paid no attention to this. What could I say? We consider him one of the best writers in the language, I said finally. I would like to hear about them, he said. I pretended not to understand this hint, but he waited very patiently and returned my gaze with quiet expectation. Now look here, said I calmly weighing my words. I have at present other occupations which I regret to say, this was sarcastic, prevent me from undertaking to give you a really thorough course in English literature. I might be more inclined to do so if I had something to begin on. Have you ever heard of Homer? Yes, he answered eagerly. My father has a cousin of that name, Homer Woggs. I could not believe it is the same man, said I soberly. He seemed much disappointed. At all events, I went on. You cannot fail to see the folly of expecting me to explain to you all the events which have taken place since the world began. I finished school some years ago, and have no desire to review the whole curriculum. I turned resolutely away, and left him to his own devices. I worked quietly for a few moments, only to be interrupted by a, Whew! What's the matter now? I asked irritably. I'm tired of lugging over these pages. Well, don't do it. Sit down. Repose. But I'm interested in the play. I'm not going to turn the pages for you. Couldn't you read it aloud to me? He asked with cool assurance. I could, but I won't. I replied rudely enough, but I was provoked at his impudence. You are very obliging, he said sneeringly. I made no reply. After a pause, he made a suggestion. Although determined not to aid me to an occupation, perhaps you will not object to my sitting by and seeing what you are doing. I could not refuse so reasonable a request. I raised him to the table and gave him a paperweight to sit upon. He quietly watched me until I began to unscrew the glasses from my microscope. When he said carelessly, I myself am a microscopic amateur. It is an interesting subject, I replied. Yes, my success with the Mincroft glass was remarkable. The Mincroft glass? I do not know it. What is its nature? I asked with some natural curiosity. Why, the composite lens invented by Mincroft, which enables one to see the whole of a large object at once, all parts being equally magnified. But I bore you, he pretended to yawn. On the contrary, I said eagerly, it has been my keenest desire to invent such an instrument. Pray describe it. But it is so simple. Any schoolboy can explain it to you, he said with feigned indifference. But how can such a marvel be accomplished? I insisted, carried away by curiosity. Do you really mean to say you've never heard of it? He inquired in a drawling tone, designed, I thought, to annoy me. Never, and I would give anything to understand it. He seemed amused by my eagerness, and smiling indulgently, continued in the same tone. Why, that is a trifle, a mere toy compared with the wonderful Andretor tube. Now that is what I should call an invention. What? Another discovery, of which I've never heard? The Andretor tube, did you say? When were these inventions made? I believe it was during the third century before the second great migration. But for exactness, I shall have to refer you to the school books. I never was good at dates. However, it doesn't matter. These were but the first fruits of the revival of science, when chemismication first superseded steam and electricity. This was too much. Steam and electricity superseded. They are yet in their infancy with us. Oh, he replied laughing. You are far behind the times. We disused both as soon as we learned to control dynamic atomicity. You must be ages in advance of us. I beg you to explain some of these marvels to me. I have other occupations, said he roguishly, and to my great regret they will prevent my tutoring you in the ABCs of science. You must think me very obliging. And he arose, put his hands in his trouser pockets and sauntered away across the table, whistling softly to himself. I lost my temper. You cantankerous little midget, you will answer my questions or I'll send you back where you came from. He turned sharply upon me and exclaimed, 
You great hulking booby, do you expect me to bore myself by giving lessons in primary science to a cross-grained, disobliging fellow who will not take the trouble to tell me who excited the states, who Shakespeare is, or to read me even one of his plays? No, sir! You keep your secrets and I'll keep mine. As to going back where I came from, I'll be glad to rid you of my presence instantly, if only I knew how. I'll try it anyhow, I cried, so angry that I hardly knew what I said. You came out of my microscope and into it you shall go again. I caught him up, dropped him into the tube, screwed on the top and was pleased to see the little black spot reappear in the disc. Opening the window I threw out the disc and was amazed to see that instead of falling it floated away through the motionless air like a piece of thistledown before a summer breeze. It soon left the area of light coming from my window and was lost to view. Aha! I said with deep satisfaction. Now you can go back where you came from. I sat down beside my table and as my anger cooled, began to think it all over. At first I felt great relief to be rid of the little pest, who fretted me by his pertinacity and piqued my self-esteem by his air of superiority. But gradually my temper cooled, and as I recovered my sane judgement, I began to reflect that ordinary civility to the little mannequin might have induced him to tell me enough to have secured me fame and fortune, or even to have made me a benefactor to my whole race. And I felt bitter shame that my ill-humour and foolish pride had caused me pettishly to throw away an opportunity greater than had ever been granted to any human being. Still, he was so provoking and so altogether irritating that I'm inclined to think you, yourself, would have done very much the same. End of chapter 6 Recording by Michael Hill Chapter 7 of Imagine Notions Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jared Bond. Imagine Notions Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks, the astrologer's niece. I am not sorry that I became an astrologer. The work is monotonous, but not wearing, and the hours are short. As an apprentice, I was a hard student and frequently consulted the stars, but now, without conceit, I think I speak within bounds in saying that I know all there is to know about planets, stars, asteroids, comets, nebula, and horoscopes, and twice as much as any other astrologer of my weight. So I seldom refresh my memory by going, through my telescope, directly to nature. I admit it is inconvenient to be obliged to wear a thick woolen robe on warm days, I also admit that a shorter beard would be less in my way, and that I might shave if my customers did not object. I do not deny that my raven, a second-hand bird which once belonged to Zadkiel, is a nuisance, because it is continually stealing my spectacles. As I have only one pair, it is very hard to find them when I have no spectacles to find them with. The bird is not sympathetic, and enjoys my annoyance over the search croaking derisively as I go stumbling around among dusty old books and brittle glass crucibles. This irritates me, and I put him on bread and water, which irritates him. My calculations are a bore, and I am very apt to pinch my fingers or entangle my beard in a celestial globe. My customers are greedy, and insist upon being kings, duchesses, pirates, and so on, ignoring the indications which plainly show them to be intended for hurdy-gurdy players, scissors-grinders, or poets. The planets are all right. I have no particular fault to find with the fixed stars, but those vagabonds, the comets, will often act in the most unfriendly way, spoiling my very best combinations. It makes customers ill-natured, and they hold me responsible, just as though I arranged the comets to suit myself. Perhaps it is not strange that I am a trifle touchy. I feel sure astrologers will agree that I am no more nervous than is excusable under the trials of the profession. Still, I repeat, I am satisfied with my vocation. I did hesitate between stargazing and saw-filing, but I thought my choice was not unwise, for, as an astrologer, I became more or less familiar with magic, a pleasant recreation if pursued with proper discretion, but not fit for children. While I lived alone, I had no trouble with it, for, although I made mistakes, I was indulgent enough to overlook them. But when my only sister unfortunately died and left a lovely little daughter alone in the world, whom nobody else could be persuaded to adopt, I foolishly consented to bring up that child. It was an amiable, even admirable weakness, 
But my stars, what curious things a child can do. I had had no kindergarten experience. I was never in an orphan asylum, so far as I know, and I was an only son. I knew nothing of children except such superficial acquaintance as enabled me to foretell their futures and to advise parents about bringing them up. And yet, in my old age, I was thus, by an accident, forced to take full charge of a small girl of very decided traits, born with Jupiter in the ascendant and Mercury not far off. What bothered me most was her goodness. A bad child can be coaxed and punished, but an affectionate, mischievous, obedient, and innocent girl, what can be done with her? I never thought of locking up my books of magic, and she must have read them, I suppose, for, before I knew it, that youngster was working spells and charms, fixing up enchantments, and making transformations which required more time to disentangle than I could readily spare for my business hours. The first disagreeable experience resulted from her having read about some old flying horse in Greece, Turkey, or elsewhere, and she took to wandering about the fields, keeping a bright lookout for him. I suspect she became discouraged, and resolved to make one for herself, since she caught a little colt, fixed a pair of wings by some spell or other upon the colt's shoulders, and attempted to harness him with flowers, whereupon he flew away. It couldn't have displeased the colt, for he was not at all sedate in character. But the farmer who owned him did not think of that. He came to see me about it, thoughtlessly bringing his pitchfork with him. So I found it best to promise to remove the wings. Luckily, she had left the book open at the very charm that had been used, and I was able to undo it, although there was some delay caused by the necessity of using a lock of hair from the head of the sultan, who was kind enough to grow one for me as soon as he could. Now that child didn't mean any harm. She couldn't see why a horse shouldn't fly, a little goose, nor could I explain it to her very clearly. She promised, however, not to do so again, and of course we said no more about it. The week after, coming home one day, I found my room filled to the brim, so to speak, with an enormous green dragon who blew smoke from his nostrils so profusely that it gave me some trouble to convince the villagers that there was no fire and that they were nuisances with their buckets and ladders. Of course, my magic books were inaccessible, and we took lodgings with a neighbor until the dragon was starved out. The dragon's skin made an excellent rug, but the experience was not enjoyable. I could not reprove my niece for this, because she explained very frankly that she had made the dragon larger than she had intended. It was only a misfit. You may think me absent-minded, but it never occurred to me to forbid these practices, although, had I done so, she would have obeyed me. I forgot about it, except when some new prank brought the matter to my mind, and then I became absorbed in remedying the difficulty caused by her experiment. Once I tried to divert her mind by inducing her to adopt a doll, which the raven had cleverly secured from somebody. But her care of it was so evidently due to a desire to please me that whenever she held it, I was uneasy. When the raven took the doll away again, let us hope to return it. We were both relieved. For a time after the dragon incident, my niece was shy of using the magic books, and I enjoyed this quiet interval very much. I was occupied in manufacturing a horoscope for the innkeeper, who was quite well-to-do. He had promised me a round sum for a favorable sketch of his future, and I was anxious to give satisfaction and to collect my bill. But the stars indicated that only the strictest economy would tide him over a coming financial crisis in his affairs, which made me fear there might be some uncertainty about my fee. Absorbed in this perplexity, I may have neglected my niece. At all events, she got into the habit of spending her time with the innkeeper's family. A commercial magician from Lapland, of great dignity and little importance, chanced to arrive at the inn while my niece was there. Overhearing his negotiation with the landlord, she learned, through the foolish talkativeness of the magician, that the long and imposing train of mules and other companions accompanying him were not in reality what they appeared to be but were simply his performing company of manufactured hallucinations disguised in their traveling shapes. Imagine the effect of the curious and ingenuous mind of my playful niece. The heedless magician, with equal carelessness, left his wand upon the table in the front hall, where anybody could reach it. You can foresee the result. It must have been merely by chance that she succeeded in counteracting the spell by which these creatures were confined to their everyday forms. 
However that may be, you may imagine what happened while the magician was at dinner that afternoon. The inquiring spirit of childhood led my niece to make trial of the wand, when, of course, the mules and attendants returned to their original shapes and flew off, a buzzing swarm of bees. I was walking in the village, and as soon as I saw the swarm I understood what had happened, and must admit I was amused. When I arrived at the inn, the magician was discontented. He failed to appreciate the child's ingenuity and enterprise, and really seemed inclined to speak hastily to the poor girl, who stood looking on with an innocent pleasure in her success, which I found charming. But since I was there, he only stared helplessly about, and seemed anxious to say more than he could wait to pronounce, till I told him that he must have patience and fortitude. As he came to his senses, he showed signs of knowing what to do. He sent for the pepper casters and vinegar cruets, neatly changed them into divining boxes, which straight away poured forth the proper necromantic fumes, and then remembered that he needed his wand. A long search resulted in finding it up in the kitchen chimney, after which a careful and laborious cleansing brought it into a suitable condition to be handled. All this my niece greatly enjoyed. By that time, the magician was very much irritated, and began a powerful invocation to a muscular spirit who would, perhaps, have brought the whole party back in a jiffy. But I interfered, and explained to him, at some length, that the whole episode was nothing more than a piece of girlish curiosity, not calling for any harsh methods or severe measures. I offered my assistance, which he declined, without thanks. I shrugged my shoulders, and was strolling indifferently away when he began to make an answer. I saw that he had not an easy command of language. What nonsense! Such a fix I'm in! Girlish curiosity! Where do you think that pack of irresponsible insects has gone? I hope they will... Please, get away! I withdrew. It was not my affair, but they told me that my niece, inadvertently I am sure, had injured the wand so that it failed to work, and that the magician made futile attempts to use it until the boys laughed at him when he desisted. Having lost all his attendants, materials, and supplies, and his wand being useless, the magician was almost distracted. He was unable to leave the village, and the landlord wouldn't have him at the inn, so I took him to board on credit at a reasonable charge. When the magician took up his abode with me, my niece was somewhat fond of questioning him, but apparently found that it was not worth her time, for she seemed to lose interest very soon. In fact, she forgot all about him and about me as well, and became entirely absorbed in an attempt to teach the raven to play jackstones, for which recreation he showed very little talent. As there was, necessarily, considerable noise in her course of instruction, I requested her to hold the sessions out of doors, and she kindly adopted the suggestion. In order to occupy the magician's mind, I gave him some copying, but he wasn't interested in his work. He was restless, and wandered out into the country searching high and low for the curious crowd of nondescripts which my careless niece had liberated in a praiseworthy attempt to gain knowledge. I called his attention to this view of the subject, and asked whether he did not see it in the same light, but I must say he was quite unreasonable and prejudiced. He left the room abruptly, forgetting his hat, leaving the door wide open and his quill pen behind his ear. He was gone for some time. In the afternoon he came back, radiant, crying aloud, I found them! I have found them! And dancing with joy. His dancing was very good, but I was busy and paid no attention to him. If he had been a man of any tact, he would have felt my indifference. But some people cannot take a hint, and he went on as eagerly as though I had shown some interest in the performance. As I was walking in the meadows, he shouted, I nearly tripped over the body of a peasant lying flat upon the ground, studying an anthill with a magnifying glass. I asked him what he was doing, and he told me that he was the sluggard, and that he had been advised to go to the ants and consider their ways and be wise. I inquired how he was getting on, and he said he was getting on very well, and that he had learned to gather all he could, to store it up where it would be safe, and to keep it out of the wet. This bored me extremely, and I coughed significantly, but the magician continued rambling. I asked if I might look through the lens. He said I might, and I did. Now, what do you suppose I saw through that lens? I had not recovered my good humor. I confess that I am sensitive, and that my feelings are easily hurt. This foolish attempt to ask me rhetorical conundrums displeased me, and I made no reply. But that man was not discouraged. He repeated the question. Turning toward him, I spoke in a way that he could not misunderstand. 
Upon applying your eye to the glass, I remarked, you were astonished to perceive that the small creatures which you had supposed to be common black ants were in reality a colony of bees, who seemed, for some strange reason of their own, to have chosen an abandoned anthill for a hive. This anomaly seems not to have attracted your notice, but if I had been with you, I could have informed you that you might have concluded from so very significant a fact that this was the swarm which you were so anxious to find. Does not reflection incline you to agree with me? He was disappointed. He had foolishly hoped to surprise me. Such puerility. You are right, he replied in a muffled sort of voice. Very well, said I. Now, in my turn, I will propose a question. Your wand being out of order, how are you to get those wanderers back? I enjoyed his discomfiture. His face was a study, and I studied it until I learned that he had no suggestion to make. His face wore no expression whatever. Then, in a kindly spirit, I said to him, Bring me your little wand. Sit down like a magician and don't dance about like a dervish, and I'll fix it for you. He was visibly moved by my kindness, and agreed to all I proposed. He brought the wand, and, after a keen examination, I found a screw loose. With my penknife, I tightened it. A sickly smile flitted over his face. You are doing me a good turn, he murmured. I gave him a searching glance, but the smile was so faint and faded so quickly that I decided he did not mean to be humorous. It was lucky for him, for astrologers are sworn foes to humorists, and I should have broken his wand into several fragments if I had detected the slightest levity. He said no more. Having mended the wand, I handed it to him, saying, Go, recover your chattels. He retired with briskness, and it gives me pleasure to record the fact that I have never seen him since. My niece told me, casually, that she was glad that the magician was gone, I offered to tell her about his departure, but she assured me she took no interest in the subject. She did not say any more about it, and since I do not believe in encouraging childish prattle, I made no more allusions to our border. I have lately asked her whether she would prefer to qualify herself to study astrology with magic as an extra, or would be better satisfied to learn saw filing under some well-known virtuoso. She replied with much discretion that she thought a quiet life was the happiest after all. So, although she has not yet expressed herself more definitely, I feel sure she is giving the subject mature consideration. I admire her greatly, and predict that she will do well if carefully neglected. As time passes, I notice that I grow older, and although I cannot repent having chosen a career as an astrologer, if my niece chooses the saw-filing business, I may perhaps take up some similar musical pursuit, so that we may not be separated. Meanwhile, my niece is attending a very excellent school and makes good progress in her studies. In fact, her progress was so rapid at first that she came near graduating in about two weeks, but as I then persuaded her to give up the use of magic books, she is now making slower and more satisfactory progress, being quite backward. The dust lies thick on the magic books. Magic is amusing, but it sometimes makes trouble. End of The Astrologer's Niece Recording by Jared Bond Chapter 8 of Imagine Oceans, Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jared Bond. Imagine Oceans, Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. The Astrologer's Niece Marries. Of course, when she had finished her education, I thought my niece would be glad to stay quietly at home with me for a year or two at least but she was of a restless disposition, and soon tired of the monotony of our quiet village life. I did my best to entertain her, and was even ingenuous, I thought, in providing her with amusements. For instance, when a traveling circus came to a neighboring city, by the use of the well-known spell, Magic Book 8, Chapter 2, Section 32, I caused the advance agent to believe our village a populous city full of those persons of limited means who usually patronize the theater and the fine arts generally. As a result of my well-meant deception, he gave performances for a week to an audience consisting only of me, my niece, the innkeeper's family, and the innkeeper. The performers, especially the ringmaster, were furious and thought the advance agent was crazy. We didn't mind that, as he insisted upon completing the performances, 
but my niece had found no pleasure in the show except as a means of amusing herself at the expense of those who took part in the ring. When one of the acrobats would leap into the air and begin to turn a somersault, she would secretly use some form of enchantment, for she had never forgotten the knowledge of the science picked up in her youth, and caused the poor fellow to remain hanging in the air upside down. This seriously interfered with the show, but the circus people did not mind it very much until she carried her skylarking beyond all reason. But when she made the trick mule suddenly become as gentle as a lamb, and rode him around the ring, she sitting placidly upon him as Queen Elizabeth upon a palfrey, and the trick mule carrying her with a proudly angelic smile, and when she claimed the large reward the ringmaster had offered, it was really too much. With tears in his eyes, the ringmaster said it would ruin the circus to pay her, and so she let the reward go unpaid, on condition that they left at once. I concluded that she had lost interest in the hippodrome. I tell this only as an instance of my unremitting efforts to supply her with pastimes of a really elevating character, and to show that it was not lack of diversion, but a restless disposition, which caused her to say she would go seek her fortune. I had no wish to leave home. My cook was an artist, and my house had a southern exposure in an astrological cupola of the most modern construction. So I told her flatly that I would not go under any consideration whatever. We started the next morning. I suggested a sea route, as I was very susceptible to sea sickness and desired above all things to go by land. She acquiesced at once, and we set sail early in a lug-rigged barker, or a bark-rigged lugger, one or the other, and as I went below I heard the captain order the crew to luff. I cannot say what luffing is, because when I came on deck again we had been out for three days. It seemed longer, and I do not care at all for marine life. It interferes, sadly, with accuracy and astrological observations, and with regularity of meals, both of which are hobbies of mine. On the morning of the fifth day, one of the sailors said out loud, Land ho! And I concluded that he was an agriculturist, but hadn't time to verify this conclusion because my niece insisted upon being rowed ashore at once. I was not ready to go ashore, but she preferred not to go alone, and so we went together. As we rowed into a beautiful bay, surrounded by the customary palm trees, a sentinel on shore said, Boat ahoy! I answered pleasantly, Boat ahoy! What boat is that? he inquired. It's just an ordinary boat, I answered. What boat is it? he asked again. I'm sure I don't know, said I. What do you want to know for? If you don't answer the hail, I'll fire on you, he said sternly. I'm answering as fast as I can, I replied good-naturedly. What do you expect me to say? At this, he raised his crossbow and leveled it. I think that's the technical term employed by military men. At the boat. In fact, at me. Come ashore, he cried in a peremptory tone. We are coming, I answered. He seemed very obtuse and unreasonable, but I make it a point never to quarrel with soldiers on duty. We landed at a little neat quay and were received by the comrades of the conversationalist with a crossbow. They surrounded us in a very attentive way and said, Forward, march! We started. I was a trifle uneasy about our destination and ventured to inquire of my niece where she thought we were going. She admitted that she didn't know and added languidly that she didn't feel like talking. So on we went in silence for about half an hour. Then I asked the captain of the guard. I knew he was the captain because he wouldn't keep step, and he told me we were going to the palace. I asked whether it was far. He said it was about as far as any palace he ever saw, and suggested that I should keep my breath for walking. I despise useless taciturnity, but followed his advice under protest. We walked on for another half hour, and then, just as I had concluded to refuse further pedestrianism, we saw in the distance several minarets, from the top of which pennants were rippling in the breeze. That's the palace, said the captain. In a few minutes, we came to a lofty wall and a gate guarded by two Ethiopians in fancy dress, each carrying a curved sword. Your sword is bent, my friend, I said to one of them. He scowled and looked uneasily at it. Why don't you have a straight one? It would reach further, I went on, and it is really curious why so many of the eastern nations prefer... I was interrupted. He tried to cut off my head, and if he had used a straight sword would have succeeded. I dodged him, remarking, without loss of dignity, You see now, that illustrates what... My niece here pulled me by my robe, and I dropped the subject. They rolled up the gate, a kind of portcullis, and we entered. I should like to describe the courtyard in detail, 
But as I had left my spectacles at home, having forgotten them in our hasty embarkation, I could not see anything but a confused blur of colors. Going up some very tiresome stairways, we were led to a vast audience room and brought before a kind of king or something, one of those men who sit on fancy chairs and order people around. Whom have you brought before us? asked this very consequential individual. Lord of, began the captain, in a second tenor voice. Tut, tut, said the king. Who are they? Royal and imperial, said the captain. And so forth, rejoined the monarch. Thanks. Who are they? I don't know, said the captain. Where from, said the king. I don't know, said the captain. What do they want, asked the king. I don't know, answered the officer. Enough, said the king hastily. We are satisfied that your specialty is honest ignorance. We appoint you court historian. The captain bowed low. Return to your post for the present, and forget as much as you can until you are called upon to assume your new duties. The captain withdrew. Now, said the king to me, who are you? An astrologer, your highness, I answered with some natural pride. A stargazer, eh? he said pleasantly. Well, what did you come here for? I don't know, I answered after a moment's reflection. The king seemed vexed. Does anybody know anything about anything in particular? He asked with fine sarcasm. It made me shake in my sandals, especially as the headsman, who was standing beside the king, here tightened his belt and took a large and shiny axe from a page at his left. But, as usual, my niece came to the rescue and said, in her quiet and unpretending way, that she knew considerable about several things. The headsman looked at her very keenly, handed the axe back to the page, and said in a low tone that he was going out to luncheon. He went. Well, well, said the king. Suppose you tell us about this. To my surprise, my niece said that she had come to his kingdom to marry the prince. Naturally, the king was a little put out. It seemed sudden to him, no doubt. I'm sure it did to me. He was lost in thought for a few moments, and then said absently, Oh, yes. Well, where's the, the headsman? Gone to luncheon, your majestic majesty, answered the page. Very inconvenient, said the king, looking annoyed. He's never here when he's needed. No matter. This amuses us. We find this novel, and, yes, amusing in a way. We must get sport from this. Young woman, he said to my niece, if you can sit down for a few moments, the executioner will be back, and he will attend to you first. The astrologer can afford to give you precedence. He won't have long to wait. The audience is over. I'll be at the execution this afternoon. Long live the king! cried the crowd. Then a brass band struck up, pop goes the weasel, and the audience room was emptied. Soon we were alone with the guards. They had no captain, and seemed at a loss to know what to do next. My niece sat in a very comfortable chair, playing a curious game which she invented herself. It was a round box with little partitions in it, and four or five marbles rolling around between them. She would try to make the marbles roll into a little box in the center. She seemed much amused by it. It appeared stupid to me. I wondered how long we would have to wait there. The noise of the marbles made me nervous. At this moment, the captain, or rather the court historian, came in. Shoulder arms, he said sharply. The men obeyed. Conduct the prisoners to the dungeon, he went on. This is all right, I said. I suppose you know your own business, but it seems to me that you are acting queerly for a court historian. It is all right, he said. I have forgotten all about that. So has the king. Forward, march! We were escorted to the dungeon. Don't ever go to a dungeon if you can help it. We stayed there the rest of the day, I was looking through the bars, and my niece said nothing until late in the afternoon. Then she told me she had got them all in. You have got us all in, I said, with bitter meaning. She laughed. After a while, the guards came and told us to prepare for instant execution. I pointed out the illogical absurdity of preparing for instant execution, but they couldn't see it, and, as it only annoyed them and set them to talking about some old crank, I saw they cared more for mechanics than for logic, and said nothing further. What a number of dull people there are in foreign climes. We followed them along some very damp corridors, which needed whitewashing, and soon came to a large plaza. I could not see very well, but I heard many voices saying, Here they come! Bring them out! See the old fogey? By which they must have meant the captain, I suppose. It suddenly occurred to me that possibly they meant to execute me and my niece. 
My mind sometimes will grasp an idea with breathless celerity. It was an annoying experience, and I resolved to avoid the scaffold if it were possible to do so without loss of dignity or the family prestige. My dear child, said I to my niece, has it occurred to you that they have invited us out to an afternoon execution, and that they mean to chop our heads off? She admitted that they seemed to think they were, but begged me to give myself no uneasiness, promising to see that no harm came of our little pleasure excursion. Young girls are so rash, but my niece always takes me with her. But what is this absurdity about a prince? I asked. She said it was no absurdity at all, that she had come to marry the prince, and would marry the prince, if she liked his looks. Haven't you seen him? I asked in some surprise. She shook her head, and then assured me again that I need not be uneasy, that the whole journey was her own plan, and she felt sure of its ultimate success. It is not profitable to argue with a person who pays no attention to what you say, and who never on any account does anything you think it best to do, so I said no more. Amid renewed jeers, we climbed the steps to the scaffold. The headsman was waiting for us. His act looked very large to me, but he seemed strong enough to handle it. The king was there, and was plainly in a hurry to get away, for he said with some attempt at pleasantry, Now then, headsman, here's the young lady who wishes to marry the prince. Off she goes, and then for the old stargazer. I thought his remarks were not in the best of taste. They put my niece's head upon the block, the headsman raised his axe, and the axe head immediately flew off in the form of a black crow, saying, Gah! The headsman looked after it with much interest. Never, said he with emphasis, in the whole course of my professional experience did I ever see anything like that. My niece, I said, is certainly not an ordinary girl. You will all have to admit that, I am sure, when you have known her as long as I have. The headsman sent the page for another axe. The people waited in silence, hardly knowing what had taken place. The king seemed to enjoy the experience. It was something new, and kings, at least all the kings I know, are terribly bored and fond of novelty. He clapped his hands and called out, Brava! The crowd separated at one point, and the page arrived with a spare axe. The headsman handled it with the caressing hand of an artist, poised it lightly in the air, and brought it down with a swish upon my niece's swan-like neck. I had a swan-like neck when younger. Huzzah! cried the hireling crowd. But they had shouted too soon. As the keen edge neared her golden ringlets, the axe head left the handle and, becoming a garland of flowers, encircled her neck in a really effective manner. I could not but admire the aesthetic value of the colors against her fair skin. Old men are somewhat forgetful, and I do not distinctly recall whether I have mentioned my niece's beauty. It is a family characteristic, and in my younger days I was universally admitted to be the handsomest astrologer in our parish. The king had by this time lost his temper. He had come out, as he remarked in high dudgeon, to see an execution, not to witness an exhibition of legerdemain. His choice of language was always excellent, by the way. So now he rose to his feet and ordered the guards to seize the prisoners. The guards were arranged in a hollow square around the scaffold, and, at the word of command, they pointed some very jagged halberds and other painful poking instruments in our direction. I looked at my niece with some misgiving, but apparently she was quite able to take care of herself. She stood up also, and pronounced some magical words. I do not really know just what they were. In fact, she had rather gone ahead of me in the textbooks, and could do a number of things which I should not like to attempt. Probably, if I had been in her situation, I should have disappeared from view or changed myself into a hummingbird or a dragonfly, something with wings, you know, and soared gently away into the blue either. But she was not satisfied with ordinary magical charms. She took most of hers from the appendix in the back of the book, and usually aimed at the more picturesque methods. This time I heard her silvery laugh, and I looked with curiosity at the advancing guards. When they began their short march, they were veterans. After a few steps, they became recruits. A few steps more, and they were cadets, and so it went on. They became boys, and then toddlers, and finally, when they had reached the foot of the platform, they were babies, creeping on all fours and crying and cooing. Those babes in uniform were very ridiculous. After a great shout of laughter, some of the women in the crowd picked up the helpless infants and bore them away in their arms. I afterward learned that the foundling asylum was much overcrowded that night. This last experience seemed to open the king's eyes to the peculiarities of my niece's disposition. He realized that she must be coaxed rather than driven. I do not mean to say he told me so, for in all the course of our acquaintance we did not exchange a dozen words. 
He called me the stargazer and seemed to think me rather a fussy old fellow. Perhaps he was right. My horoscope indicated something of the kind. The populace had now run away, and the king and a few courtiers came to the foot of the platform and invited us to come to the palace and make ourselves at home. The king offered his arm to my niece, and she took it with an ease of manner which she inherited from her grandfather. My father was a sorcerer and of the very best school. All his housework was done by familiars, and Jeanie did the farm work and ran errands. When the king had escorted my niece and her uncle to the private audience room, we sat down to a very well-served table, and then the king and my niece came to an understanding. I heard only the last part of the conversation. "'You cannot marry my son,' said the king decidedly. "'It's against all precedent.' My niece said in her winning way that she did not care a button for precedent, and that several great men had called attention to the fact that there couldn't be precedent for anything the first time it was done. "'I won't argue,' said the king, "'but I will only say I forbid it. Then, to my secret amusement, my niece said very sweetly, as she toyed with a sprig of celery, that she was not fond of argument herself, and therefore would only say that she would then and there turn the king into a canvas-backed duck unless he consented to the wedding. "'I defy you,' said the king. My niece clapped her hands, and he became a canvas-backed duck. "'This is preposterous,' said the duck in a rage. My niece giggled. "'It is monstrous,' said the duck, walking bow-legged around the table. I joined in the mirth. Stargazer, indeed. It is high treason, insisted the royal fowl. My niece rose from the table. The duck looked at her in perplexity. Then he said, I give in. Please fix me straight again. She clapped her hands, and he regained his shape. Now, he said uneasily, I am a man of my word. Send for my son. Several admirals, dukes, and footmen started for the door, but the seneschal had a good lead, and soon returned, ushering in a young man whose physical perfections were not noticed only because of his graceful bearing and exquisite air of high breeding and royal intelligence. When I saw him, I had a curious remembrance of having seen him before, but it was a mistake. I was thinking of a certain beautiful miniature of myself, which my father had given me on my twenty-first birthday. "'Come in,' said the king pleasantly. "'This, my son, is your promised bride.' She is the niece of this old gentleman. He is a stargazer. Bow to your uncle-in-law. The wedding will take place tomorrow. Good evening, young people. Good evening, stargazer. He retired through the cloth of gold portiere, and the prince, by his courtly bearing, soon put us all at our ease. At first his manner, while with my niece, was just a trifle constrained. But at 12.45 a.m., when I went to bed, they had eaten twelve Filipinas, and had ordered a yawning butler to bring more almonds. Next morning a grand procession set forth for the cathedral. I, however, with her permission, remained at home and watched the event through my second-best magical telescope, with which one can look around two corners and through a thin stone wall. I will briefly describe what took place. The king must have spent the night in plotting mischief, for he had gathered together a large army and secured the services of several witches, enchanters, exorcists, and so on. Just as the ceremony was to be performed, these myrmidons surrounded the bridal party and attempted to seize my niece. I was not alarmed, for I had much confidence in her presence of mind and her readiness of resource in emergencies. Just as they gathered around her, she began to grow larger. Soon she increased so enormously that she took the prince up in one hand, put him under her arm, and walked in a leisurely way down the aisle. He did not seem to object. In fact, he had previously done his best to protect her, and had knocked down one witch with her own broomstick early in the proceedings. Still, my niece continued to grow. She rose to the top of the cathedral, put her golden ringlets through the roof, and the slates began to tumble upon the people below. How they scattered! At this moment, the king begged for pardon, and promised reformation and acquiescence. At least I judged so from his attitude. Upon the disappearance of the rabble, my niece regained her proper size, and after the wedding party was brought together again, she became a lovely bride, shrinking and tender. When the bridal couple came down the aisle, they were beautiful. I threw down the glass and hastened to meet them at the palace gate. The prince seemed very happy, and so did the princess, my niece. I felt that I was safe in leaving her to her husband's care, and I set sail the next day for home. I have received a letter from her since. It told many peculiarities of her new life, and described her husband's flawless character and disposition at some length. This was the postscript. 
P.S. Jack says, John is my husband's name, one of them, that magic is beneath the dignity of a married woman. I think so too, and have promised to give it up, maybe. The king is an old duck, not a canvas back, you know. He sends his love to the stargazer. I feel lonely without her. One could not be long dull in her company. Astrology, too, is not what it once was. There is too much cutting of rates and competition. May my dear niece be happy, for certainly she married the man of her choice. End of The Astrologer's Niece Marries Recording by Jared Bond Chapter 9 of Imagine Oceans, Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kieran Metz. Imagine Oceans, Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 9. The Winning of Vanilla. My father was a rich merchant, and I naturally expected that he would give me enough to ensure me a fair start in life. Consequently, after the celebration of my 21st birthday, I was not surprised when he told me that he wished to hold a serious conversation with me in his study. I found him sitting upon his favorite green silk divan. He motioned to me to be seated. My son, he began, it is time you chose your career. Most true, parent revered, was my answer. Unfortunately, he went on, the pirates have lately captured six of my largest galleys loaded with emeralds, topazes, and notions, and I shall be unable to provide for you as I wish to do. But the money, which it seems was fated to be lost, would have been only a disappointment, and you can now show me what you are capable of doing by your unaided efforts. It is an excellent opportunity, I agreed. Your brothers, as you know, have already attempted to cope with the world, I know, I assented, but hitherto I have not told you of their fortunes. The king of a neighboring country seeks a husband for his only daughter, and promises to abdicate as soon as he has found a suitable son-in-law for the place. What sort of a son-in-law does his majesty desire? He doesn't say. Both of your excellent brothers have returned to me for enough to make a new start in life, after having failed to win the hand of this princess. Did they tell you of their experiences? I inquired with natural curiosity. Only in the most general terms, my father answered, smiling grimly at his own thoughts. They told me that each candidate had certain tasks to perform and agreed to leave the country forever if unsuccessful. And my brothers failed? At the first task, said my father. Which was perhaps difficult? Difficult, you may well say. It was to bring from the hereditary Khan of Bejutery a proud and warlike chieftain, his most cherished bit of bric-a-brac, a goblet containing three priceless amethysts, given to him by a descendant of Harun al-Rashid. The princess thinks she would like to have the jewels set in her bonbonniere. Pardon me, Papa, said I, but I do not know that prankish term. It is an outlandish name for a candy box, said my father, who was simplicity itself. Could not my brothers obtain this little favor for the gentle princess, was my comment. They escaped with their lives only by the merest accident, said he. The eldest made a midnight visit to the Khan's jewel room, was discovered, and leapt into the moat some fifty parasangs below, if my memory be what it was. And then he swam four leagues, according to his own estimate, before rising to the surface for air. And the second? Formed an alliance with the Cossack leader and made war upon the Khan. But the Khan defeated them in seven pitched battles, and that discouraged your brother so that he returned home. Hearty commiserations for my brother's misfortunes, I said, after a few moments spent in reflection. And the princess, is she beautiful? that she inspires such courage and resolution? The Princess Vanella is an exceedingly nice girl, said my father. She is graceful, respectful to her elders, plays upon the lute like a true daughter of the desert, makes excellent muffins, and has the happiest disposition, next to that of your lamented mother, I have ever known. She is worthy of your highest ambition. To win her hand would be happiness, 
even should you thereafter lose the kingdom that goes with her. And those realms, my son, added my father with a sigh, are always slipping through one's fingers. In silence, I waited my father's recovery from his emotion. My loved parent had lost several kingdoms already, not by his fault, but through misfortune. From our earliest days, my mother taught us never to remind Papa of the thrones that were once his. She was always considerate. Why should I not undertake this adventure in my turn? I asked soon after. So I asked your brothers, but they were inclined to ridicule the idea. Ultimate ridicule is most satisfactory, I suggested, quoting a proverb of my native land. No doubt, my father agreed, nodding his great white turban. Really, your chances are excellent. The fairy stories are all in your favor. You are the third son, and I have nothing to give you. Your elder brothers have failed and scorn your desire to attempt the tasks. You will, when you go, have only your father's blessing, which I will furnish. All seems favorable. But are you stupid enough? There I cannot help you. The true stupidity is natural, not acquired. I will be as stupid as I can, said I with proud humility. The lovely Princess Fenella shall be mine. I am enchanted with her already. She shall be mine. Enough, said my father, and I withdrew. In a few days, I started with my father's blessing, carrying all my possessions in a silk handkerchief slung from a stout staff. Upon my way, I kept a sharp lookout for old men with bundles of faggots too heavy for their strength, aged women asking alms, and, in fact, for all unattractive wayfarers for I knew that fairies were likely to take such forms, and my vigilance was rewarded. At the first crossroads, I saw an ancient beggar crone hurling stones at a tree with more earnestness than aim. What seekest thou, honest dame? I inquired in an anxious tone, as a rock avoided the tree and came most marvelously close to my right ear. Alas, my best bonnet has flown on the zephyr's wing and roosts in yon tree, she replied, poising another boulder. Resolved to stop the bombardment at any cost, I spoke hastily. Nay, pelt not the shrub. Care thou for my burden and I will scale the branches and rescue the errant triumph of the milliner's art. My language was romantic in those days, perhaps too romantic for she failed to catch my meaning, and waved the stone uneasily. Hold on, I said. Drop the rock, and I'll get the bonnet. If you hit it, you might smash all the style out of it. My praise of her bonnet was not unpleasant to her, for when I brought it, she said gratefully, You are a noble youth. I have little with which to reward you, but give me the pen and inkhorn that dangles from your belt, and a bit of parchment. I can write you a line that may aid you in time of need. Convinced that she was a fairy, I obeyed. She wrote a few words in a crabbed hand and advised me to read them when I was in need of counsel. Give you good day, fair youth, said she courteously. Fare thee well, gentle dame, I replied, removing my left slipper, which is a token of respect in my native land. I met with but one other adventure on my way to the Khan's palace. I rescued an emerald green parrot from a cat and seeing no dwelling near, carried the pretty creature with me. On the eighth day, after leaving my father's house, I was ushered by two gorgeous guards into the courtyard of the palace where the beautiful Vanilla dwelt. My heart beat rapturously, and I felt so young, so brave, and so strong that I feared neither the king nor his people. I happened to arrive just when the king was holding audience, and he was graciously pleased to see me without more than three or four hours' delay in the anteroom. When the curtain doorway was opened, I advanced into the audience hall and saw Vanella. For seventeen minutes I saw nothing but the princess. In fact, the guards had just been ordered to show me out as a dumb and senseless wanderer when I came to myself and began to catch sight of the king dimly, through the edges of the glory which in my eyes surrounded the princess. Pardon, father of Vanella the peerless, said I, the stupefaction of one who indeed knew your daughter to be beautiful, but had no idea what a pretty girl she was. I never saw any princess who can hold a rushlight to her, and it was very sudden. I am better now. We are glad you are better, 
said the king, and hope you will soon be well enough to tell us what you wish. I have come to marry her effulgent perfectness, the Princess Vanella. Yes, said the king with a slightly sarcastic air. Provided I can win her, I added, and that we shall soon see. I think the old man liked my courage. At all events, he called me to him and presented me to the princess. For he was a very sensible ruler and an indulgent father, and he had no idea of marrying his daughter to any man she didn't think worthy of her. So in all cases, permission had to be given by the princess before the candidate could begin the ordeal. But so beautiful was Vanella, and so eager were the young nobility to win her hand, that they all looked handsome and daring when in her presence. I think I must have been attractive in those days, for Vanella says now that she never admired me more than when I was first presented to her. It was love at first sight on both sides. In fact, after we had conversed a few minutes, the princess told me that she was sorry the tests were so awfully difficult, and she didn't care so very much about the goblet after all, though of course she would like it if it wasn't too much trouble to get it. No trouble at all, said I. I would get it for you even if you didn't want it at all. She looked pleased and then frowned. I mean, I added hastily, I'd get it if you wanted it even if you didn't care whether I got it or not. She seemed to understand me perfectly. I shall start after luncheon, I said, and before I go, is there anything else of the cons that you'd like? It's no bother to me to get you the whole treasury if you care for it. The goblet will do, she said, blushing charmingly, and looking at her father to see whether he was listening. He wasn't. Papa, said Vanella, it's all right. Eh? What's all right? He's going, after luncheon. Who is? This young gentleman. Oh, yes, said the king. Very well. I suppose he will get the goblet first. Yes, well, then, good-bye, my young friend, good-bye. Au revoir, I answered, in the prankish mode. Can you not leave the parrot, suggested Vanella. I adore green parrots, of that particular shade of green, I mean. With pleasure, I answered, with a grateful glance. May I ask you to allow it to remind you of me? The color will help, said the king, a little maliciously, I thought. So I hurried away without further delay. As there were no modern systems of rapid transit, I traveled speedily but comfortably toward Bejutery, thinking so constantly of the princess that I never reflected upon how I was to obtain possession of the goblet until I found myself upon the frontier. Then I was stopped by an outpost of the Khan's army. Who goes there? he inquired as he drew his bow and adjusted an arrow to the string. Goes where? I asked, waking up from a brown study, for I was a little abstracted. "'Wherever you are going,' he explained, lowering his bow. "'Why, I do, I suppose,' I answered, a little annoyed by the question, which was absurd on the face of it. "'Well, what do you want?' "'I want to marry the Princess Fenella," I said, absent-mindedly. "'Well, why don't you, then?' the soldier inquired, smiling indulgently. She has sent me to get the Khan's goblet, I said, for I had no wish to go about the enterprise in any underhand manner. I didn't know he was going to send it to her, said the sentinel. Perhaps he won't after all, I said frankly. Maybe not, answered the soldier. He thinks a great deal of it. But I suppose she wouldn't have sent you unless she thought he would let you have it. Would she now, he asked. He seemed to be proud of his cleverness. Well, she might, I said cautiously, but if he doesn't care to give it to me, he can say so. So he can, said the soldier. I wish you good luck. Thanking him for his kindness, I went on my way. It didn't occur to me until afterward that the soldier thought I was a mere messenger sent by the princess according to some arrangement between the Khan and herself. Once within the frontier, I had no further difficulty until I reached the Khan's castle. I attributed my good fortune thus far to the fact that I had minded my own business. It is so much easier to go into a foreign country by yourself than it is to get in at the head of an army. My brother expected to be stopped, and he was stopped. I took it for granted that I could go in, and they let me in. It was very simple indeed. Now another problem confronted me. 
Here was a strong castle built on a rocky promontory, surrounded on three sides by the sea, and on the fourth, defended by a lofty wall of hewn stone. I went to the drawbridge gate and blew the trumpet. Hello, who's there? said a gruff voice. It's a gentleman to see the Khan, I said. Where is he? asked the voice through an iron lattice. I am the gentleman, I replied. Go away, boy. And the latticed window was shut. This was discouraging. What would the princess say if she saw me now, I thought. And then I returned to the gate and again winded the trumpet. No answer. I kept on winding the trumpet, but without result. At last, having blown so hard that I broke it, I was in despair. I sat me down on the bank of the moat and threw stones into the water with a strong desire to throw myself in after them. Then I remembered the bit of parchment which the old woman had given me and concluded it was time to use it. At first I hesitated because I thought I should perhaps need the charm when I came to the other tasks which the king would set me. However, reasoning that I should never come to the second task until the first was performed, I drew out the bit of writing and read, If you don't see what you want, ask for it. That was all it said. Bitterly disappointed, I flung it after the stones into the moat, but I couldn't forget it. And as I began to think it over, I found the advice good. What is it I want to do, I asked myself. Why, to get at the con and his goblet. Now the thing that stopped me was simply a stone wall and a locked gate. And I wasn't anxious to get into the castle. I wanted to communicate with the gentleman of the house. Nothing could be simpler. I still had my writing materials, and in a few moments I had written a note and tossed it over the wall. It was as follows. Most noble Khan of Bajutery, Sir, I have broken the trumpet at the gate and can't get an answer. I come directly from the Princess Vanilla, who wishes the great goblet which is decorated with amethysts. What are you afraid of? I am only a single young man without weapons and promise not to hurt you. I await your answer. But if I do not receive some proper recognition within a reasonable time, I shall report your discourtesy to Princess Vanilla and her royal father. Kaba ben Ephraf. This letter was, of course, handed to the Khan as soon as it was picked up, and I was admitted at once to his presence. He demanded an explanation of my letter, and I told him just how the matter stood. I didn't believe you would allow a paltry bit of glassware and jewelry to stand between a young man and happiness, especially when a lady had asked for it. In my own country, we never refuse any reasonable request a lady makes, and in spite of reports to the contrary, I knew you to be too brave and great a man to depend upon the possession of a few gems for your renown. So, instead of bringing an army, which of course you could easily defeat, thus causing much trouble and distress, I thought I would see what you wished to do about it. The Khan had said not a word during my explanation. Then taking the crystal goblet from the top of his sideboard, he handed it to me, saying, Young man, you have my best wishes. You have acted like a gentleman in the whole matter. I believe your name is Kaba ben Ephraf, isn't it? I nodded. Well, wasn't there a ben Ephraf whom I defeated a few months ago? My brother, I explained. Yes, yes, he sent me a demand for the goblet. But as he didn't explain what he wished it for, of course I considered the message impertinent and refused it. It isn't the gems I care for, but I do insist upon being approached in a proper spirit. I am fond of romance myself, and if you and the princess care to visit me sometime, I'll show you my jewels. I have barrels of them. I am tired of them, so tired of them that I prefer paste for personal use. I looked uneasily at the goblet in my hand. Oh, that is all genuine, he said. You are quite welcome to it. But, he added after a pause, when you come to the throne, there's a little province that abuts on my dominions, and if you could see the way to transfer it to me, why, favors between friends, you know. I begged him to receive the assurances of my wish to oblige him in any reasonable request, and we parted in the best of humor. By the way, said he, as he pressed my hand in parting, that gatekeeper who called you boy, 
Oh, let it go, I said. Uh, he has already been beheaded or something, said the Khan. I'm sorry, if you would have preferred to forgive him. It is of no consequence, I said. None whatever, said the Khan good-humoredly. Goodbye. I returned to the frontier in the Khan's private carriage and had a pleasant trip back to the palace. Like many other distinguished people, the Khan had been misunderstood. My meeting with Vanella was joyful, and she received the goblet with exclamations of admiration and gratitude. The king invited me to stay to supper, informally, and we had the most delicious muffins I ever ate. The princess has never been able to make them taste quite so good again. She says that they were then flavored with our first happiness, but I insist that it was simply a larger portion of sugar. Next morning, bright and early, I announced to the king that I was ready for the second test. It is a sweet little puzzle, said the king. My daughter has another name than Vanilla, known only to herself and to me. We have vowed never to tell the name to any human being. You must find out by tomorrow morning what that name is. I was much discouraged and did not see how it was possible for me to perform this task. I returned to my own room in the palace and racked my brains in vain all day. There seemed no possible clue to the mystery, and the longer I thought of the difficulty of the task, the bluer I became. Just at nightfall, there came a light footstep at my door, and then a soft knock. Come in, I said in a hollow voice. It was one of the princess's attendants. The princess Vanilla's compliments, said the maiden and she says this parrot chatters so that she cannot sleep at night. She requests you to take charge of him yourself. She bowed and retired. She cares no longer for me or my presence, said I bitterly. Then I put upon a table the golden cage in which the parrot was confined and threw myself upon the divan without undressing. Alas, I said bitterly, I have deceived the Khan. I shall never be able to learn the name and I can never give him the province he desires. Unhappy Ben Afraf. Mrs. Ben Afraf, said the parrot. Hush, I said ill-naturedly. Vanilla, vanilla, strawberrya, strawberrya, repeated the parrot slowly and impressively. It did not require a remarkably keen intellect to comprehend the princess's kindly hint. I went cheerfully to sleep, slept soundly till morning and awoke ready to resume the tests. But when I had guessed the name Strawberria, much to the king's surprise, Vanilla objected to putting me through any further trials, and as there was no reason for delay, we were married within a few weeks. We invited the Khan to the wedding, and he proved an excellent dancer and a most agreeable conversationalist. Vanilla was delighted with him, and he sent her 14 mule loads of jewels as a wedding present. My father also came to the wedding and gave me his hearty congratulations. You have won a prize, my son, he said, and so it proved. Note. Anyone who will give a green parrot a good home and kind treatment may have one free by applying to Mrs. Ben Efraf at the palace any weekday between 11 and 3 o'clock. End of chapter 9. Recording by Kieran Metz. Chapter 10 of Imagine Oceans Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Imagine Oceans Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 10 The Professor and the Patagonian Giant. Early one morning, during my third visit to Patagonia, as I was strolling upon the banks of the River Chico, Keeping a sharp lookout for a choice specimen of the Rutabaga tremendosa, I saw what at the time I supposed to be a large and isolated cliff. It looked blue, and consequently I supposed it to be at some distance. Resuming my search for the beautiful saffron blossom which I have already named, my attention was for some moments abstracted. After pulling the plant up by the roots, however, I happened to cast my eyes again towards the supposed cliff, and you can conceive my extreme mortification and regret when I saw that it was not a cliff at all, but a giant, and so far as I could see, one of the most virulent species. 
He was advancing at a run, and, although not exerting himself over much, seemed to be going at a rate of some five kilometers a minute. Much annoyed at the interruption to my researches, I paused only long enough to deposit the rutabaga securely in my botany box, and then broke into an accelerated trot. Do me the justice to acquit me of any intention of entering into a contest of speed with the pursuing monster. I am not so conceited as to imagine I can cover five or even three kilometers a minute. No, I relied rather on the well-established scientific probability that the giant was stupid. And I expected, therefore, that my head would have an opportunity to save my heels. It was not long before I saw the need of taking immediate steps to save my specimens from destruction and myself from being eaten. He was certainly gaining upon me. As he foolishly ran with his mouth open, I noticed that his canine teeth were very well developed. Not a proof, but a strong evidence that he was a cannibal. I redoubled my speed, keeping an eager eye upon the topography, in the hope that I might find some cave or crevice into which I could creep, and thus obtain time enough to elaborate a plan of escape. I had not run more than six or eight kilometers, I think, for distances are deceitful in that part of Patagonia, or were when I was there, when I saw a most convenient Cretaceous cave. To ensconce myself within its mineral recesses was the work of but a moment, and it was fortunate for me that it took no longer. Indeed, as I rolled myself deftly beneath a shelving rock, the giant was so near that he pulled off one of my boots. He sat down at the entrance and breathed with astonishing force and rapidity. Now, if he is as stupid as one of his race normally should be, I said to myself, he will stay there for several hours, and I shall lose a great part of this beautiful day. The thought made me restless, and I looked about to see whether my surroundings would hint a solution of the situation. I was rewarded by discovering an outlet far above me. I could see through a cleft in the rocks portions of a cirrocumulus cloud. Fixing my hat more firmly upon my head, I began the ascent. It did not take long. Indeed, my progress was, if anything, rather accelerated by the efforts of the attentive giant who had secured a long and flexible switch, a young India rubber tree, I think, though I did not notice its foliage closely, and was poking it with considerable violence into the cave. In fact, he lifted me some decameters at every thrust. It may be easily understood, therefore, that I was not long upon the way. When I emerged, I was much pleased with the situation. Speaking as a military expert, it was perfect. Standing upon a commodious ledge, which seemed to have been made for the purpose, my head and shoulders projected from an opening in the cliff, which was conveniently out of the giant's reach. As my head rose over the edge of the opening, the giant spoke. Aha! You're there, are you? I won't deny it, I answered. You think you're safe, don't you? He went on tauntingly. I know I'm safe, I answered, with an easy confidence which was calculated to please. Well, he replied, tonight I hope to eat you for supper. What then, I asked with some curiosity, are you going to do for dinner? Oh, if that troubles you, said he, all you have to do is come out at dinner time, and I will eat you then. Evidently, the giant was not a whitling. His answers were apt. After a moment's reflection, I concluded it was worth the effort to make an appeal to his better nature, his oversoul. "'Don't you know that it's wrong to eat your fellow beings?' I asked, with a happy mingling of austere reproach and sympathetic pain. "'Do you mean to come out soon?' asked the giant, seating himself upon an adjacent cliff after tearing off such of the taller and stiffer trees as were in his way. "'It depends upon whether you remain where you are,' I answered." "'Oh, I shall stay,' said the giant pleasantly. "'Game is rare, and I haven't eaten a white man for two weeks.' This remark brought me back to my appeal to his higher being. "'Then I shall remain here, too, for the present,' I answered. "'Though I should like to get away before sunset. It's likely to be humid here after the sun sets.' But to return to my question, have you never thought that it was immoral and selfish to eat your fellow creatures?' "'Why, certainly,' said the giant, with a hearty frankness that was truly refreshing. "'That is why,' he went on, "'I asked you whether you were coming out soon. "'If not, I would be glad to while the time away "'by explaining to you exactly how I feel about these matters. "'Of course, 
I could smoke you out. Here he showed me an enormous boulder of flint and a long steel rod, the latter evidently a bit of machinery from some wrecked ocean steamer. But I make it a rule seldom to eat a fellow mortal until he is fully convinced that, all things considered, I am justified in so doing. The reference to the smoking out process had convinced me that this was no hulking ignoramus of a giant, and for a moment I began to fear that my rutabaga tremendosa was lost to the world forever. But the latter part of his speech reassured me. If you convince me that I ought to be eaten, I said, willing to be reasonable, I shall certainly offer no objection, but I confess I have little fear that you will succeed. I first discovered that I was a giant, he said, absently chewing the stem of the India rubber tree, at a very early age. I could not get enough to eat. I then lived in New York City, for I am an American like yourself. We bowed with mutual pleasure. I tried various sorts of work, but found I could not earn enough at any of them to pay my board bills. I even exhibited myself in a museum, but found there the same trouble. I consulted my grandfather, who was a man of mature judgment and excellent sense. His advice was to leave the city and try for work in the country. I did so, and after some little trouble found employment upon a farm. I stayed there three days. Then I was told that it cost more to keep me than I was worth, which was true. So I left. Then I went to work on a railroad. There I did as much as twenty men. The result was a strike, and I was discharged. Is there much more to this autobiography? I asked as politely as I could, for I was not at all interested in this unscientific memoir. Very little, he answered. I can sum it up in a few words. Wherever I tried to get work, I was discharged because my board was too expensive. If I tried to do more work to make up for it, the other men were dissatisfied because it took the bread out of their mouths. Now I put it to you. What was I to do? Evidently, you were forced out of civilization, I answered, and compelled to rely upon nature for your sustenance. That is, I went on to forestall another question, you had to become a hunter, trapper, or fisherman. For, of course, in your case, agriculture was out of the question as you couldn't easily get down to the ground and would crush with your feet more crops than you could raise with your hands. His eyes sparkled with joy at being so thoroughly understood. Exactly, he said. But the same trouble followed me there. Wherever I settled, the inhabitants complained that what I ate would support hundreds of other people. Very true, I answered. But excuse me, could you hand me a small rock to sit upon? It's tiresome to stand here. Come out, he said. You have my word of honor as a compatriot of George. Say no more, I broke in hastily. I came out and was soon, by his kind aid, perched upon the branch of a tree conveniently near. This argument, he said, sighing, met me at every turn. And after much cogitation, I could see no solution of the difficulty. No matter how far from the busy haunts of men I proceeded, it was only to find that food grew scarcer as men were less numerous. At last I reached Patagonia, and after a few years I have eaten it almost bare. Now, to what conclusion am I driven? I thought it over. At last I said, I see the extremities to which you are reduced, but upon what principle do you proceed to the next step? Cannibalism? The greatest good to the greatest number, said he. Whenever I eat an animal, I diminish the stock of food which supports mankind. But whenever I eat a man, I diminish the number to be supported. As all the wise men agree that it is the substance which is short, my course of action tends ultimately to the greater happiness of the race. This seemed very reasonable, and for a moment I was staggered. Then a happy thought came to me, and I suggested that if he should allow himself to die of starvation, the demand for subsistence would be still more reduced. 
He shook his head sadly. I used to hope so myself. But the experience of some years, tabulated and reduced to most accurate statistics, has convinced me beyond a doubt that I can catch and eat enough men in a year to more than make up for what would be saved if I should allow my own organism to cease its exertions in the cause of humanity. I thought very carefully over these arguments, and was unable to pick a flaw in them. As a man of science, I said after a pause, I could wish that this interview might be reported to the world. Give yourself no uneasiness. It shall be done, said the giant, and I should also be glad to have the rutabaga tremendosa forwarded very soon to the museum, I said thoughtfully. With pleasure, said the giant. There was no excuse for further delay. And are you convinced? asked the giant, speaking with much kindly consideration. Perfectly, I said, and kicked off the other boot. Note by the giant. In accordance with Professor Muddlehud's last wishes, I have reported our full conversation verbatim. In fact, much of the foregoing account was revised by the professor himself before supper. He would have been glad, I have no doubt, to have gone over the paper again, but the bell rang, and he was too considerate to keep the table waiting. He had many excellent tastes, and there was a flavor of originality about the man, a flavor I like. I enjoyed meeting him very much, and regret that my principles were such as to preclude a longer and less intimate acquaintance. I forwarded the specimen to the museum, as directed, and received in return an invitation to visit the building in New York. Though I cannot accept the kind invitation, I should find it gratifying to have the trustees at my own table. End of chapter 10《Chapter Number Eleven of Imaginations Truthless Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Hind.《Imaginations Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Chapter Eleven The Prince's Counselors. As the prince and a page were coming from a game of tennis, a newsboy ran along crying, Extra, extra, here you are, extra, terrible lost life. Boy, called the prince in a truly royal voice. Extra, asked the boy, running up to them. Yes, please, answered the prince condescendingly, taking the paper and drawing a gold coin from his purse. I can't change that, said the boy. Never mind the change, said the prince. The boy's eyes sparkled. He hastily handed over two papers, and ran off with the coin, shouting as before, while heads popped from windows and people tried to find out the news without paying for it. Meanwhile, the prince and the page read their papers. Extra! The Princess Paragon! Possibly perishing! Alone and adrift! Royalty to the rescue! By this time, both had dropped the rackets and were reading rapidly down the big print so as to get at the facts. The finer print told the story in simple words. The position of the Princess Paragon, at present entirely unknown, is for that very reason most alarming. With her royal father, she this morning went sailing in their private yacht. In spite of His Majesty's well-known skill with tiller and tackle, he lost control for an instant of the staunch little vessel and, fearing the worst, courageously jumped overboard and waded ashore, intending to bring assistance to Her Royal Highness, the unfortunate princess. Having lost one of his shoes in the wet sand, His Majesty was so delayed by his efforts to find it that the yacht had drifted beyond reach of those on shore before the fishermen sent by the intrepid king could reach the beach. Distracted by his loss, the king now most generously offers his daughter's hand and a princely dowry, also half his kingdom, subject to a first and second mortgage, to the noble youth who shall restore to him his daughter and the valuable necklace of diamonds she wears. We commend the quest to the young prince and the brave youths of the court. Further particulars in the regular edition this afternoon. The boat, we learn, was fully insured. There, said the page, throwing aside the paper. That's just what I'm looking for. What is that? asked the prince, as he folded his paper and put it in his pocket. An opportunity to distinguish myself, to become renowned, said the page proudly. You shall have it, answered the prince graciously. You've always served me well, and you play tennis nearly as well as I do. The score that afternoon was six sets love in favour of the page. 
Then you are willing I should try this adventure? asked the page in surprise. Certainly, replied the prince. I shall take you with me, of course. Oh, said the page in quite a different tone. He had been surprised at the prince's generosity, but now he understood it better. Then he turned to the prince and said, When shall you start? In a few days, I think, said the prince, as he stooped to pick up his racket. It depends on how long it will take to decide upon the best plan to get things ready and to pack up my robes and put my fleet in order. Indeed, said the page. Then he added, As I am quite willing to go alone, because I am in a hurry, I think I won't wait. In fact, I'll start now. Then, coolly turning on his heel, he walked off down the street, leaving his racket where it had fallen, and the prince where he stood. His last week's wages aren't paid either, said the prince to himself, and I don't believe he'll ever come back for that racket of his. Reckless boy. The prince picked up the racket and went leisurely home to the palace, where he was received by two long lines of footmen, who bowed low as he entered. There were quail on toast for supper, and the prince was so fond of these little birds that he ate seven of them, and was so busied over it that he could not find time to say a word until he was quite done. The queen was telling the king all about a new gown, and the king was thinking how he could persuade the treasurer that there was a little too much money instead of much too little, and the jester was wondering what chance he might have to make a living as a farmer, and the nobles were trying to attract the king's attention, and said there was hardly a word spoken at the table until the prince was quite through with his seven small birds. Then said the prince, Oh, by the way, papa, I almost forgot to ask you something. Will you please tell the treasurer to give me three or four bags of gold tomorrow? I'm going to take a little journey. But the king at first paid no attention. What did you say? he asked at length. You tell him, suggested the prince to the jester. So the jester gave the king a hasty outline of the news in the paper, and told him that the prince thought of going in search of the princess. The king took little interest in the story until there was mention of three or four bags of gold. Then he awoke to animation. "'To be sure,' he cried. "'It is an excellent plan. "'I will give you an order on the treasurer for six bags of gold, "'and I will keep the rest so as to send out a search expedition for when you get lost.' "'The king knew the treasurer would not dare refuse the money "'for so worthy an object as the rescue of a princess adrift. "'Even if the treasurer did not want to give up the money, "'the people would never support an economy "'that would keep the prince from so worthy an expedition. "'Indeed, the king's order was at once obeyed, "'and the prince began his preparations.' First the prince called a council of the wisest of the court. "'I suppose you have all read the news about the princess?' he asked, when his councillors had assembled. "'Yes,' they answered. "'I am desirous of not making a blunder at the outset, and so have resolved to secure the assistance of the wisest men in the kingdom. What, then, would you advise?' "'It seems to me,' <laughs> said the chief secretary, who was so venerable that his hair and beard seemed turned to cotton batting, that we ought first to ascertain whether the report is confirmed. A low murmur of assent arose from them all, and the prince, accepting the suggestion, said, Let us then appoint a committee of investigation. Who knows how to go about the appointing of a committee? After a brief pause for consideration, another old courtier arose and said that he had a neighbour who was skilled in such matters, and if they would take an adjournment for a day or two, he would ascertain just how to go about it. The prince thought the request was very reasonable, and announced that the council would meet again in two days. So they separated, and the prince betook himself to the tennis courts again, this time, however, with another page. The prince found, during the games, that the former page's racket was a very good one, and this reminded him that the owner of it had started to seek the lost princess. Suddenly stopping the game, he said to one of his attendants, "'On second thought, I think I ought not to have sent after the man who knows how to appoint a committee.' "'Suppose you go after the man who went after him and tell him to come back.' Away went the attendant, and the prince returned to the palace, resolved to prosecute the search with vigour. The council was again called together, and the prince told them that without waiting to verify the report of the loss of the princess, he meant to seek her at once. "'But in which direction will you go?' asked the court geographer. "'Oh, in any direction,' said the prince indifferently. "'There is no telling where a boat may drift to.' "'In that case,' said the court mathematician, smiling, "'the chances are about one in three hundred and sixty "'that you will hit upon the right way. "'Let me show you.' "'So the court mathematician sent a page to the kitchen for some beans. "'Away ran the boy, only to return in a few moments "'with the report that the cook wished to know "'whether he wanted a pint or a quart or how many. "'I want three hundred and sixty white ones and one black one,' "'said the mathematician. "'This time the page was gone a long while.' When he returned, he explained that it took the cook longer to count the beans than one would think, that they had disagreed and had counted them twice to make sure, 
and then had to send to the grocer's for a black bean since there was none in the palace. There was no need of that, said the mathematician impatiently. I can mark one of the white ones and it will do quite as well. So the page ran to overtake the messenger who'd started for the grocer's, and meanwhile the mathematician made an ink mark on one of the white beans, put them all into a hat, and shook them well. Now draw one, he said, offering the hat to the prince. The prince drew one. It was the marked bean. Well, he said, what does that prove? It, it really doesn't prove anything, said the mathematician, a little out of temper. Try again. So the prince returned the marked white bean to the hat, and after they were shaken, drew again. This time he drew a plain bean. You see, said the mathematician triumphantly. What do I see? asked the prince. You didn't get the right one. But I did the first time, argued the prince. All your experiment proves is that I may hit it right the first time and miss it the second if I should try again. But if I hit it right the first time, I shan't have to try over again, so your rule doesn't apply. Isn't that so? It does sound reasonable, answered the mathematician, who was honest though scientific. Perhaps you'd like to go home and try the experiment for yourself, said the prince kindly. The mathematician borrowed the beans and went home promising to send a written report of his trials after a few days. "'Now that we have settled the mathematical side of the question,' said the court meteorologist, "'we can go at the problem scientifically. Here, if you will allow me, is the way it appears to me, Your Royal Highness.' Then the meteorologist unrolled a map and pinned it on the wall. "'The present position of the lost princess,' said he, "'depends upon the joint action of the winds and tides.' The Gulf Stream has little or nothing to do with the problem, as the boat was abandoned beyond the sphere of its influence. The trade winds, for a similar reason, may perhaps be disregarded. There is no question here of Simum or Sirocco, and... Maybe it would be as well to leave out the things that have nothing to do with it, suggested the prince a little impatiently. But how shall we know what to leave out unless we go over them to sea? asked the lecturer. Mm, true, said the prince. But if that will take some time, you might run over the list at home and report to me, say, the day after tomorrow. I will do so, replied the meteorologist, rolling up his map and departing with an air of great importance. I don't see, remarked the prince uneasily, that we are making real progress. There has been nothing but nonsense so far, said a bluff old admiral. What I say is to take a boat and go after the young lady in ship-shaped style. The prince was so much encouraged by this direct way of putting the matter that he let the undignified mention of the princess pass without reproof. "'And what would you advise?' he asked the admiral. "'Take the fastest brigantine you can find,' began the officer, but he was interrupted. "'In a case of less importance,' broke in the voice of a portly commodore, "'I should not venture to interrupt my superior officer, but here the matter admits of no false hesitation because of etiquette.' "'What suggestion have you to make?' inquired the prince. "'A brigantine,' the commodore said impressively, "'is an unreliable craft at best. "'I say take a frigate at once.' "'Pshaw!' broke in the admiral explosively. "'Gentlemen,' said the perplexed prince, "'I cannot presume to decide between you. "'I am a novice in these matters. "'Suppose you discuss the question fully and report in writing?' "'When the naval officers had departed,' There were left only a few small fry, who asked that they might have a day or two to think the whole matter over before committing themselves to a decided opinion. Upon their withdrawal, the prince found only the jester. Perhaps, said the prince, a little sarcastically, you have some advice to give? Perhaps, replied the jester, but first I have a plan to suggest. What is that? Oh, you might take a small army and go after the page who started out to seek the princess. By the time you have come up with him, he will perhaps have found her. Oh, then you could sail in and take her away from him and bring her home yourself. That's the way kings and princes often do. But that seems hardly fair, said the prince after a few moments' reflection. Of course it isn't fair, said the jester, but it's your only chance. I have no doubt he has found the princess long ago. "'Do you think so?' asked the prince. "'No doubt of it,' said the jester. "'You see, he didn't wait for any advice, but started off at once.' "'Isn't advice a good thing?' Oh, "'Yes,' said the jester. "'For lawyers and counsellors, oh, they make their living by it. "'Advice is good when it's good, but the best qualities are hard to find, "'and the time it takes to find them is sometimes worth more than the advice when found.' "'Then you wouldn't advise me to take advice?' said the prince thoughtfully. 
My advice is, said the jester, don't take mine or anybody's. Isn't that rather a difficult course to follow? asked the prince after a moment's reflection. Very, the jester agreed. I think, the prince went on, that I shall start now and take my chances. I'll go with you, replied his companion. So they started toward the palace gate, but just as they reached it and had called for the gatekeeper, there came a summons from without. When the gate was opened, there was the page. He seemed weary, and his shoes showed that he had travelled a long way on foot. "'Did you find the princess?' asked the prince eagerly. "'Yes,' said the page very calmly. "'I found her.' "'Fortunate boy,' said the prince a little enviously. "'I don't know about that,' said the page. "'She was as cross as two sticks about having been left to go adrift. "'It rained, you know, and when I rode out to the yacht "'I found that everything on board was soaking wet, "'and she hadn't had anything to eat for two days, and... "'My goodness, she was up in mad.' Oh, "'What did she say?' asked the jester. "'She said she'd like to box my ears,' said the page earnestly. "'Then I told her if she wasn't more polite, I wouldn't rescue her. "'That quieted her quick. "'So then she didn't say anything, but she looked about as pleasant as cold gravy. "'As soon as I towed the boat ashore, she gave me some money and told me to get along home. "'So I did, and I was glad to be away. "'I didn't tell her who I was, and I don't think she will ever find me. "'You won't tell, will you?' pleaded the page as he finished. No, said the prince, laughing. I won't tell, but perhaps you didn't treat the princess with proper courtesy. No wonder she was out of humour after being adrift so long. I'll tell you, said the page suddenly, what we'll do. I found the princess, and I suppose I'm entitled to the reward. Now, can't you arrange it so that you'll marry the princess? I think she'll just suit you. She's a fine-looking princess, and I don't believe she meant to be cross. Do you think you can arrange it? It would be a splendid thing for the kingdom, you know. It would unite the two kingdoms, and there'd be all sorts of advantages. You can say that I went with your permission, you know, and that uh, I'm engaged to be married, and wouldn't presume to aspire to a princess's end. It's a good suggestion, said the jester, for otherwise there'll be war, of course. The other king will be bound to know why this young man won't accept his daughter's hand, and that there'll be a lot of diplomatic correspondence, ultimatums, protocols, and all sorts of goings on. If you don't mind, I think you would do well to marry this princess. I don't mind at all, answered the prince, and I think I'll write a letter to her this very day. But how, he went on, turning to the page, did you come to be engaged? I didn't know anything about it. The fact is, said the page, I'm not quite engaged, but there's one of the maids of honour who will have me, I'm sure. She told me the other day she wished it was a leap year every day, and I think that's a distinct encouragement, don't you? His friend agreed that it was a marked observation. You'll be safe for a day or two, remarked the jester to the page, and meanwhile you could be getting your clothes brushed and your shoes mended. The prince will write today. Early on the following morning, as the prince came down to breakfast, he was told that a deputation was awaiting him in the council room. "'Who are they?' he asked. "'The councillors with their reports,' answered the messenger. "'But,' said the prince, "'they are too—' "'Hush!' said the jester. "'Let us not lose their words of wisdom.' "'Very well,' the prince agreed, smiling. So the prince, the jester, and the page entered the room where the council were assembled. All bowed profoundly. "'Your Royal Highness,' began the secretary, "'in order to verify the report of the loss of the princess, "'I sent an inquiry to a friend of mine "'who stands very high in favour at her father's court. "'It was thus worded. "'Is the royal princess absent from the court? "'And I have his sealed reply. "'She is not. "'That I consider conclusive, is it not?' "'Yes.' said the jester. It is not. I have no doubt, said the prince, that your information is correct, and I thank you for your diligence. The secretary bowed and was seated. I, began the meteorologist, have prepared a list of things that may be disregarded in the search. It contains 872 items, with two appendices and voluminous notes. I will read it. Never mind, said the prince very graciously. I will order it filed in the royal archives. We will now listen to the mathematician. I have tried the bean experiment several hundred times, said the mathematician, and have not yet succeeded in drawing the marked bean. The formula of chances I have worked out. 
I find that if Henry puts 360 white beans into a hat, and John draws a good many times, no one can tell whether he will draw the marked bean the first time or not at all. I consider that an exact statement of the matter. I am not prepared to dispute you, said the prince, and I will ask leave, therefore, to express my indebtedness to you. We, said the admiral, speaking for himself and the commodore, I regret to say have as yet arrived at nothing more advanced than a compromise. We have agreed to recommend a squadron composed of equal numbers of brigantines and frigates. Thus you will secure the advantages of both forms of craft. A wise conclusion, said the prince, and I gladly offer to you both my fervent gratitude. A few of the smaller fry of councillors yet remained to be heard, but the prince announced that he had bestowed upon each councillor the order of the brazen owl. As he was about to leave the room, the councillors, after a moment's consultation, begged permission to ask a question. It was granted. We should like to know what use your highness wished to make of the information we have furnished. To find the princess who was lost, answered the prince. Oh, yes, said the councillor's spokesman. We had forgotten what it was all about, but it's of no consequence now. No, said the prince. She is rescued. Indeed, said the councillors with polite interest. Then they put on their cloaks and went their several ways, all reading their reports to one another and none listening. The prince and princess were married soon after, and the page and the maid of honour were best man and bridesmaid. The prince pensioned the councillors and sent them to America. They all sailed in one ship. The vessel is several days overdue, but undoubtedly will arrive in safety after the admiral and commodore have settled a little difference of opinion as to where they had better land. The page and the maid of honour are married, and keep a candy store where they sell a dollar's worth of candy for five cents. They sent me the address, but you'll be sorry to learn that I have mislaid it. End of chapter 11. The Prince's Counselors. Chapter 12 of Imagine Oceans Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Imagine Oceans, Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 12. Teddy and the Wolf. The doctor had said, Now, Mr. Rowland, I will be frank with you. Unless you get away from the city and stay away, I will not answer for the consequences. Of course there could be no hesitation after that, and Mr. Rowland, Mrs. Rowland, and Teddy packed up their little keepsakes, sold everything else, and transferred themselves to Bartonville. Here the breadwinner of the family bought a slender stock of goods and opened a small store. "'You will see how I shall prosper.' he said to his wife. My city experience will give me a great advantage over the other tradesmen. I shall be more business-like, and if you and little Teddy will only thrive as well as I, shall make my trade thrive. We will not regret the stifling city. So far as Mrs. Rowland was concerned, there was nothing to complain about. After two months in the new home, she had grown rosy and bright, as rosy and pretty as Teddy himself and he was by far the finest five-year-old in town. Even his father admitted it. But alas for the thriving trade! Mr. Rowland had put all his money into the hoes and rakes, axes and brooms, which stood looking so clean and trim before the door. They stood bravely to their posts, and, equally faithful, were the rolls of cloth and barrels and boxes on duty indoors but hardly a strange foot crossed the threshold to mar the freshly sanded floor. Only a few villagers, from curiosity, strayed aimlessly in and out again to make their purchases elsewhere. Many, in welcoming the newcomer, had reminded him that competition was the life of trade, but he was beginning to think, sadly enough, that it was also the death of trade, in some cases at least. The rent, the butcher, the baker, and candlestick maker had taken the few dollars saved to get a good start. Mrs. Rowland had darned and crisscrossed Teddy's red stockings into ridges and lumps, 
she had turned and fixed her few dresses until she felt that her worried little brain needed turning and darning too but their money was gone and the thriving trade had not begun mr rowland tried to be hopeful but his set lips grew into a grim hardness and he talked less and less of his prospects as the future became more uncertain teddy found no fault he admired his well-mended stockings and pitied those who lacked the picturesque variety of contrasted patches soon after the sun was well above the hills teddy's bread and milk made its daily visit to his bowl and teddy never thought of asking awkward questions in the case of either mystery one morning the discouraged storekeeper went to the bank to draw out his last small balance going to close your account asked mr prentice the president who always was particular to speak to his customers for a time only i hope replied mr rowland bravely counting the few small bits of paper with thoughts far away from any consideration of arithmetic you must not withdraw your patronage said the smiling president as he turned and walked back into his cosy office mr rowland was unusually silent during the evening and even forgot to tell teddy his regular story before putting him to bed the little boy noticed his father's depression and kept very quiet when his mother began to look meaningly at the clock teddy came and said good-night and went to bed without a word of objection poor boy he must be tired out said mrs rowland when she returned to the room then she sat down to her stocking basket but teddy was not tired he was thinking he was wondering what troubled his father Teddy did not mean to lie awake, much less to listen to the conversation between his father and mother. The door was ajar, and he could not help noticing that the usual reading aloud was omitted, nor could he fail to hear a word or two now and then. What he heard convinced him that he was right in thinking his father out of sorts and worried, and also made him sure that he knew what was the trouble. He heard his father saying, so you see anna there's no need for me to go to the store i might just as well be here with you at least i could be at work in the garden and then there would be something done toward keeping the wolf from the door teddy heard no more for he fell fast asleep but when he awoke next morning his mind was made up and soon after his plans were matured are you going to the store he asked his father with some surprise when the good-bye kiss was given yes teddy somebody may come in and i must be there replied the father as he trudged slowly down the gravel walk teddy watched him anxiously and then turned briskly toward the house the first thing to do was to get his bow gun he did not remember where he had put it but that did not disquiet him he would ask his mother mamma where's my gun asked teddy in perfect confidence where did you leave it asked his mother a little absent-mindedly teddy leaned up against the kitchen table with one small finger in his mouth and tried to think but he hadn't an idea at length mrs rowland said you were playing african hunter yesterday and borrowed your father's big boots go and find the boots and perhaps you may find the gun too teddy climbed the attic stairs two steps to each stair found the gun stowed away in one of the boots and was so impressed by his mother's suggestion that he almost resolved to consult so helpful a mother about the terrible wolf but teddy was accustomed to rely upon himself and had been so often told to try his own powers before seeking help that he concluded to keep his own counsel now that he had the gun he sought the next thing needed for his plan this was something which had not occurred to him until just as he was parting his hair that morning on the third trial for teddy liked the little path to the top of my head very straight indeed mamma can i go and get something from papa's workshop he asked when he came back to the kitchen i won't hurt myself a bit and i don't want to tell you what it is yes teddy said mrs rowland hardly noticing the strange request she was thinking of the wolf too away went the sturdy little crossbowman through the thick grass taking the shortest cut presently he returned 
carrying with him a steel trap after scouting a little teddy satisfied himself that the coast was clear and dragged the trap around to the front door he felt sure that this must be the door his father meant for it was almost always closed and bolted he placed the trap cleverly enough before the door but by a trifling oversight forgot or else did not know enough to set it then teddy retired to an ambush behind a thick evergreen strung his crossbow with a care which would not have been discreditable to dennis himself and awaited all comers about half an hour afterward mr prentice walking leisurely down to the bank like a man who could afford to take his time caught sight of a curly golden head in mr rowland's front yard he stopped for he was fond of teddy and often paused to say a word to him teddy thought mr prentice the greatest man in the world next to his own father so when the banker rubbed the little curls with his gold-headed stick and said hello curly head are you too proud to pass the time of day with a friend this morning teddy rose from behind the tree tiptoed close to the fence and replied almost in a whisper good morning mr prentice please keep quiet and go away please as quick as you can somewhat surprised and alarmed the banker asked is your mother sick teddy no sir she's well but she's afraid 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 of what where's your father anything wrong mr prentice was seriously troubled he had little children of his own and wild visions of contagious diseases accidents and disasters were jumbled in his brain papa's gone to the store i guess he was afraid too said teddy sagaciously what is it teddy said the banker sternly it's a wolf replied teddy in a mere whisper looking uneasily around and wishing for the first time that mr prentice would stop talking to him and not interfere with his plans a wolf said mr prentice first looking blank and then laughing heartily why teddy you're a goose there are no wolves for hundreds of miles around somebody has been making fun of you yes there are there's one wolf anyway said the boy with a nod of wisdom what makes you think so asked mr prentice for he was one of those who think it not unwise to find out what children mean before laughing at them teddy was pleased by the respectful tone and felt a wish to be polite in return so trusting that the enemy would be kind enough to defer the attack for a few moments he told his grown-up friend how he had heard papa tell mamma that he didn't know how he was going to keep that wolf from coming in that door and continued teddy i got the wolf out of my noah's ark so that i could tell him when he came and i got the twap out for him and my gun papa's got to be down at the store so's if anybody should come there and mamma can't fight cause she's a girl and there's nobody home but me unless you'll stay teddy glanced at the kindly face above him as if even his brave heart would not disdain a companion in arms my gun hurts too he went on with pride for the banker had not said a word in reply want to see and he offered to demonstrate its effectiveness against his friend's leg mr prentice looked toward the door of the house there lay the trap half hidden under a spray of evergreen then he picked up the brave little huntsman and gave him a kiss put him down softly and walked away without a word his hands were clasped behind him and he was thinking something about and thy neighbour as thyself teddy went back to his post but he was puzzled and his singleness of purpose was gone during the day mr prentice spoke to mr dustin one of the directors of the bank seen what a nice new store it is that mr rowland has he's a newcomer you ought to give him a little of your custom now and then he's one of our depositors you know and one good turn deserves another really dustin he's got a nice family and you'd oblige me if you could favour him with an order now and then mr dustin said he would of course he would 
time he changed anyway the other tradesmen were becoming careless competition was a good thing then they talked of banking matters mr prentice managed to say another word to another friend that same afternoon and yet another the next morning and he did not forget to take care that his suggestions should bear fruit the result was very bad for the wolf teddy didn't see him in fact after dinner teddy forgot all about the animal for one of the older boys came along and took the hunter out fishing mr rowland was at first much surprised at the sudden tide of custom and prosperity many came and finding the new man civil and obliging accurate and punctual they came again some weeks later mr rowland said to his wife with an air of some profundity anna my dear patience is sure to tell in the long run i came very near to giving up in despair but you see the darkest hour was just before the dawn there is nothing like a bold front to scare the wolf from the door mrs rowland looked lovingly at her husband and thought him a very clever man but teddy was sleeping the sleep of the just and as for mr prentice he never told the story of their little wolf hunt End of chapter 12chapter 13 of imagine oceans truthless tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jason in panama imagine oceans truthless tales by tudor jenks little plunkett's cousin if it is better to be first in a village than last in rome ralph mcgregor should have been content for there was no doubt that he was the first among the village boys in all those pursuits which they most valued not only was he thus pre-eminent but he was blessed with competitors some of whom were able to threaten his possession of the title of champion ralph therefore never failed to realize the sweetness of power continual attempts to displace him having thus far only resulted in lengthening the list of his victories one saturday afternoon the boys started for their swimming beach which was on a lake not far from the village where they lived with and without permission the little group had come in twos and threes along the hot and dusty road which led past the village store between fields and meadows over the rises and hollows to the lake shore on the way down there had been a race and after an exciting struggle ralph had won it he was in high spirits over the victory and this made him a little boisterous when they entered the water ralph had ducked one of the smaller boys who had made little resistance or remonstrance at the moment but bided his time and retaliated as ralph discovered when he left the water and began to dress ralph examined his shirt just long enough to discover that knots had been tied in the sleeves and then hastily drawing on his trousers and throwing his jacket around his shoulders he started to run along the road after the retreating figure of the sly small boy who had left the water some little time before in spite of the long start secured ralph overtook his fleeing prey and grasped him firmly by the nape of the neck then without checking his speed ralph turned a long curve driving his unhappy captive before him and the two were soon at the swimming beach again now said ralph you can just untie those knots youngster and be quick too what for asked the younger boy whose name was plunkett feigning a bland innocence which was really absurd under the circumstances disdaining other answer ralph tightened his grasp upon plunkett's neck in a most convincing way plunkett seemed satisfied with this proof of his crime and began a reluctant struggle with the knots regretting perhaps that he had so firmly constructed them a few of the older boys had meanwhile come to the conclusion that there was something to be said on the other side of this case which ralph was deciding so summarily see here ralph said tom cromwell one of the most ambitious of the champion's rivals just suppose you let plunkett go he's all right you ducked him first 
"'What's that to you, anyway?' asked Ralph, never relaxing his grip upon the stooping plunket. "'Oh, nothing much,' said Tom. "'Only you ought to be fair.' "'So I am fair,' Ralph replied. "'I only ducked him for a joke.' "'And I only tied your clothes for a joke,' responded the smaller boy with some spirit. "'Well, it's a different thing,' said Ralph, "'and you know it.' This last clause he added as a clincher, for he was conscious that the distinction between the two acts was far from clear to himself and was unwilling to argue. No further remonstrance was made by Cromwell, and Little Plunkett soon finished the task opposed upon him, so the subject was dropped, and the boys loitered homeward. Some flung stones at trees or posts which offered themselves as fair tests of markmanship, while others plodded along in the rear-guard, making constant efforts to thoroughly dry their hair, a matter to which they seemed to attach much importance. In throwing stones, as in other boyish accomplishments, Ralph easily proved his supremacy, and was foolish enough even to taunt his companions with their lack of skill. "'You can't throw any better than a lot of girls,' he said, contemptuously. "'Look, here is the way you throw.' and he gave a wildly farcical fling of the arm. The boys laughed, for it was comical, but they did not take any pleasure in being reminded of their inferiority, nor did their chagrin fail to bear fruit. When they came to Main Street, which, of course, was the street made by the church, the village store, and the town hall, Ralph's path diverged from the course of the rest, and he turned away, saying, So long, boys, and went whistling homeward. The others walked on for a few paces in silence. All felt somewhat ashamed of their subservience to the village bully, and each was too proud to say so, or to become bolder immediately upon his departure. Indeed, they would not have called Ralph a bully, for to them the word meant only one who fought and thrashed smaller boys, and Ralph was neither quarrelsome nor pugilistic. Yet he was a bully, for he took for himself liberties which he denied to others, and did so by force. He did not fight, it is true, but that was merely because the boys were of a higher grade than those whose fists are their sole arbiters of right and wrong. Now, Ralph went home entirely unconscious of the impression his conduct had made upon his comrades, and no doubt would have said that they had enjoyed the afternoon quite as much as he had but not long after his swaying figure was concealed by a turn in the road, young Plunkett said to the rest, "'Fellows, why didn't you stand by me? I had just as much right to fix his shirt as he had to duck me, hadn't I?' "'Well, I said so,' replied Tom Cromwell, but in a half-hearted way. "'Oh, yes, you said so,' answered little Plunkett, "'but a lot of good that did me. I had to untie the knots all the same.' "'Well, what do you want me to do?' asked Tom, a little sulkily, for he was far from being thoroughly pleased with his own conduct. "'Do you want me to pound him over the head, and then to get licked by him? You know he can do it, and there's no use saying he can't. What good would it do you for me to get rolled in the mud?' "'I'll do it, if you say it's the correct style,' added Tom, dryly. "'But first I'd like to see the good of it all.' Young Plunkett was one of those big-headed boys who are born to make plans. It was not the first time he had considered the problem of Ralph McGregor, and he had a general idea of what ought to be done, but he was not entirely satisfied with the details of his project. He was glad of this opportunity to foment a conspiracy and promptly took advantage of it. "'It's no fun having you rolled around in the mud, Tom,' he answered, smiling. And, as you say, it's precious little use. But I've got a notion. Here the boys all chuckled, for Plunkett's notions were a staple joke among them. But he merely paused long enough for the laughter to ebb away, and then continued undisturbed. I've a notion how we can fix this up all straight. They were just then passing the schoolhouse yard, so he said, Come in here and sit down for a while, and I'll explain it to you. The old gate swung open, the boys filed in, it slammed together again, and for an hour or so a group of gleeful conspirators concentered around the intellect of Plunkett, the boy with a notion how to fix it. They parted at dusk in the best of humor. 
each distributing giggles along his homeward path. During the next week, only a very keen observer would have remarked the fact that the thoughtful brow of Ethan Plunkett was upon two special afternoons missed from its accustomed place in the schoolroom. The schoolmaster noted the circumstance in his little book, but attached no importance to the absences beyond a mental recognition of the warm interest some of the other scholars seemed to take in this lad, who was one of the younger boys. Indeed, the master thought he observed that looks of inquiry were directed toward the youngster upon his second return to the school, and even that the boy nodded in assent to the questions thus mutely expressed. Still, as a small boy was at that moment endeavoring to convince the teacher, by a positive manner and reiterated assertions, that Kamchatka was an empire in South America, the master's mind was diverted and never recurred to the subject. A week having passed, it easily follows that another Saturday afternoon was entitled to arrive. The season being summer, it also follows that the boys were early on the road to the swimming beach. In fact, there seemed some concert in their meeting, for quite a squad of the boys, the same who had met at the schoolhouse, came along together. There was also a stranger with them. He was a quiet lad, dressed in a shabby suit and a little derby hat which seemed rather old for him, and he held his head down as he walked. Close beside him walked Ethan Plunkett, and it was noticeable that the stranger was treated with much consideration by Ethan, and indeed by all the boys. This squad walked quietly to the swimming beach, and strangely enough plunged into the river without delay, as if they had come only for a bath instead of for a frolic as usual. They seemed to be expectant, for they watched the stranger keenly. The look of relief which was plainly visible when Ralph McGregor appeared upon the shore would indicate that his presence was at least one of the factors necessary to gratify their expectations. "'Hello, fellows,' said Ralph, as he threw off his coat. "'Why didn't you wait for me?' "'Oh, we knew you'd be along, and Plunkett wanted to take his visitor down to show him the beach,' answered Tom Cromwell, who with careless ease was treading water not far from shore. "'That's all right,' said Ralph, good-naturedly. "'Well, I'm glad you're not displeased with us,' said Plunkett, in a rather a mocking tone. Ralph, however, was not thin-skinned, and repeated, "'Oh, no, it's all right.' Then, taking a short run, he plunged into the water, diving under and coming up, with a snort and shake of the head, not far from the new boy. "'You're Ralph McGregor?' asked the newcomer. Yes, replied Ralph, rather shortly, for he was not entirely pleased to be addressed with so much assurance by a new boy. What's your name? he asked in return. Senor Alberto, replied the youngster as quietly as if he had said Thomas Brown. What? said Ralph in his surprise. Senor Alberto, replied the boy in the same matter-of-fact tone. What are you, French? asked Ralph. No. Are you Scotch? inquired the other boy. No. Why? Because your name is McGregor, and the boy turned and swam somewhat awkwardly away. Ralph struck out in his wake and soon overtook him. Ralph's curiosity was excited and he wanted to ask a few more questions. But just as he came abreast of the other swimmer, the stranger dived and came up several feet further away. Ralph again swam to him, and the diving was repeated. When he came up, Ralph called, See here, Alberto, or whatever your name is, I want to talk to you. Well, replied the other, what of it? You keep swimming away, replied Ralph. Can't you swim? asked Alberto, in a dry tone which made the other boys grin. Course I can, but I want to talk now. Well, talk, and I'll swim, replied the cool stranger. The boys chuckled, and Ralph's temper was a little ruffled. "'Come here,' said he, somewhat imperiously. "'I haven't time,' replied Alberto, "'and I'm afraid I shall wet my feet.' The last part of the reply admitted of but one construction. This irreverent stranger was evidently poking fun at the proud MacGregor. "'If you don't come, I'll come there and duck you,' said Ralph, at the same time pretending to laugh as if he were only joking. 
but alberto seemed to have forgotten ralph's existence and was swimming still with apparent awkwardness near ethan plunkett and conversing quietly with him this entire ignoring of his threat provoked ralph more than any reply could have done do you hear me he shouted angrily i do replied alberto but your voice is powerful weak you need a tonic ralph wasted no more words but plunged into the water and swam with all his might towards this irritating fellow at the same time the boy called signor alberto seemed to be making tremendous efforts to get away but ralph gained upon him and was soon so near that he could almost reach the boy's heels almost but not quite ralph redoubled his efforts making frantic plunges and puffing out water like a chinese laundryman but somehow there was still just an inch or two between his hand and alberto's heels the other boys roared with laughter and it soon became clear even to ralph that he was not going to catch the boy much less duck him it was humiliating but ralph's breath gave out and he had to stop you're a pretty fair swimmer he said trying to put a good face on the matter where did you learn to swim in the desert of sahara replied alberto with the eskimos oh see here stop fooling said ralph who are you anyway you can call me an italian cousin of ethan plunkett's replied the boy and he swam further out ralph made up his mind that there was not much to be made out of so odd a fish and swam away soon after he waded ashore and dressing waited for the rest to come out ralph was somewhat silent and indeed was for the first time conscious that he had lost rank in the eyes of his companions he knew no other way to recover what he had lost than by some feat of strength or skill since he had been beaten in swimming for the newcomer had easily outdone ralph's best efforts in the water he thought that perhaps his strength might stand him in good stead where his skill had failed so when the others were dressed ralph proposed that they should stay a while by the lake and have some fun the other boys well knew what this meant and little plunkett who had hitherto kept strangely in the background said what'll we do ralph let's pull on a stick this was ralph's favorite amusement he even preferred it to snap the whip though that too was a favorite so they found a stout stick and two of the boys sat on the ground put the soles of their feet together and holding the stick near the middle pulled until one or the other was drawn to his feet or pulled over several of the boys declined the game among them alberto but after cromwell had with much difficulty conquered all but ralph the latter sat down with a confident smile and after a short struggle pulled cromwell over indeed it seemed to him that he had never conquered tom so easily as he sat upon the ground beaming with pride and with his good humor entirely restored little plunkett stepped up and said modestly my friend alberto thinks he would like that game and he's willing to try with you if you'll show him how all right replied ralph very graciously so alberto sat down and after a little teaching said he thought he understood it oh it takes some practice said ralph in a patronizing tone i'll pull against you with one hand at first so he did but strange to say alberto pulled hard enough to make ralph lose his hold upon the stick and it slipped from his hand you'd better take two hands perhaps said alberto politely it pulls more evenly that way so ralph took both hands braced himself smiled to think how the little foreigner would come flying through the air exerted all his strength and to his intense surprise arose gracefully but most unwillingly to his feet he was beaten and the little foreigner was actually chuckling at him you're too heavy to be very strong remarked alberto critically well i guess you'd find me all you'd want to tackle said ralph testily for he was unused to this style of criticism and found it too frank to be agreeable how do you mean asked the other wrestling what kind asked alberto any kind said ralph recklessly come on and i'll show you whether i'm too fat or not it's all good-natured you know said alberto in a questioning tone any way you like said ralph alberto threw off his coat and advanced toward ralph 
Are you ready? he asked. Ready, said Ralph. When Ralph got up, he looked around him in a dazed way and then asked curiously, How did you do that? That's what they call the Greco Roman style, replied Alberto, who did not seem to have moved at all so far as Ralph could remember. Are your other styles like that? Something like that, replied his cool antagonist. Then I don't care to see any more, replied Ralph very frankly, and with much more good nature than most boys would have shown after having been thrown to the ground like an empty sack. The boys around laughed, and Tom Cromwell said, That's a smart cousin of yours, Plunkett. Yes, he's pretty quick, replied Plunkett, very soberly, and with more modesty than was entirely natural under the circumstances. Are you Plunkett's cousin? asked Ralph suspiciously. I have always called myself so ever since I first knew him, replied Signor Alberto, turning away. Plunkett laughed. He could not help it. Ralph was much chagrined, but even yet did not completely realize his downfall or have sense enough to stop where he was. He was restless and proposed a race to the village store. Away they went, little Plunkett first at the start, for he was great on short distances. Tom Cromwell was next then ralph saving himself for the final spurt after him two or three other boys and strangely enough plunkett's cousin was running lightly the last of all cromwell soon took the lead but only to lose it to ralph and ralph was just beginning to congratulate himself that he would be the winner when something rolled by him ralph drew up short it was plunkett's cousin turning handsprings that was too much ralph turned and fled home he went to his room sat down in a big armchair and thought it all over he did not go to church next day he said he did not feel just right he reappeared next day and things thereafter went just about as usual but with a difference it was a very different ralph mcgregor who came to school on monday and a much better fellow the new mcgregor was now and then some of Ralph's old traits would show themselves for a moment, but when this happened there was likely to be a sudden interest in Plunkett's cousin among the boys, and solicitous inquiries about his health, and Ralph never failed to quiet down. Plunkett was reticent, but freely admitted that he did not expect another visit from Signor Alberto for some time to come. A month or two passed, and Ralph went to the circus, which was at the county seat near his native village, among the performers he was surprised to recognize Plunkett's visitor. After seeing Alberto perform some wonderful feats of bareback riding, tumbling, jumping, and conjuring, Ralph said wisely to himself, Well, a fellow ought to follow his bent. It isn't long since he was here. It shows the youngster was cut out for the business, or he never could have learned all that in so short a time. He told Plunkett so when he returned home, and Plunkett said only, Ho, ho, ho. But Ralph didn't see that there was anything to laugh about. As to the conspirators, they held one more meeting than the two mentioned. It was just before the departure of Plunkett's cousin and resulted in the prompt collection of five dollars. This was handed to Plunkett's cousin, and he thanked the boys and said as he turned away, I don't like to take money from you, boys, but after all, you made it a matter of business. All the boys assured him that they were well satisfied. End of chapter 13、chapter、fourteen of Imagine Oceans Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Story Girl. Imagine Oceans Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Professor Chipmunk's Surprising Adventure. The oak tree, selected by the committee, was excellently adapted to the purpose. Being deep in the woods, shady, and yet not so thickly leaved as to obstruct the audience's view of the sky, in case of hawks or other unruly members of society. Professor A. Chipmunk, 
though a little dingy in coloring and somewhat thin, as indeed was natural considering his experiences, appeared to be fully conscious of the importance of the occasion and ready to do his best. Precisely at noon, he climbed to his place on one of the smaller branches, took a dainty sip of rainwater from an acorn cup, waved his tail gracefully to the audience, and began. <clears throat> Quadrupeds and bipeds. Your committee has told me that there is much curiosity among you in regard to my experiences during my recent captivity in the hands of that grasping and selfish race which converts our happy woodlands into desolate farms and prefers to the sprightly and interesting dwellers of the woods the overfed and stupid slaves of the farmyard. For the benefit of my younger hearers, I will say plainly that I refer to the ordinary homo, commonly known as man. Applause. Most of you know that it was my misfortune to fall into the clutches of these strange animals, and my good fortune to return again to my bereaved family and to you my neighbors. And I am sure I can find no more fitting occasion than the present to thank you all for having supplied my wife and children with acorns and walnuts during my absence. But for the sake of the few who may not know how it was that I became the prisoner of the slow-moving animals to which I have already referred, I will explain that I entered, in the interests of science, a sort of enclosure, or artificial burrow, known in their tongue as a trap. My purpose in entering the enclosure was to ascertain whether it was a safe place for a squirrel to reside, and I am quite convinced by my experience that it is not. The trap is commodious, dark, and well sheltered, but it has the serious defect that the entrance does not always remain open. Indeed, in the case of the one I examined, no sooner had I entered it than something fell over the end, shutting out the light. As it fell, I heard a peculiar sound from a bush nearby, sounding like I got him. Some of you may ask why I did not push aside the obstruction and escape. The same thought occurred to me, but no matter how hard I pushed, it would not move. I then began to gnaw my way out when a remarkable thing occurred. You have many of you been upon a branch when it was violently swayed by the wind? In the same way did this trap behave. It seemed to be raised from the ground and to be shaken violently, so violently, in fact, that I had to cease my attempts at gnawing my way out. This continued for quite a time, and when it ceased, the cover was opened. Glad to escape, I sprang through the opening. But to my surprise, I found I was not free. I found myself in another enclosure, made of thin, straight twigs, without bark and harder than any wood. I think I may say without presumption that my teeth are as good as those of any rodent who may be present, but try as I might. I could make no impression upon even the smallest of those cold gray twigs. At this moment, two blue jays in one of the upper branches, who had already been chattering in rather an audible tone, burst into a peal of mocking laughter. A kingbird flew at them and gave them a good pecking, whereupon they flew away toward the swamp and the indignant audience settled down again 
and begged the professor to go on. As I picked up a few words of their language, I can inform you that this contrivance was called a cage, and seemed to have been made for the purpose of retaining such wood dwellers as might fall into these creatures' power. Several of the young animals gathered around it and examined me closely, apparently to determine whether I was good to eat. Indeed, the youngest of them, what they call a polly, tried to seize a piece of my tail, but was prevented by the older and greedier ones. They seemed to think that I was not fat enough to be eaten, for they furnished me a variety of food. Among the things offered were bits of apple, a kind of sweet stone they called sugar, which was like very clean ice or hard snow, a dusty sort of dry stuff known to them as crackers, and a few very poor walnuts. Of course, I did not feel like eating but they would not leave me alone. They poked me with bits of stick until, seeing a good opportunity, I bit the young animal called a polly on the end of one of her soft claws. Then she wanted to hurt me, but a larger one of the animals, known as a papa, interfered and tied a soft white leaf around her claw probably so that she might not scratch me. By this time I heard a curious jingling sound, and I was soon left alone. This jingling sound was evidently of much importance to these curious creatures. I heard it always in the morning, at about midday and after dark, and whenever it was heard, the animals, big and little, would leave me for a time long enough to eat perhaps a dozen hickory nuts. Every part of the cage was comfortable and quiet, except one. That was a movable place into which I could crawl, but as soon as I was in it, it would slide from under my feet. But no sooner did I slide from one part than I found another beneath my feet. It was very curious. They called it a wheel. Except the continued staring and poking, nothing was done to me the first day. The queer creatures did not do any work, but rested most of the time on strange contrivances that seemed made of dead branches of trees. They chattered together now and then, but spent longer periods in gazing upon bundles of white leaves, which they turned over, examining each leaf carefully. I made up my mind they were looking for some small insect among these leaves. I wondered whether they liked to stay shut up in their hollow homes, for they could get out into the woods if they chose. Their homes are not unpleasant in the daytime, but at night there was a great slamming and banging. The lights were suddenly taken away, just as the moonlight ends when a black cloud goes over the moon, and the whole place in which they lived became dark. Then how I suffered. The air became very heavy and close. I could not sleep. The hole in which these queer animals sleep was terribly warm and oppressive, and I longed to be in the woods again. When the light returned, the jingling sound was repeated, the papa and the polly and the rest entered the big hollow where I was and repeated a form of words until I was able to remember it. They said, Good morning, papa. Good morning, polly. And then went out of the hollow.
After another long time, a third one of them came in and looked very pleasantly at me. The Polly and the Papa came and stood looking in too. Then the larger one said some words to the others and repeated something like, Let him go. The Polly said, I mama. The other said again, let him go. Then the cage was picked up and carried out of the hollow and into the field where they lived. Next, the Polly worked over one side of the cage until she had made an opening in it. Strange to say, none of them seemed to notice this opening. <laughs> and, of course, I did not call their attention to the oversight. Laughter. I waited until the Polly had run away to where the other creatures stood. And then I made a quick jump through the opening, and away I went. It did not take me long, I promise you, to make my way back to the woods. And since my return... I have lived among you as usual. My observations while in captivity may be summed up as follows. I should advise you to avoid entering any of those peculiar square hollow logs known as traps, as it is much easier to enter them than to escape from them. I am sure few would be clever enough to escape as I did. If you should be so unfortunate as to find yourself in a cage, which, you remember, is made of hard grey twigs, bite the soft claws of the creatures who poke you. Do not eat the strange foods known as crackers or candy, as they do not agree with any but men. Large men are known as the Papa, or Oh Papa, and the smaller ones as Polly or Bobby. The worst kind, I believe, is the Bobby, and the best and kindest seems to be the I Mama. These curious creatures all have a means of putting out the stars and moon at night and prefer to sleep in very hot and bad air. They also run away somewhere whenever they hear a jingle, which happens three times a day. I thank you for your attention, and hope to be in my usual health soon. After a vote of thanks, the meeting adjourned. Much impressed by the boldness and learning of Professor Chipmunk. End of chapter 14. Recording by The Story Girl. Chapter 15 of Imagine Ocean's Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Paul 90. Imagine Ocean's Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 15. The Satchel. I was just graduated from college when I received a letter from my Uncle Ralph, which surprised me very much as I had never known him except by name. I had always been told by my mother that he was very eccentric, and certainly the letter was queer, for it read, Nephew Dick, if that's your name, I want an assistant in my laboratory. I will pay you well. Answer at once. Uncle Ralph. I was puzzled what to say in reply. I had no profession in view and didn't like to throw away what might be a good chance. I talked it over with my mother, and she said she thought it would be worth trying and could certainly do no harm. So not to be outdone in brevity, I answered, Dear Uncle Ralph, if terms suit, I'll try. Your nephew, Dick. I think he was pleased with the answer, for he received me very cordially, though he didn't say much. My salary was quickly and satisfactorily settled, and I took a room near my uncle's house and began my work. 
At first I had so much to learn that I couldn't have earned my salt, but before very long I began to see my way clearly, and I really think I made myself useful. Still, I could not be sure. Strangely enough, I never could tell what my uncle was trying to accomplish. I made many mixtures of chemicals, prepared all sorts of apparatus, but was never allowed to see what my uncle was about. Whenever I had prepared any materials, he would carry them off into a little private room of which he always kept the key upon his watch chain. No one was allowed to enter this room, and I soon learned that it was wisest to say nothing concerning it. Not being inquisitive, I did not pry into the mystery, but did whatever I was told to do without asking any questions. As time went on, I could see that my uncle was becoming very nervous and irritable over his work. Always a silent man, he now seldom spoke a word. One day he sent me to buy some chemicals, giving me a list which he had written out for me. Upon examining the list I found that the articles would make a large package, so I picked up my little travelling bag and started out. Some of the substances required were rare, and I was obliged to ask at a number of places before I succeeded in finding them, and it was dusk when I reached the house. I heard my uncle calling me as I came in, and found him very impatient. Did you get them all? he asked as soon as he saw me. Yes, after some trouble, I replied. Where are they? he inquired. Here, I said, and I handed him the bag. He took it without a word, and immediately retired into his private room. During his absence, I busied myself in the laboratory in putting everything in order. I worked away for a long while, how long I cannot exactly tell, when suddenly I heard an explosion in my uncle's little room, followed by a cry. I rushed to the door and knocked. What is it? he growled. What is the matter? I cried. Nothing, don't be foolish, said my uncle. Nothing can hurt me. I went back to the laboratory, and having nothing further to do, sat down to wait for his coming. Again came the explosion, followed by the same cry. I started up, and before I thought, I cried aloud, You're not hurt, are you? The door opened suddenly, and my uncle came out looking very much excited. Dick, said he, go home. Here is your bag. I shan't need your help tonight. I took what I thought was my bag, and went home to my room. When I lighted my student lamp, I saw that instead of my travelling bag, my uncle had given me an old, dusty, wrinkled, and battered leather satchel, which looked as though it might be a century old. I laughed and tried to open it. It was locked. After puzzling over the lock until I was tired, I opened my closet door and flung the satchel upon the highest shelf. Tomorrow, said I, I'll exchange it for my own bag. I am afraid Uncle Ralph's treatment was beginning to affect my temper. I didn't like the way he had treated me that night. Then he hadn't paid me my salary for a long time, and my bills were coming in faster than I could pay them. It is very discouraging to do other men's work, especially when you are not allowed to see the results of your labour, and I had worked some months without a single hint of what I was about. I began to believe I had made a mistake. What good would it do me to work away in the dark learning little or nothing and without hope of doing better? My uncle would tell me nothing, and was provoked by being even questioned. I became very much discouraged over my prospects, and wondered whether I ought not to confess I had made a mistake and to begin the study of some regular profession. How long I sat thinking I cannot tell, but I was aroused by the faint flicker of my lamp as it went out, leaving me in perfect darkness. As I groped about my room looking for matches, I heard a rustling which seemed to come from the other side of the room. Then came tiny knockings, irregularly, and muffled shouting as though far away. By listening more intently, I heard the sounds plainly enough to distinguish the squeaking of mice and... Could I be mistaken? A scream. Very faint, it is true, but still a scream of fright. Ah, said I to myself. There must be mice in the closet. But what can the scream be? I went to the closet, and opening the door was amazed to see that the upper part was faintly lighted, as though by a big firefly. Puzzled at this, I brought a chair, and climbing upon it saw a grand battle. Upon one end of the shelf was a flying host of mice. How they scurried away! Some jumped to the floor, some seemed to merely vanish, and they were gone. While smiling at their panic, what was my surprise to hear from the other end of the shelf someone addressing me in a piping little voice? Eh? I exclaimed. Did anyone speak? I had the honour, 
the voice replied. Turning, I saw upon the shelf a diminutive figure carrying a little lantern in one hand and something like a needle in the other. Before I could recover from my astonishment, and not before I had been asked sarcastically whether I should know him the next time we met, the little man went on, This is a pretty way to treat me, isn't it? What in the world? What does this mean? I blundered out. Well, I like that, replied the pygmy in a scornful tone. Asking what this means? After having kept me shut up in that old leather satchel for over two thousand years? Why, I should have been starved before long. My provisions were almost gone, I can tell you. Perhaps you think I'm not hungry now. Oh, no, of course not. And you want to know what this means? Here he burst out laughing so loudly that I plainly heard it. I, I should be glad to do anything in my power to aid you, I began, wishing to do my best to pacify the little fellow. But as for having kept you shut up for twenty centuries, why, my dear fellow, that's simply absurd, for I'm only twenty-three years old now. Oh, see here, he answered scornfully. That's a little more than I can stand. You've played the innocent game long enough, you can't fool me that way again. Why, I suppose you will deny that your name is Trancastro next? And he hopped up and down in a rage. Tran which? Tran what? I began. That's right, that's right, cried the little imp in a perfect fury. Go on, deny everything! See here, I cried, now out of patience with this folly. I don't know anything about you, or your Tran, what you may call him. And if you hadn't kicked up such a racket in my closet, I never would have come near you. I wish I hadn't, and then the mice would have finished you. And a good riddance. As I paused for breath, the little man held his lantern as near my face as possible, and after a long, earnest look, said with great gravity and deliberation, I think I must have made a mistake. Then turning suddenly, he gave a great skip and shouted out, And then, I'm free! Certainly you are so far as I'm concerned, I replied carelessly, but I can't imagine what all this fuss is about. So long as you are pleased, I suppose I must be satisfied. Meanwhile, he had continued to jump and whirl about until he dropped his lantern and it went out, leaving us in the dark. Then he calmed down enough to say, What can you know about it? You only twenty-three years old? He chuckled as though this were a great joke at my expense, and went on, If you will offer me a chair and something to eat, I'll tell you the whole story. So I stepped down from the chair, lighted my student lamp, and offered my little guest my hand. Into it he climbed, and I deposited him upon the table under the light where I could see him plainly. He was about six inches in height and dressed in what seemed to be mouse skin. He wore a little belt and a helmet the size of a thimble. His face was unwrinkled, but intelligent enough for any age. Seeing he was unwilling to be stared at, I broke the silence by saying, I'm sorry I cannot offer you a chair, but mine are too large, I'm afraid. I thought he might be hurt by the hint. Not at all, he replied politely, now that he had convinced himself that I was not that awful trans somebody. See here. He beckoned to my favourite easy chair. At once it rose gently into the air, and dwindling down to a size suitable for the little wretch, dropped softly down upon the table beside him. Ignoring my exclamations, he seated himself comfortably within it, and looking up at me said as though nothing had happened, I said I would tell you all about it, didn't I? Yes, I answered, leaning eagerly forward. Well, I'll not, said he bluntly. You'll not? And why not? I asked. Oh, said he, calmly crossing his little legs. You couldn't understand it. Perhaps I could, I replied, smiling indulgently. Just try me. Do you know what Danax is? He asked, apparently hoping that I might. No, I can't say I do, exactly, I confessed unwillingly. Then of course you couldn't understand it, for that's the very beginning of it. But no matter, let's change the subject. Is there anything I can do for you in return for your hospitality to a hungry guest? I beg your pardon, I quite forgot. And I rang the bell. When the servant came, I ordered supper for two. This strange order caused the servant to gaze in silent astonishment. I repeated the order, however, and she hurried away without asking any questions. 
Returning, she placed the supper upon the table, without seeing the frantic retreat of the little man as she approached the table with the heavy tray. "'What an awkward blockhead!' exclaimed the angry little fellow. I made no answer. Being puzzled over the proper way to ask my small friend to eat with a knife and fork larger than himself, but as I hesitated, the mysterious beckoning process again took place, and one half of the contents of the tray diminished to a size convenient for his use. He ate almost greedily like a starving man. I watched him in silent wonder until he seemed to be satisfied. Then, pushing back his chair, he said gratefully, A very nice supper. I should like to return your kindness in some way. You little know what a service you have done me in releasing me from that cruel trancast. Here he broke off suddenly, and remained in a brown study. He seemed so melancholy that I interrupted his thoughts by asking, And what could you do for me? He brightened up again as I spoke, and answered, Who can tell? What are your troubles? Well, said I thoughtfully, I haven't many, but I should like the advice of someone older and wiser than I am. I shall not say how wise I may be, said the little man soberly. But perhaps having lived forty centuries, I may be old enough to advise a young man of twenty-three. I looked up, expecting to see him smiling, but he was as sober as a judge. So I told him all about my uncle and my work, and concluded by asking him what he thought I ought to do. He seemed intensely interested, and remained silent some moments after I'd finished. I waited more anxiously for his opinion than I should have liked to admit. At length he said solemnly, Bring your uncle to me. Bring, I repeated in amazement, Bring my... Bring your uncle to me, he repeated firmly, and so solemnly that I never thought of resisting. Oh, very well, I said hastily, but how in the world am I to do it? Easily enough, he explained. Write him a note. But what shall I say? I asked helplessly. You said he was interested in chemistry? asked the strange little fellow. I believe he cares for nothing else, I replied. Very well. Now write this. I have made a discovery tonight such as you have never dreamed of. Come at once. That will bring him, said my guest. Why I was so easily bullied by the mannequin I cannot tell, but I wrote the note and sent it at once. Now, resumed my little guest, what else can I do for you? Nothing, I replied, laughing, unless you'll pay my bills for me. With pleasure, he answered gravely. Let me see them. I brought the bills, and he went over them very carefully. Hmm, hmm, very good, he said when he had finished his examination. You have not been very extravagant. I'll reduce them for you. He began beckoning, as he had beckoned to the chair in the tea tray, and I smiled expecting to see the papers grow smaller and smaller. But when he stopped I could see no change, although he seated himself as though well satisfied. As he said nothing, I finally ventured to say, Well? Well? He replied. Look at your bills. I picked them up and was astonished to see that the amounts had dwindled from dollars to cents, until each bill was for only a hundredth part of what it had been. But that is nonsense, I said, looking up angrily. I'm not a baby, what good will that do? You're only twenty-three, he said doubtfully. And smiling as a knock was heard at the door, he made me a sign to open it. I did so, and there stood my tailor, Mr. Mulet. I frowned, for I owed him more than a hundred dollars. But he smiled politely, saying, Could you oblige me with that dollar or two, Yomi? I need a little change tonight. I stared at him in wonder, but thinking it wise to ask no questions, I took his bill from the pile on the table and handed it to him. He read it aloud. One dollar and fourteen cents. I counted out the money. He receipted the bill and left me seeming perfectly contented. I dropped into a chair too much puzzled to say a word. Just then the door banged open wide, and in came my uncle, puffing and blowing with the exertion of climbing the stairs. Well, on what fool's errand have you brought me here? he began. But suddenly I heard a shriek from the pygmy on the table. As I turned, he began beckoning. Beckoning. Beckoning as if he were frantic. I turned to look at my uncle. He was gone. 
Then I turned again to the little man on the table. What a sight met my eyes! There stood upon the table the miniature image of my uncle, staring with wide open eyes at the little figure of my guest. For a moment they glared at each other, and then, before I could interfere, they were fighting for their lives. It was over in a second. My uncle was too old and feeble to be a match for the wiry little warrior in leather. As they separated, my uncle seemed to be wounded, for he staggered an instant and then fell backward, staining the cloth like an overturned bottle of red ink. You scoundrel! I cried, starting forward in anger. What have you done? For a moment, the little fellow had no breath to answer. He panted helplessly, and at length gasped out, It is but justice! It is Trancastro! Trancastro! I exclaimed. That was my uncle! Explain, I cannot understand! Do you know what an axe is? He asked as he wiped his sword on a napkin. No! I shouted. Then you couldn't understand! he said, mournfully shaking his head. Enraged by his answer, I rushed for the table, but before I could reach them, my uncle struggled to his feet and resumed the conflict, using his umbrella most valiantly. I paused a moment, hoping he might yet conquer. But the fight was too unequal. By a skilful twist of his opponent's wrist, my uncle's umbrella was sent flying out of his hand. Being disarmed, he sank upon one knee and begged for mercy. Drink us! cried the victor. You deserve no better fate than the cruel death you meant for me! Oh, have mercy! cried my uncle. Mercy? repeated the mannequin in a cruel tone. And did you have mercy, Trancastro, when I hung for so many weary years in your cage dungeon beneath the floating castle of Volatana? Did you have mercy, I say, when the black cat broke through the ice wall and the witch changed me to a frozen mastodon? No! And where is the Princess of the Rosy Flame? Where is the Emerald of Falconda? My uncle hung his head and attempted no reply. Come! repeated the stranger. I have waited for this meeting for centuries! Draw and defend yourself! I have only an umbrella! my uncle objected. Then draw your umbrella! was the relentless reply. As the little fellow advanced with sword on guard, I recovered from my feeling that this incident was a mere puppet show. My uncle was about to be slain before my eyes. I could not stand this. The honour of the family forbade me to remain neutral. I rushed to the table crying, Here, here, this has gone quite far enough! Again the beckoning. I became, in a moment, a third pygmy upon my own table. Now, exclaimed the triumphant warrior, we are upon equal terms. Come on! I had no weapon. I dared not interfere. While I stood hesitating, the little tyrant made a slipknot from one of my curtain cords, threw the noose over my uncle's neck, and rose into the air, dragging his victim after him. I heard a breaking of glass, and regaining my natural size in a moment, rushed to the window, only to see them flying away. All that remained to convince me that I could not be mistaken was the stain upon the cloth, the little armchair, and the miniature supper. I searched the room, but found nothing. Until now I have never told the story, for who would have credited it? But anyone who believes my story, and would like to see what remains of Trancastro and his victim, has only to open the battered little satchel, and there can still be seen the little chair, the little knife and fork, and all the relics left by my guest. No unbeliever shall ever see them. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of Imagine Oceans Truthless Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Paul 90. Imagine Oceans Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 16 Good Neighbours. We once had a family of giants for neighbours. 
Not museum giants, I mean real giants. I never asked just how big they were, but you can judge for yourself after I've told you about them. Perhaps I wouldn't have taken the house if I had known that the giants lived so nearby, for I didn't know much about such people then. But I didn't discover that their house was next ours until I had made the bargain with the agent. I had asked him all about everything I could think of, all about stationary wash tubs, malaria, mosquitoes, the milkman, the iceman, the letterman, and all the other kinds of men, but I never thought to ask about giants. No man, however prudent, can think of everything. But as I was shutting the front gate, after I had said I would take the house for a year, I saw a footprint in the road. The footprint that Robinson Crusoe saw surprised him, but even Crusoe didn't see such a footprint as this, for it was nearly as big as a boat. What's that? I asked the agent. What? Where? He asked as uneasily as if I'd discovered water in the cellar or a leak in the roof. That there! I answered, pointing to the footprint. Oh, that! He answered. That must be the footprint of Mr. Megalopod. It seems to cover considerable space, I suggested. Yes, he admitted. Even an agent couldn't deny that. He's a giant. Didn't I mention that you would have a giant for a neighbour? I thought I spoke of it. No, I said. You didn't speak of it. You said that it was a pleasant neighbourhood. Perhaps that is what you had in mind? Possibly, he answered. You have no objection to giants, have you? I paused a moment before I replied. It depended on the kind of giant. If it was one of the blunderbore kind, even a football player might have been forgiven a slight preference for ordinary-sized neighbours. Well, I said at last, I don't profess to be a hop of my thumb or Jack the Giant Killer. What sort of a giant is Mr. Megalopod? The very best, the agent said. We did think of asking more rent for this house because of the entertainment children would find in seeing a giant or two every day, but we decided we wouldn't charge for it after all. Mr. Megalopod is a thorough gentleman, and so are the rest of the family. Mrs. Megalopod and the children are charming in every way. You will be glad to know them, I'm sure. Good day. The agent left me gazing at the footprint. He had other business in the town, and I had to take an early train for the city. I thought that my wife and children would be uneasy about the giants, but I was greatly mistaken. They were eager to see the family and could hardly wait to be properly moved. My son and daughter began to put on airs over their playfellows and to promise their best friends that they might have the first chance to come out and see the giant family. When we first moved, the megalopods were absent from their house, and it was several days before they returned. They lived in the suburbs on purpose to avoid observation, and usually went about their journeys by night so as to attract as little attention as possible. The first time I saw Mr. Megalopod was on a Monday morning. I don't know why it is, but I'm more likely to be late on Monday morning than on any other day of the week, and I was late that morning. In fact, I should have missed my train for the city if it had not been for Mr. Megalopod. My way to the station passed near to his enormous house. I walked just as fast as I could, and if I had been a few years younger, I would have run. Just as I came opposite to the giant's gateway, I took out my watch. I found I had just seven minutes in which to catch the train. Now, although the advertisement said our house was only three minutes' walk from the station, it didn't occur to me until afterward that the agent probably meant it was three minutes' walk for Mr. Megalopod. It certainly was a good ten minutes' scramble for me. So as I looked at my watch, I said aloud, Too late, I've lost the train! I wouldn't have missed it for a hundred dollars! Excuse me! I heard a tremendous voice apparently coming from the clouds. If you'll allow me, I will put you on the train. Before I could say a word, I was picked up and raised some thirty or forty feet into the air and held safely and comfortably in the giant's great hand. Then Mr. Megalopod started for the station. You're Mr. Megalopod, I presume? I said. What? he said. Uh, you see, I can't hear you. Here's a speaking trumpet. So saying, he took a great fireman's trumpet from his vest pocket and offered it to me with his other hand. I repeated my remark through the trumpet at the top of my lungs. Yes, he said. You're our new neighbour, no doubt. I am, I shouted. And I'm very glad to make your acquaintance. You're not afraid of me, he asked with a smile. Not at all, I yelled back. That's pleasant, he said with much satisfaction. 
The last people moved away because they were afraid I might step on their children. It's absurd, I never step on children. I wouldn't do such a thing. Of course not, I shouted. No, it would be an accident if I stepped on anything. You yourself might step on an ant or beetle, you know, but I am very careful. Well, here you are at the station. And he put me gently on the platform. I seldom go to the city myself, and when I do, I walk. Good day. Goodbye, I said. And I'm much obliged to you for the little lift. Don't mention it, he said. I like to be neighbourly. Any time you're in a hurry, let me know. Thank you, I replied. I'll do as much for you in some other way. Goodbye. Pardon me, said Mr. Megalopod. But could you give me back the trumpet? You won't need it in the city, unless you're a fireman, of course. It was mere absence of mind, I called through the trumpet. And then I gave it back to him, and watched him take the two or three steps that brought him to the turn in the road. A big fellow, isn't he? I said to the station agent. Yes, he said. He's a fortune to the express company. Every time he has a pair of boots sent home, it takes nearly a freight car. The arrival of the train ended our conversation. I didn't see the Megalopods again for several days. My family did and told me many interesting things about them. They seemed to be very pleasant neighbours. Their children met ours once or twice while playing, and they became excellent friends. Before long, they came to call upon us. We used to sit on the lawn, on chairs of course, Saturday afternoon and during the summer evenings. They came on Saturday. We received them cordially, but hardly knew how to ask them to sit down. They talked pleasantly about the neighbourhood, and spoke especially of the beautiful view. You surprise me, I said. It seems to me that we're too much shut in here by the trees. I forgot, said Mrs. Megalopod, laughing. We can see over the trees. That is a great advantage, answered my wife through Mrs. Megalopod's trumpet for both giants were thoughtful enough to carry these aids to conversation. Oh yes, replied the giantess. Size has advantages. But on the other hand, it brings inconveniences. You can hardly imagine. Now take such a thing as next Monday's washing, for instance. I have to do all our washing. Even if we could afford to pay a laundress, she wouldn't be able to manage our clothes, not to speak of our tablecloths and other larger pieces. Then for a clothesline, nothing will serve us but a ship's cable. Then, too, everything we have must be made to order. It is hard to get along with so large a family. Sometimes I'm tempted to let John go into a museum, but so far we have succeeded in keeping the museum manager from the door. What is your business? I shouted to Mr. Megalopod. Suspension bridges, he replied. It pays well whenever I can get work, but they don't build bridges every day in the week. I wish they would. And he laughed till the windows rattled in the house nearby. Careful, John, said Mrs. Megalopod warningly. Then turning to my wife, she remarked, John forgets sometimes that his laughing is dangerous. He was in an office building one day in the great lower story, one of the few buildings that has a door large enough to let him in. Someone told a funny story and he began to laugh. It cost him several hundred dollars to repair the windows, so I have to remind him to be cautious when he hears a really good joke. Here my son Harry asked me to lend him the trumpet for a minute. Mr. Megalopod, he called, would you mind doing me a great favour? Not at all, if it's large enough, Mr. Megalopod replied very politely. Then will you get my ball for me? It went up on the roof the other day and it is in the gutter now. Quick, give me the trumpet, I said to Harry as Mr. Megalopod rose. Then I shouted, I, I beg you won't put yourself out for such a trifle. But he was out of hearing before I had finished. He soon returned with the ball and gave it to Harry. Lend me the trumpet, Papa, said Harry. I'm much obliged to you, he shouted. Don't mention it, said the giant, seating himself. I forgot to mention that while we were deciding what to give them to sit upon, we had thought of their sitting upon the top of the piazza, but were afraid it would break down with them. Mr. Megalopod had opened out a sort of walking stick he carried and made it into a very comfortable stool while his wife had a similar portable chair. They were always thoughtful and considerate, as indeed I might have known from their speaking trumpets. Do you suppose if you were a giant you would remember to carry a speaking trumpet for the use of other people? It is such little traits as these that endear giants to their friends.
It is not hard to carry a speaking trumpet in your vest pocket, but it is the remembering to do so that shows the big-hearted giant. Soon after they had made their call upon us, my wife told me one morning, while I was shaving, that we ought to return the call soon. Of course, I said, stropping my razor slowly and thoughtfully. Of course, I had meant to go very soon. Very soon. I had meant to go several days ago. Yes, I know, said my wife. But when shall we go? Tomorrow? Well, I said between strokes of the razor. You see, tomorrow is... Saturday, and as it is, here I stopped the razor, the only holiday I have during the week, I hardly like to give it up to make a call. Yes, dear, she replied, but it is the only time we have when we can go together. Well, married men are not required to make calls, I said. I suppose I can leave our cards, she said. Yes, I answered eagerly. That will do perfectly well. My wife did not seem pleased, but she said no more then, and I finished my shaving. I wasn't cut but once. So my wife left our cards. When I next met Mr. Megalopod, it was about two weeks later. He did not return my bow, and apparently did not see me. I went and pulled his shoestring to attract his attention. He was pruning the top of a great chestnut tree that stood in his front yard. He handed me the trumpet, but did not show in any other way that he had noticed my presence. Mr. Meglopod, I said, is there any trouble at your house? Oh, no, he answered shortly and stiffly. You didn't return my bow, I said in what I meant to be a tone of reproach, but it is very hard to put reproachful inflections into your voice when you are trying to shout loud enough to impress a giant. No, he said slowly, I didn't know that you cared to keep up our acquaintance. If you didn't, I preferred not to force myself upon you. Why, you must be labouring under a mistake, I called back. What have we done to offend you? I was anxious to know, for I didn't like to think of there being any unpleasantness between ourselves and the giants. I usually overlook trifles, said Mr. Megalopod, but when you didn't return our call, I thought you meant that you didn't care to continue the acquaintance. My dear sir, I said hastily, my wife left cards. Oh, did she? said the giant pleasantly. Then I suppose Mrs. Megalopod didn't notice them. They were put into the cart tray, no doubt, and she must have failed to see them. No doubt that's it, I said. They were only the usual size. I hope you will believe that it was only an accident. Certainly, he said. I had forgotten that you're not used to our ways. Our friends usually have cards written for them by sign painters on sheets of Bristol board. We are so apt to lose the little cards. I see, I replied. Shortly afterward, my wife and I went to call upon the Megalopods. I cannot pretend to describe all the curious things in their house. When we rang the bell, the lower bell, for there was one for ordinary-sized people, we nearly fell down the steps. There came the peal of an enormous gong as big as those you find in great terminal railroad stations. When the door opened, it seemed as if the side of a house had suddenly given way. The pattern on the hall carpet showed roses four or five feet wide, and the hat stand was so high that we never saw it at all. We walked under a hall chair and thought its legs were pillars. Just as we entered the reception room, we heard a terrible shout, Oh, look out! And a great worsted ball, some four feet in diameter, almost rolled over us. The megalopod baby had thrown it to one of his brothers. It was a narrow escape. The brother picked up the baby to carry him away. Oh, don't take the sweet little thing, my wife began. But she stopped there, for the sweet little thing was as large as two or three ordinary men. Excuse me, ma'am, said the boy, but we can't trust baby with visitors. He puts everything into his mouth and... My wife cheerfully consented that the megalopod baby should be taken to the nursery during our call. Mrs. Megalopod offered us two tiny chairs. They were evidently part of the children's playthings. If you would rather sit in one of our chairs, she suggested, I shall be glad to assist you to one, but I would rather not. To tell the truth, she added with some confusion, one of our visitors once fell from a footstool and broke his leg. Since then I have preferred they should take these. We took the small chairs. As it was dusk, Mrs. Megalopod struck a match to light the gas. It was a giant's parlour match, and the noise and burst of flame was like an explosion. 
My wife clutched my arm in terror for a moment, while Mrs. Megalopod begged our pardon and blamed herself for her thoughtlessness. We had a very pleasant call, and the good relations between the families were entirely restored. In fact, as we were leaving, Mrs. Megalopod promised to send my wife a cake made by herself. It came later and was brought by the Megalopod boy. By cutting it into quarters, we got it through the front door without breaking off more than five or six lumps of a pound or two each. As it was a plum cake, it kept well. I think there's nearly a barrel full of it left yet, but we reserve it for visitors, as we got tired of plum cake after a year or so. The megalopods were always kind neighbours. Once they did us a great service. There was a farmer who lived in the valley near us, and he owned a very cross bull. One day the bull broke his chain and came charging up the road just as my little boy was on his way to school. I don't know what would have been the result if the megalopod baby, then a well-grown child of about twenty-five feet, had not come toddling down the road. The bull was pursuing my boy, who was running for his life. The baby giant had on red stockings, and these attracted the bull's attention. He charged on the baby and tried to toss his shoes. This amused the child considerably, and he laughed at the bull's antics as an ordinary baby might laugh at the snarling and bitings of a toothless puppy. I take you home, he said, and picking up the angry bull, he toddled off down the road. My boy came home much frightened, but almost as much amused. I learned afterward that Mr. Megalopod carried the bull back to the farmer and gave the man a severe talking to. But we felt grateful, and so we decided to ask Mr. and Mrs. Megalopod to dinner. It meant a great deal, as you will see. But as we had just come into a large legacy from an estate that had been in litigation for many years, we took pleasure in showing our gratitude and our goodwill towards the family. First, we had a large and elegant teething ring made to order for the baby. It was a foot through and several feet in diameter. The baby enjoyed it very much, and was somewhat consoled for the loss of the bull which he had wished to keep as a pet. I hired the sign painter in a village not far away to write out the invitation for us upon the largest sheet of cardboard I could get in the city. It was ten feet by fifteen in size, and when inscribed looked truly hospitable. It read as usual, requesting the presence of Mr. and Mrs. Megalopod at dinner on the 20th. We had to send it by express. The expressman wanted us to roll it, but I didn't think it would be just the thing, so it was sent flat in an envelope made especially for it. They sent an acceptance nearly as large, and were kind enough to send later an informal note saying that they would bring their own plates and knives and forks, and so on. How thoughtful of them, said my wife, who had been somewhat puzzled about how to set the table. I had told the butler and other tradesmen about the dinner, and they were to furnish ample provision. I had expected that they would be delighted to get the large orders, but one of them explained to me that, after all, it made no great difference. For said he. If they'd stayed at home, they would have ordered the same things nearly anyway. But it was different with the confectioner. I ordered 40 gallons of ice cream, 2,000 macaroons, and 80 pounds of the best mixed candies. It's for a large picnic, he suggested. The largest kind, I replied, for we were, of course, to dine in the open air. In order to provide against rain, I hired a second-hand circus tent and had it set up in our front yard, where the table had already been constructed by a force of carpenters. By stooping as they came in and seating themselves near the centre, our guests were not uncomfortable in the tent. My wife and I had a smaller table and chairs set upon the large table, and though we did not feel altogether comfortable sitting with our feet on the tablecloth, we did not quite see how to avoid it. The first course was much enjoyed, except that Mr. Megalopod was so unlucky as to upset his soup, served in a silver-plated metal plate, and run the risk of drowning us. Mrs. Megalopod, however, was adroit enough to catch us up before the inundation overwhelmed us. The giant apologised profusely, and we insisted that it was of no consequence. When we came to the turkeys, which Mrs. Megalopod said were dainty little birds, I was afraid Mr. Megalopod was not hungry, for he could not finish the two dozen, but he explained that he seldom ate birds, as he preferred oxen. In the next course, I found that Mr. Megalopod was looking for the salt. I handed him the salt cellar, but it was too small for him to hold. Have you any rock salt? he asked with frankness. I can never taste the fine salt. Luckily, we had bought a large quantity of the coarsest salt for making ice cream, 
and I had several boxes brought and sent up from the ground on an elevator. The waiter, frightened half out of his wits, set the boxes as close to the giant as he dared, and tried hard not to run when moving away. Strangely enough, the only thing that ran short was the water. It wouldn't run fast enough to give the giant a full drink of water. He was very polite about it, but the rock salt had made him thirsty. At last I sent down to the Megalopod's house, and hired the giant's boy to bring a pail, one of their pails, it was about eight feet high, full of spring water. So that little difficulty was pleasantly arranged. After the dinner was over, the giants went home saying that they had never passed a pleasanter afternoon. We were equally pleased, and my wife said that the most agreeable neighbours we had ever known were certainly Mr. and Mrs. Meglapod. There's nothing small about them, I said warmly, and they certainly take wide views of everything. Yes, she agreed. Even with our simple little dinner, they seemed immensely delighted. End of chapter 16、Chapter、17 Recording by Thomas Bosk. Imaginations. Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 17. Anthony and the Ancients. Anthony told me the story, after he came to know me well. He said I might write about it, but didn't care to have his real name given, so I have given him another name. Perhaps he dreamed it, but as I dislike stories that are only dreams, I won't say he did. It probably isn't a literal fact, but you can perhaps make it useful if you will seek for a sort of lesson in it. If you don't see any lesson in it, then the story doesn't apply to you. Here is the way he told it to me, as nearly as I can write it down. I went to the museum, and after looking at other departments, came late in the afternoon to the place where they had ancient pottery. I was looking at a case of old lamps when one of the attendants opened the cabinet door to put in a specimen. I knew him by sight, and he bowed. Then I spoke to him. I wish I knew how those lamps were used. Come into my room, and I'll show you, he answered pleasantly. So I went into his working room, and he took an ancient lamp from a shelf. He filled it with lard oil, I think, put a wick into the spout, he made a rude wick from a piece of twisted linen rag, and lighted it. The lamp gave a dim and flickering light. I wish I could see it in the dark, I said after a minute. All right, he said. Just take it into that storeroom. And he pointed to one of the doors. Shut the door, and you will find it as dark as Egypt. I took the lamp, shielded it from the air with my hand, went into the storeroom, and shut the door. It certainly was very dark in there, and the lamp gave hardly any light. As I sat in the gloom, I began to wish that I had lived in the days of the ancients. I thought to myself, How wonderful it would be if I could be transported back into the ages before any of the marvelous inventions of our day were known. How much I could tell them! I wish, I said to myself, that I could live in those times for a little while. As I spoke, I was gently rubbing the edge of the lamp. A blue flame sprang up from the wick. There was a muffled explosion, and the room seemed filled with a violet vapor. Then a voice seemed to come from the wreaths of vapor. And it said, Master of the lamp, I am here. You shall at once be obeyed. Before I could answer, the door opened, the vapor cleared away, and half dazed, I walked out into the light. For a few moments, I could not make out any of the objects around me. Gradually, my sight cleared, and I saw that I was out in the open air, and standing upon high ground overlooking a wooded valley through which wound a river. As I looked down wonderingly, I heard a rustling behind me at some distance. I turned and saw a gigantic elk coming towards me, brandishing a pair of horns that seemed ten feet wide from tip to tip. Then I knew that my wish had been granted, for I remembered to have read of the ancient Irish elk. I knew I was in the British Isles years before historic times. As I was coming to this conclusion, I was also making rapid progress toward the valley. I found that I was dressed in a short tunic of a dark blue color, and that my legs were covered by loose trousers bound tight with small twisted bands of cloth. Upon my feet were rough shoes of hide, 
My head was bare, and my hair was very long. I carried a club in one hand, and saw that it had a head of sharp stone. Why, I'm a regular savage, I said to myself laughingly. The elk had not pursued me far, and I soon dropped to a walk, and leisurely made my way into the valley. I came upon a settlement. It was a collection of huts, made, as I could see from an unfinished one, of willow rods covered with mud and turf. I looked curiously at them, and yet the scene was not unfamiliar to me. All through the time I was there, I seemed somehow to be both an ancient and a modern. Upon entering the road that ran near the groups of huts, I met a man dressed not unlike myself. "'Ah, Anton,' he said without the least surprise, "'you are back from the hill. Did you see the elk?' "'Yes,' I answered. He came after me. If I had had my gun with me, I would have shot him. He seemed puzzled by my answer, but only asked, Where was the elk? Upon the eastern hill, I replied. We will go and hunt him, said the man. We walked together toward one of the largest huts and entered it. There was a fire upon a block of stone in the middle of the floor, and the smoke drifted out through a hole in the center of the domed roof. Around the fire, sat the members of the chief's household, his wife and several children. The chief sat by the fire, fitting a spearhead of stone to a long pole. The wife was making a cord out of some soft bark. The children were playing with sticks and stones, and one of the girls had a rude doll. We did not talk English, of course, but I understood them, and they understood me. What language we used, I don't know. The chief questioned me about the elk, and I told him all I knew. Come, he said, and strode out of the hut, calling upon several other men to take part in the hunt. I went with them, out of curiosity. To my surprise, they had no other weapons than rude clubs with stone heads, and sharp sticks the ends of which had been hardened by charring and fire. They surrounded the elk and killed it, but not without a fierce struggle. Several of them were severely hurt by the sharp horns. On my way back to the village, I walked beside the chief. We fell into conversation, and I explained to him my astonishment at their rude clubs and spears. If you had a rifle, I said, you could shoot the elk without needing to go near him. A rifle? he inquired. What is that? I have heard of a queer weapon, made of a stick and a cord, and I believe that it can kill from a distance, but I do not know how it is made. You mean a bow and arrow, I said laughing. Why, they are nothing to a rifle. If I had a rifle, I could stand off further than a bow can send, and yet reach a man with ease. This sounds like magic, the chief said, cautiously drawing a little away from me. It is not magic, I answered. It is only that I know more than your people. But your beard is not yet to be seen, answered the chief, smiling indulgently as one might at a foolish child. I saw that sooner or later I must explain how I knew more than the men of his time and so I told him as much of my story as I thought he could understand. So you see, I said in conclusion, I am really one of your remote descendants. You tell a marvelous story, the chief declared, and if it be also a true one, you may be a great help to my people. Come to my hut, and I will talk with you of the things that should be done. If you can advise me well, you shall be my chief counselor, even before your beard grows. After we had eaten some of the meat of the elk, I went into the chief's hut, and he bade me sit down near the fire. The smoke was very thick. This is all wrong, I said. You should have a chimney. Then I explained to him how the hot air was light and would carry off the smoke through a chimney. It would be good, he replied, to have less smoke. But we could not take time to build such a contrivance as you speak of. Game so soon becomes scarce that we have to move our houses to a new place very often. We could not build those stone chimneys so often. Besides, there is no hole in the roof. If there is no hole in the roof, the hut would be dark. You must cut a hole in the side of the hut. It would be too cold at night, he answered. But we do not leave the hole open. We fill it with something hard, and like ice. We call it glass. And how can it be had? It is made, I said, of sand and of... of soda, I think. Sand I know, said the chief. 
But what is soda? Maybe it's potash, I suggested. I never heard of that either, said the chief, with a smile I didn't like. But what is it? Well, I said at last, rather shamefacedly, I'm not a glass worker. I don't know how to make it. I'm sorry. The chief said nothing, but looked at me with a faint smile. I thought it best to change the subject. Talking of guns, rifles, I said, it would be splendid if you had one. They are made of steel, which is hardened iron, you know, and then loaded with powder. A lead bullet is put over the powder, and then when the powder explodes, the bullet, or round piece of lead, is driven, oh, ever so far, a thousand paces. But I do not know these things, said the chief, and I noticed that he spoke soothingly, as one might to a child whose mind was disordered. You speak of iron, of steel, of lead, and of powder. What are they? It is hard for me to explain, I said, because you know so little. Iron is a hard substance, melted out of certain rocks. When that is treated in some way, it becomes steel. Lead is another substance of the same kind, but much softer. Can you show us how to find or to make these things? The old chief asked. We may be very ignorant, but we can learn. I was silent for a few moments. I had never seen any iron ore, and I had not the least idea how to get iron out of the rock, even if I had the ore. As for steel... I knew it had carbon in it, but how it was put in, or left in, I didn't know. To tell the truth, I replied, I don't know much about them myself, and as for gunpowder, I think it's made of charcoal. Good, broke in the chief. I know charcoal. And, and saltpeter, I believe. And something else, I went on weakly. But I don't know what saltpeter is, I'm sure. I don't see how we could do anything with the little you know, said the chief kindly. You tell me strange stories, but there seems to be nothing practical about your knowledge. I could not deny that he was right. I began to think over some of our modern improvements, and luckily thought of a candle, so I explained to him how candles were made of tallow, by dipping a string into the melted tallow. Nothing would satisfy him but an immediate trial. To my great triumph, I succeeded in making a tolerable candle out of some animal fat. The chief was delighted. That, said he, is a great invention. You indeed are fortunate people. We only have torches. But we don't use candles, I said. We have gas and kerosene lamps and the electric light. But I can't make any of those for you. I don't know where to find coal or oil or how to make electricity or an electric light. No matter, he said cheerfully. This is quite enough. I see there is some truth in your story. Tell me more of your marvels. Well, I said, we use the steam engine for traveling. We heat water over the fire, and a vapor or steam comes from it. And we let the steam go into a box, and it pushes a wheel around, and that pushes other wheels. That's the way we travel. Can you make a steam engine? No, I said. I'm afraid I don't quite understand it. Well, what else? the chief asked patiently. How do you tell time? I inquired. By the sun, he replied. Have you a better way? We have machines to tell time for us. Indeed, he said wonderingly. Yes, I said. There is a piece of metal coiled up, and that pushes around some wheels, and they push other wheels that move two flat pieces and make them point to marks that mean the hours. Do you know how they work? Not exactly, I said, though I have a general idea. We might find these hard substances you call metals, said the chief thoughtfully, for I have seen bits of hard substance come from the rocks of our fireplaces. But I fear you could not teach us to make these wonderful machines. I'm afraid I couldn't, I replied regretfully. There's one thing I want to ask you, the chief said eagerly, and that is about the tides. Sometimes the water is high, and then it is low. Do you know what makes the tides? Now that was a question I ought to have been able to answer. 
I knew it had something to do with the moon, and faint memories of the words perigee and apogee came into my mind. But so vague were my ideas that I couldn't make it clear to myself, and so I thought it wise to tell the plain truth. I said I didn't know. At times the sun turns black, said the chief. Why is that? The moon gets in front of it, I answered, glad of an opportunity to make any kind of a reply. But the moon isn't black, he said. No, but it looks so, I said. The moon has no light of her own. She looks bright only because the sun lights her. We know that, he said, for the light on the edge of the moon is always toward the sun. But how often does the sun turn black? I don't know, I was forced to confess. Why doesn't it happen oftener? This was worse than a school examination. I made up my mind to end it. Chief, I said, if I have not shown learning, at least I have learned my own ignorance. I am going to go back to my own time, if I can. And I think I can, for my wish was only to stay a while. And when I do get back there, I'm going to know some of those things you asked me about. I'm going to know them all through. Then, if I can, I'm going to come back and teach you many things. I wish you good fortune, said the chief. For this candle you have made us is a great thing, a great invention. Farewell, I said. Then I turned and climbed to the eastern hill, where I had seen the elk. Just as I came to the crest of the hill, a stone gave way beneath my feet, and I went tumbling, tumbling, tumbling down into the storeroom of the museum, where I woke up. I forgot all about you, said the voice of the museum attendant. You must have been asleep. I think so. I had a strange dream, I said. Then I looked at the lamp. It was broken. I've broken the lamp, I added. No matter, he replied. It is only one of a common kind. If it was Aladdin's lamp now, he smilingly suggested, it would be a matter of some importance. True enough, I answered. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Imagine Oceans Truthless Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Imagine Oceans Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks. A Yarn of Sailor Ben's. In the blue shadow of the life saving station sat Sailor Ben painting a toy boat. He ran a red stripe around the hull. That brightens her a bit, remarked Sailor Ben. I hope the little lad will like her. Anyhow, she's worth the half dollar. Every cent. That's gay, said a small boy in a sailor suit who just then came down the boardwalk from the hotel. She'll scoot along, won't she? Surely, answered Sailor Ben solemnly. She can't help herself. She's the model image of the speedy Susan. And that was the slickest little brig I ever see point four foot toward blue water. Was she wrecked? asked the boy. Of course she were, answered the old sailor. She were bound to be, always sailing smack up again all the coral reefs she could find. She was trading in the South Pacific, and she had a fancy for coral reefs. She couldn't keep clear of them. We hauled her off a matter of a dozen times, but it wasn't no sort of use. She made up her mind to be wrecked, and wrecked she were on the Tapioca Islands. Tapioca? the boy asked, smiling doubtfully. Tapioca is what we called them. It may have been tapiapioca or tapioca oka, but it don't signify. That ain't the point. The point is here. How did the cook and the bossin, that was me, get away from the cannibal savages? asked Sailor Ben, very impressively. You might read your Swiss family Crusoe forty times without coming within forty fathom of guessing that little riddle. Tell me about it, said the boy eagerly. Are you sure you can lie by while I'm telling it? I don't like to have you signaled for just as I get all sail drawing. I can wait for half an hour, the boy answered. They've all gone in bathing. Then put a stopper on that little chatterbox. Open both your hearing ports and... 
Don't believe all an old sailor tells you when he's a spinning yarns to a little landlubber, said Sailor Ben with a good-natured chuckle. Here's the way it goes. As I remarked in the start, the speedy Susan wrecked herself off the Tapiapioca Islands in the South Pacific. I was a green youngster then, but with the makings of a sailor about me. After the brig bumped coral and filled, she thought she'd make a call on Mr. Davy Jones. Not having been invited, I made up my mind to stay above water as long as I could. Come, says I to the cook. You and me ain't captains of this ungrateful craft. Our betters may go down in glory with the ship, but bossons and cooks can't be spared like officers, and swimming ashore is all we're good for. The cook was a level-headed kind of a darky. He made the best plum duff I ever see, and he says, All right, sir. So over we went like a couple of flying fish and come up like two porpoises. But it was a powerful stretch to swim, being a matter of forty mile or so, and I mistrust whether we mightn't a join Mr. D. Jones' party down below if it hadn't a been for the bossin, me, when I heard Snowball, the cook, mind you, puffin' Grandpa's fashion, I says to him, says I, Snowball, you sunburnt sea cook, float on your back, and I'll tow you a bit. So he did, and I grappled his wool and towed him as easy if he were the Lord Mayor of London in his carriage. When I began to puff like a steam tug, Snowball played horse for me while I lay basking like a lazy whale of Sunday. So we went. Bossin tug and cook, and cook repaying the compliment till we got in soundings. I'm not a going to describe the Tappy Appy Islands. You've got your geography, and you can read about them any time. The only thing that's peculiar about the islands you'll see as I get along with my facts. We come ashore in good shape, waterlogged, but sound in every timber, and chipper as marines in a cam. We had nothing but our togs to look after, and we sat there making observations on the weather and the good qualities of our late shipmates till we had drained off some. Then we begun to talk of exploring a bit. We hadn't fixed on a plan when something happened that knocked our plans into a cocked hat. Up come a lot of natives, rigged out in feathers and things, jabbering seventeen to the dozen, and maybe more. They surrounded us, and we hauled down our flags without firing a gun, which we hadn't any. They fitted us out with grass rope bracelets and tied us into two ship-shaped bits of cargo, shouldered us, and set sail inland, singing songs of triumph. Cook, says I, we're going in the interior. I'm afeard we be, he pipes up sorrowful enough, thinking I meant they was cannibals. Avast, says I. Men don't sing when they're hungry. And I was right. When they got us up to their town, they cast us loose and gave us free board and fair lodging, considering, for you wouldn't be wanting electric bells and bills of fare in such outlandish regions. Skipping the months when we was just getting acquainted with their ways, I'll get on to the adventure part. I'll say no more than that we lived in Clover till Cook he begun to be homesick. I didn't mind it myself. Cook, says I, it's a kind of copper-colored vacation when you look at it, right? Regular rations and nothing to do. It ain't like New Bedford, was all he'd say, and the same I couldn't deny. But I'd picked up their lingo till I could converse fair and free like a genteel tapiapiokin, passing the time of day with the best of them. But the cook was different. He had a wife and little kids at home, and there wasn't any way of hearing from them. He had been the darkest darky on the islands, but he faded to the shade of a chaplain's everyday coat at the end of a long cruise. I felt sorry for him. So one day, though I had an invitation to play Tenny Tenny Hop Hop, which, queerly enough, wasn't unlike tennis and hopscotch mixed up together, I politely begged off and piloted the cook down to the sad sea waves, as I once heard a sweet-singing young woman remark. Cookie, says I, you are most shocking pale and unsteady upon your pins. Are you land-sick? To tell their truth, sir, says he, piping his eye, 
I'm wanting powerful to get back to old New Bedford, and I don't see that these uncivilized colored persons are going to let us go. Well, cheer up, says I, for I've calculated a course that ought to fetch us clear. I made out a chart of my ID, and the black cook, he yah yahed till he reminded me of a fancy hyena that I once seen in a circus. But it was no wonder. The way of it was this. The chief of the tappy appy was going to give a big blowout, a regular plum duff and soft tawny spread, plenty of the best, and charge it to the steward. And he set great store by making a show for reasons that I happen to know. That's what made me think of my plan, and that's why the cook grinned. So back we went to find the chief. Tiffin, I called him, and I hailed him till he came out from his hut where he'd been palavering with his chief cook. Tiffin, says I, great chief of the Tappiappies, for these benighted heathen likes titles and has no idea of the glorious offhand ways of a republic like ours. You're going to give a noble eating match? True, Moonface, says he, for that's the name I went by, though I was more like a beat in the face than like the moon. I suppose you want things to go off in tip-top style, I went on as easy as you please. You know well, Moonface, says he, his complexion getting a shade darker, that my brother, the chief of the, er, er, Succotash Islands, that's where my memory's not what it should be, I don't rightly remember the geography name, is to dine with me, and he has far and away the champion cook of these parts. Three wars have we fit over that there cook. I don't recall mentioning the fact previously, I remarks, but Snowball here, he's the boss medicine man over a galley stove that I ever saw. That's the sense of what I said. In fact, he's the chief cook and first chop bottle washer of your pale brothers. Well, well, says the chief after a spell and looking at Snowball with interest. You do surprise me. Yes, siree, I went on, slapping the cook on the shoulder and most keeling him over. But to tell you the plain facts of the case, his heart pants for the land of his people. These savages delight in poetry talk, and I had picked it up along with their lingo. His neck is stretched with gazing towards the land of the free and the home of the brave. Of course, he never knew the words was a quotation from a popular ballad, and it moved him. It came so sudden. Still, he didn't give right in. He saw where I was a-steering, but didn't choose to let on. So at last I pretended to be a little hurt and huffy. All correct, says I. If Cook and me can't go home to my country, tis of thee, you shan't serve up your dusky friend the greatest food of the pale brothers. And I whistled Yankee Doodle slow and solemn, like a hymn tune. That was too much for him. If I might have plenty of this great pudding, I maybe would let you go, he says after a long think. But I'd like to taste a sample first. It's a go, I says, taking him up right off. Now the queer point about these islands was the fact that a humpin' big mountain rose right in the middle of the largest one. It was a played-out volcano, and the top of its peak was covered with real snow. That's what put the notion into my mind first off. That afternoon, me and the cook climbed that peak and fetched down baskets full of snow and chunks of ice. Then we cut two sections of bamboo, one as big as a water butt and the other not quite so big. There was plenty of salt along shore, and we toted some to the grove. The cook, he loaded his littler bamboo nearly to the muzzle with goat's milk and dumped in a couple of dozen of turtle eggs and sweetened the mess to taste with sugar cane juice. And then we fixed on a long bamboo pole the small cask inside, and round I went as if I was a capstan bar. Round and round and round and round. And round some more, till my back was breaking with it. But it froze stiff, and when we finished it out, it was a kind of uncivilized ice cream. The cook, he tasted it in the way of duty, but he looked worser than when he was homesickest. No thank ye, says I, when he offered me a dose. 
But don't look blue, Cookie. It'll go down with these heathens. You see if it don't. It did. You order of seen the chief smile when he got some. Why, his grin lit up the landscape. Moonface medicine man, says he, as he scraped the sides of the bamboo bowl we gave him. Your chill pudding is the finest thing I ever saw. Prepare a hundred calabashes for the chief of the Succotash Islands, and you shall go free. I will make him knock his head to the dust. It's a bargain, great chief, says I, and he marched back to his hut as proud as a new commodore on Sunday. You see, we were careful to give the chief a safe dose, and we fired the rest into the bushes. Well, just before the great day, we set a gang of natives to toting down snow and ice, cutting bamboo for freezers, crushing sugar cane, and gathering turtle eggs. We made enough of the awful stuff to sink an Indiaman, and left it packed in snow in a cool place in the woods. The day of the grand barbecue came. First, our chief, he put on a poor face and trotted out regular old played-out native dishes, bong bong and mawu tabu fried kush kush common dishes as a third-rate chief might have most any day i see the other chief's lip curling up till it most hid his snub nose with scorn and with pride in his own cook but our chief was just a leadin old succotash on foolin em you see then come the dessert our chief he remarks careless and easy i have a new dish royal brother if you will try it. Don't care if I do, says the other, as if not caring particular about it. Our chief, he whacked a gong, and in came a string of mahogany slaves proudly supporting fancy calabashes loaded with that outlandish ice cream. What, may I ask, is this? asks the royal guest, a trifle uneasy, mistrusting the other royal humbug was a saving his trumps for the last trick. Moon-faced chill puddin', says our chief, impressive and grand. It was set out, and, at the word of command, every noble guest dipped into his calabash. Words of mine can't describe it. I'd have to talk French to do it. It was like the finish of a tub race. When I saw them all a eatin' fast when they could, and a trying to warm their froze noses when they couldn't, I nudged Snowball on the sly. Cook, I whispers. We'll start now, I guess. Those fellers don't mean to stop as long as they can lift a spoon, and I'm afraid they'll overdo this thing. If we wait till dyspepsy sets in, we'll never see Hail Columbia any more. He saw the sense of my remark, and we got out and scooted. I hope they wouldn't eat more than human nature would stand, but when I thought of that mixture, my heart kind of rose in my throat. We didn't get away too early. Our dugout had a start, but we soon made out a war canoe putting after us. Can they overhaul us? I asked the cook. No, sir, he says, positive like and with a grin. You just wait till that poison get a fair chance. And by the time they got within hailing distance, most of the paddlers had keeled over one by one into the hold of their canoe. Then she came to a dead halt. It was just in time, too. For the chief, he stood up near the idol they had for a bow, waving his club, and his voice came faint over the water. If I catch you, you have to eat your own chill pudding. All my people are tumbled over with bad magic. I do, chief, I sings out. We was afraid you would eat too much. He bowled a war club at us, but he wasn't feeling strong, and then he keeled over. And that was the last of the tapiapiocas. Now, here's your boat, said Sailor Ben as he finished his story. Let her get good and dry, or you'll be getting your clothes mussed up with it. Thank you ever so much for the boat, and for the story, too, said the little boy as he took the new boat daintily by the masthead. I hope, said Sailor Ben, looking after his little friend and picking up his paint and brushes, that the little landlubber didn't believe all that nonsense. He seemed rather serious and solemn over it. End of chapter 18、Chapter、Nineteen of Imaginations Truthless Tales. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Story Girl. Imagine Oceans, Truthless Tales, by Tudor Jenks. The Statue. A traveler came to a certain great city, and as he entered through one of its wide gates, a passerby spoke to him. Welcome, sir, said the citizen. I saw by your dress that you were a stranger and make bold to accost you. Your welcome is most courteous, answered the traveler, and I thank you for it. You must not fail to see the statue in our marketplace, said the citizen. We take great pride in it, and for my part I consider myself fortunate in being one of the community that owns so fine a work of art and so grand a memorial. I shall certainly take pains to see it, answered the traveller, bowing to the citizen as he passed on. So when the traveller had made his way into the city, he paused for a moment, wondering in which direction the marketplace lay. As he stood in doubt, another citizen presented himself, hat in hand. "'You seem unfamiliar with our city,' said the newcomer politely. "'If you are seeking the marketplace, I can easily direct you to it.' You are right in your supposition, said the traveler. Naturally, said the citizen, smiling. All the world comes to see our great statue. I have pointed out the way to many. It would be strange if I did not know it, for it was I who proposed the setting up of the statue in the marketplace. I am fortunate enough to be one of the town council. My respects to you said the traveller, saluting him. "'Follow this straight course,' said the councilman, pointing. "'And ask again when you come to the open park.' Bidding the citizen good day, the traveller proceeded upon his way. Nor did he pause until he had come to the park. Then, as he had been instructed to do, he made further inquiry at the door of a little shop. "'Yes, indeed, I can tell you,' said the woman who came to the door. "'For it was my husband who designed the pedestal for it. "'John! Another stranger to see the statue!' "'In a moment,' said her husband from the back of the shop. "'How do you do, sir?' he asked as he greeted the traveller. "'Your face seems to me a familiar one.' Where have I seen you? Never been here before. Ah, I must have been mistaken. Uh, a chance resemblance, no doubt. <laughs> uh, turn to the right and follow this wall, and you will soon reach the statue for which I designed the pedestal, as the good people of this town will tell you. The traveler withdrew and walked leisurely along by the wall. At the first corner he met a working man, who was carving a bit of stonework on a fence post. A stranger, sir, inquired the workman as the traveller approached. To see the statue, no doubt? Yes, said the traveller. A good bit of work, and well worth your time. Many is the long day I have worked over it. I carved the block. I never did a better bit of work. Turn to the left. Uh, but wait, uh, here is a man who can show you the way. Henry. As he spoke, a man who was driving a heavy wagon drew up near the sidewalk. Can you show this gentleman the way to the statue? Can I? Well, you know well enough that I drew the statue to its place with this very horse and wagon. Come, my friend, follow me. Or better still, get up in my wagon and I'll take you there. You're lighter than that huge stone, I warrant. 
So the traveller mounted upon the wagon, and was soon at the marketplace, and stood before the statue itself. As he gazed up at it, another citizen addressed him. Admiring the statue, eh? Well, it's a noble bit of art, and a credit to the place. Every stranger says so. It seems well done, and well kept, replied the traveller quietly. Well kept? <laughs> to be sure it is well kept. Would the council of the town have me here if I didn't attend to my duty? Perhaps you don't know that I'm the custodian of this work of art. No? Well, I am. Yes, you see before you the statue keeper. That's a great responsibility. But there, there. The townspeople don't complain, so I suppose my work is not so badly done. Who is it? asked the traveller. Oh, I forget, said the man unconcernedly. Maybe I've heard the name, but I've forgotten it long since. The traveller thanked the fellow and gave him a silver coin. Then he departed from out the city. But as he went through the gate in the city wall, there was a boy playing marbles nearby, for now the school hours were over. And as the traveller passed him, the boy looked to see whose shadow fell upon the wall. And then the boy sprang to his feet and said, See! See! Tis he! The man whose statue stands in the marketplace! And so it was, but none else in the city knew anything beyond their stone image of the man. You were asleep and dreaming in the sun, the people said when the boy told his story. And as the traveler never came again, even the boy himself began, as he grew older, to think it was a dream. So real seemed the statue compared to his faint memory of the Great One, in whose honour it stood aloft. End of chapter 19 The Statue Recording by The Story Girl End of Imaginations, Truthless Tales by Tudor Jenks